Hey everyone, in case you don't watch the news, like me, until a couple hours ago, Florida's about to get her ass smacked by uh, Miss Helene. That would be Hurricane Helene, not Helene that, you know, wears the leather and has the whip. Anyways, so one of my two internets is already down. The other one is flickering and I've already received a threatening message from Spectrum saying, beware, don't worry. We won't be in service, but we will still charge you for it. And no, we won't take it off your bill because we're Spectrum. It's lovely. So I thought, okay, well, my house might be destroyed, but I still need to pay the bills and feed the dogs. So let me throw up a megathon to keep you guys entertained because I don't want you to miss me too much and all that. So you all enjoy. I will pop in and out as I am able, as the <laughs> lovely people at Spectrum keep the lights on, and let's party it up in court, of course. There are many reasons to stay out of Fulton County. Yet another one is that there are some really garbage people there. This garbage person's public defender, Ms. Safarasi, gets into it with the ADA, and then the victim, tells it like it is. Please take a moment and enjoy a wonderful hearing in the courtroom of the fabulous Judge Alexandra Manning. All right, Ms. Safarasi, this is position 11, Bostick 24, PI 001578, Tariq Jamal Barnes, 40, wait, what is this? this $25,000 good bond as of April the 25th. Wait, yeah, hold on a second. It's more, that's the, okay, here's the thing. Ms. Jackson, that's all I have on here. Some of it says released on original bond, released on, and I don't know what that bond is. I couldn't find that bond order. I Are can't, you, I can't uh, find it, Judge. All right, so it's cruelty uh, in the first, battery, cruel, two counts of cruelty in the third, and one count of criminal trespass. It, judge, it, it's only going to be cruelty in the first one count. Uh, one of the cruelties was dismissed at a preliminary hearing. Those other charges that you named out, he already posted bond on. That's why it says really some original bond for those charges. Okay. He's already paid bond. It's a separate case. They, they duplicated it. I try to get it all dismissed, but they've just put it as release on a re original bond. All right. Go ahead. So Mr. Bond's judge, he's been in 120 days. How this case derived is the complaining witness is his ex-girlfriend's son. This incident actually happened about six or seven months before his arrest. Uh, the, the girlfriend did not report it to police before then. The only reason she's reported this incident is, is after that they broke up and got into an incident. Um, then she reported him for this particular case. So what happened was he got there was an incident and he bonded out on those charges. And then she reported him for this incident that happened six about six months prior to his arrest. Um, and then they no bonded him, judge. We went to prelim, they dismissed it, it's one count. The allegation is that essentially he was disciplining um, the child with a belt. Um, and so you know, the, the allegation is that it went too far, essentially. Um, our defense is that it, that's not quite what happened and that that's really that she's, the mom is creating a bigger uh, mess for him. And that, that's just a little context about what's going on for Mr. Barnes. Like I said, judge, he's been in 120 days. He can't afford this bond. Um, and the state is not moving on this case. We do have a good address for him here in Georgia, and he can stay away from the incident location as well as the complaining witness and his mom. He does not have contact with them. He has no reason to have contact with them, and he does not want contact, Judge. So in terms of likelihood to reoffend or intimidating witnesses, we do not have that here. This is an isolated incident. Um, and so, Judge, because of that, I'm asking for a reduction to not exceed $7,000 total. All right. So is he going to live in Fulton County? Yes, Judge. All right, go ahead, Ms. Jackson. Judge, I, I may have missed it, but then Ms. Oh, I'm sorry. Do you want to hear from uh, Ms. Riley? Ms. Riley, if you take yourself off mute, if you can raise your right hand, ma'am. You swear a firm testimony you're about to give. There you go, your military right. You swear a firm testimony you're about to give is the truth, whole truth, nothing but the truth. I can't hear you. Yeah, still can't hear you, Riley. So, Ms. Riley, you may have to connect to a different audio. If you're going through Bluetooth, it may not be working. But while you're trying to work that out, I'll hear from Ms. Jackson. And Judge, can I you hear me, ma'am? All right, I can hear you now. Go ahead. I just want to know your position on bond. 
Hold on. Repeat that for me, Dan. Hold on. I might. Perfect. <clears throat> Can you hear me better? Yes, I just need to know your position on bond and having contact. Uh, absolutely not, ma'am. The See, issue is that um, there was a case in Cobb. He was released on bond um, a, a month, approximately a month after he offended. I was, it was against my five-week-old baby at the time. And um, so I know that Ms. Sarfarasi is going to object. So the cop, I just need to know about, you don't want any contact, right? Yeah, yeah this isn't a preliminary hearing. You were very specific on what. And also, he's entitled to a bond. Just so he has. A I'm bond. having That's I'm having a hard time hearing you. All right. Why and don't you just why don't you just why don't no, why don't you oh, there we go. That's much better. All right, Ms. Riley, why don't you listen? Let me hear. I'm gonna put you back on mute and let me hear from Ms. Jackson. Go ahead, Ms. Jackson. Judge, did I miss Ms. Fawcett going over Mr. Barnes's criminal history? Mm -hmm. He skipped me. Oh. Okay. We would need to hear that because uh, it's Great. extremely. Wow. See, she don't even speak when I do that. Miss Safarazi started talking first, Judge, well, uh, to get that information correct. Well, um, Why y'all had... blame me? <laughs> <laughs> he has four cycles. He's on probation out of car for simple assault, battery, cruelty, sentence uh, earlier this year for 12 months. Um, out of New York, there's seven cycles. There's a criminal possession of a weapon and then two old felonies for a couple for robbery and criminal sale. Nothing further. All right. Go ahead, Ms. Jackson. Judge, I did speak to Ms. Riley before court started today, and she did have a lot of information about um, prior incidences with them. Ms. Safarazi's indication that Ms. Riley is just someone trying to make a big deal out of this case is actually extremely disheartening. Uh, Mr. Barnes uh, is alleged to have beat a nine-year-old so bad that they peed on themselves and was unable to sit in school the following day. The case in Cobb County, uh, as Ms. Riley just said, is a case against a five-year-old baby. Judge, I have to object to this case with Cobb County. We're not here for Cobb County. He is sentence is done. As actually, uh, he stop agreed, bringing up. Hold on, you objection to Ms. Riley speaking whatever she's about to say, Judge. Objection okay. to everything. We are not here for Cobb County. We're here for this one case in Fulton County. Can we please focus in on what we're here and what is before the court? The court is here not to talk about Cobb County. We are not in Cobb County. We are in Fulton County. Judge, I'm, I'm extremely alarmed that Ms. Safarazi is putting up such a fight to bring in uh, this person's criminal history, which we put on the record on every single case. Again, to get into the facts of that allegation, Judge, I'm objecting. To, we have the conviction. We understand there's a conviction in a prior history. We don't need to. Hold up, hold up, hold up. Y'all are about to make Miss Jones mad, which is 10,000 worse than making me mad. One at a time. And if, and if, I mean, and if, the, if it's, if it's Ms. Safarazi's time to speak, then the state is happy to wait. But if Ms. Safarazi can hold on while victims speak and while the state speaks, then I think that would be the proper court to form. I will make my objection when I, when I see fit. Go ahead, Ms. Jackson. Okay, and I'm going to continue to speak. As I stated, he has a criminal history that is extremely relevant because it is identical to the facts in this case. In Cobb County, he has a case where he slapped or battered or assaulted a five-week-old baby. So your indication that this has never happened, that this is some type of one-off that would never occur, is inaccurate. And the state has a right to respond to that. As you see, Ms. Riley has a fear today because she is extremely afraid for her and her children's lives. And so if you think that the state is going to sit here and let you make a mockery of this court and of this victim because you don't think it's a big deal, then you are absolutely incorrect. Mr. Barnes has an extremely dangerous history. He committed these crimes. He has um, open cases. He has a probation case, all of which the victims are the children of Ms. Riley. If Ms. Safarazi thinks that's not important, then that will be for the court to discern. But as for the state, that is an, a, a very extremely dangerous person, and he is a danger to the victims in this case. He was a danger in Cobb County. He's a danger in Fulton County, and he deserves a bond that is reasonable under the facts of this case and the history that he has for himself. That is a conviction, not an allegation, as you like to normally say, Ms. Safarazi. He was convicted of, of assaulting a five-week-old baby. So that is relevant to this case. Judge, objection. The case before you is not about this five-week-year-old child. 
That is not what's before you. About a nine-year-old that had happened allegedly six months that she failed to report until this alleged cop case had happened. Hold up, hold up, hold up. Ms. Jones, do you need to take yourself off mute and yell at him? <laughs> Judge. Yes, ma'am. Which Jones? Hey, y'all. Tiffany Jones. Yes, I really need everyone to speak one at a time. Honestly. You don't even sound that mad, Miss Jones. I know it may be. I'm listen, it's 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 being recorded. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So if you're finished, anything else, Miss Safarasi? Yes, Judge. Again, like like I said, this is not what we're here before. If this case was so important to the state as she wants to make it believe, why is he sitting 120 days without an indictment? Where is the state moving on this case, Judge? He has a bond. He is entitled to a bond. We are here because he cannot bond out, and the state is not respecting his rights as well. These are allegations. What is before you today, Judge, is an allegation. That is not a conviction. I understand we want to keep referencing this Cobb County case. Fine, that is a conviction. You can take that into consideration as a conviction, Judge. But in terms of what is before you, that is just trying to murky the water of what is before you, Judge. You have, this is a case gotcha. not involving that that child, Judge. And also, we can rectify all of this by A, the state indicting this case and moving forward so we can have our day in court, or B, you can have a stay away, no contact. Judge, my client does not object. He has no reason to have contact. So there's no reason I, I why guess. anybody involved I'll, in this I'll, case I'll, stop, what, stop. All right, Ms. Alfred, I got What else, Ms. Riley? What else? I feel like I'm not being heard, Your Honor, and it's it's really regarding me and my four children. Um, when you've been abused for years by the same individual, you don't report things right away because you're fearing for your life. My son is in the vehicle right now. If you would like to speak to him about the abuse, then you are more than free to do so. He is in fear of his life. I am in fear of my life. My daughters are in fear of their life. We look over our shoulder everywhere we go. He has been released on bail and he has definitely has repeated. As a matter of fact, when he was released on bond the last time he was out, of he was out on bond for three years and he did worse things than he did the first time he was released on bond. This time, the abuse not transferred only to me it tra and to my newborn baby and transferred to my oldest son. And my son is the sweetest child. He makes straight A's. And he has known this child since he was two years old. And so he has a hatred for us. And he has re-offended several times. And I have forgiven several times. But it's like these when you let them out on bond, who knows how long this case is going to go back into court for me to for it to be defended. And then at worst, we could be dead by that time. And so I'm really depending on you guys today to make a right decision based on the criminal history that he has had in the past, violent history, and he has pled guilty to the one in cop. And you say it doesn't matter, but he offended, he violated his bail the last time. The bail was violated last time, and he still left without any charges, and he still left with no jail time. He still left with just probation. And so now we're just, we're giving him a slap on the wrist every single time and there's no, there's no comfort and no security for me and my children's safety. And as she's saying, there's, well, let's forget about cop. Tell these children to forget about cop. Tell me for everything that every time I've lost my home trying to escape this man, tell me to forget about cop. Tell my, my daughters who have lost their dad and seen them abuse me, tell them to forget about cop because that's ridiculous. And then tell them to forget about in Fulton County when they had to see their brother be abused and recover from being beat on and being scared to death, locking themselves in the room and then double locking themselves in the closet. You tell me, you tell them to forget. Tell those children to forget the trauma that they've experienced by the hands of this man, by hearing me getting beat through the walls. Tell those children to forget every single memory that they have of me getting dragged by my hair in the kitchen, getting sliced across my forehead by a knife and tell me that he's not going to reoffend. And then when he reoffends, put the blood on your hands. Okay. All right. All right. Thank you, ma'am. And uh, I, I don't know what they did in Cobb, but this ain't in Cobb County. All right, so we got no drugs unless prescribed, no alcohol, no weapons, no rep because of weapons. If it's available, you're going to have an ankle monitor paid for by the county with a 24-hour curfew. Court, lawyer, and medical, the only reason you leave your house and report to probation if that's what you've got in Cobb County. No further contact with Riley, Tiffany, Riley. Uh, let's see. 
or any other children. Uh, let's see. Uh, as a matter of fact, stay away from all children unless they're your relatives, but none of her children, none of their children, or nobody else's children. Stay away from in Palmetto, Georgia. Also, I think I already said no drugs, no alcohol, no weapons. Even if that ankle monitor is not available, sir, you will have a 24-hour curfew. Those are the only reasons you can leave. I'm leaving it at 25000 Best of luck to you, sir. Is that it for you, Miss Sosa Spoff? Yes, Judge. All right. Have a good day. Have a good holiday. You too, Judge. Today, I have a child custody case for you from Calhoun County, Michigan, the courtroom of the Honorable Brian Kirkham. This is a pretty good example of what happens when two people hook up and then one proceeds to grow up and raise a child and the other doesn't. I hope you enjoy. Yes, Your Honor. Okay. Ms. Reed, do you wish to make an opening statement or proceed to proofs? I would wish to make an opening statement. Okay. So the parties in this matter share one minor child, and that's Lauren Wines, and she is six years old. The most recent order for custody and parenting time was entered September 17th on 2019, where the parties share legal custody. Plaintiff Lyric Cannon was awarded primary physical custody, and the defendant has parenting time every Saturday from 12 o'clock p.m. until Sunday at 6 o'clock p.m. There is no holiday schedule ordered, and there are, is no additional parenting time ordered other than that one overnight on the weekends. The plaintiff is requesting a change in legal custody, as the defendant has abandoned the child for the last three years and has not participated in any legal decision-making regarding the child throughout the child's life. The plaintiff is also requesting a change in domicile, to allow her to move to Tucson, Arizona. To allow the change in domicile, plaintiff must show by a preponderance of the evidence the factors enumerated in NMCL 722.31 parens 4, the so-called DeForonino test, and then support that her motion for this change in domicile. Testimony will show that a change in domicile has the capacity to improve the quality of life for both plaintiff and Lauren, and that defendant has failed to utilize his parenting time under the current order, and that it's possible for modification of the current parenting time schedule to allow a relationship between the defendant and the minor child, and that there is no motivation for some sort of financial gain for resisting this move, as testimony will show that this move actually has the capacity to increase plaintiff's earning capacity, which would in turn reduce the defendant's child support obligation, and then there is some significant domestic violence between the parties in this matter. So plaintiff is requesting again, so legal and physical custody of Lauren and for defendant to have an out of a gradual out of state parenting time schedule to allow him to be reintroduced to Lauren because right now there is no relationship. And what that might look like is defendant might come to Tucson, Arizona for the Thanksgiving break and have some parenting time on a non overnight basis. And then plaintiff would come to Michigan possibly during the winter break to have some parenting time to reacclimate the child to her to the defendant. She's asking that the parties use our family wizard for communication as well as um, use the calendars to help facilitate parenting time schedules. And she's requesting that the defendant primarily provide transportation for the parenting time so she can ensure that he's actually going to exercise his parenting time, and she's requesting that child support be recalculated pursuant to the form. Okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Wines, you can make an opening statement at this point if you wish to do so. You can reserve your opening statement or you can waive your opening statement. What would you like to do? I would like to say my opening statement. Okay, go ahead. I have a few notes, if I could read them off to you. I want to first off start by saying that um, this is not by choice. I have not abandoned my child, never. I've never been that type of father ever in my life. This is my only child. So there's, and I've 
got a lot of information throughout her friends. And I have a few people in the waiting or in this meeting with me to testify on my behalf. Um, I believe my daughter is in danger. Uh, I've heard some things about her being in a um, domestic relationship. And I've heard that he's been putting his hands on my daughter as well. So I honestly don't believe this is Lyric either. I believe it's whoever she's with controlling this because I heard she's been with him for six years. And uh, this stuff didn't just start happening until she was three. So I don't agree with them moving to Tucson, Arizona. This is my only child. I do everything in my power. I pay child support. I got a job. I got a crib or a house. Sorry. All of that. So I don't agree with this. I never did this by choice. This was all forced on me. I try to reach out to her. She changes her number. I don't even know where she lives. She's always know where I live. My mom and I even went as far as so we wouldn't have problems to go through third party. And she didn't even apply with that. So I have a few uh people in here in the room with me as well. If you want, okay. if I have a test, them testify. Okay, thank you. Anything else, sir? Uh, I have my mom here as well. No, no, nothing else. Okay. Okay. Ms. Reid, uh, you wish to approve. Okay. Yeah, I'm, sc I'm very scared for Lyric, actually. Oh. Uh, we... Uh, her friend just went back to Arizona to try to find her because she she knows Lyric is in danger. So I don't got nothing against my baby's mother still to this day. But this is not right. This is not fair. This is not by choice. At all. Okay, anything else, sir? Uh, hold on, hold on one second, sir. I hear that somebody's uh, prompting you in the background. Oh, no, my mom, asked, hold on, hold on, oh, sir. I'm, I'm going to ask that you would have those people removed from the room. So when you testify, and that that you're only here, I don't want anybody prompting you in the background. Have them leave. Nobody can speak. She was asking because she speak on my behalf. On my I don't behalf. care about that. I've, I've told you, have them leave the room. Okay. Are they out now? Yeah. Oh, at least. Okay. Anything else, sir? No, no, sir. Okay. Ms. Reed, uh, you can proceed with your proof. I'd like to call Eric Cannon as my first witness. Okay. Ma'am, we're going to take some testimony from you, so I ask that you would raise your right hand and be sworn in, and then we'll proceed. Do you solemnly swear or affirm the testimony you are about to give shall be the whole truth and nothing but the truth? Yes, I do. Okay. Go ahead, Ms. Reed. Lyric, do you share one child with a defendant? Yes, ma'am. And is that Lauren? Yes. And how old is she? Lauren is six years old. And is there a current order in place regarding parenting time? Yes, as of 2019. Okay. And did I accurately reflect that parenting time order in my opening statement? Yes, ma'am. When was the last time the defendant had parenting time? In over three years. Do you recall the date and year that he had last parenting time? Um, nope, not the exact date or year, but I know it's been over three years because I've been in a relationship for over three years and he hasn't been in contact. Okay. Has he ever reached has the defendant ever reached out to you for parenting time with Warren? No, ma'am. Has he reached out to your family members for parenting time with Warren? No, ma'am. Recently, he reached out to my brother, but that was within the last week. Have you changed your number, your phone number? No, ma'am. No, ma'am. Have you blocked Mr. Wines from contacting you? No, ma'am. Have you changed your address? No, ma'am.
you had heard that Mr. Wine stated that he believes you're in danger. Are you in danger? No, ma'am, not in danger. Me or nor my children. Do you have any basis for knowledge where that accusation is coming from? No, ma'am, I do not at all. My fiance does not have a domestic violence case. He does not have any domestic violence cases. Me and my kids are very safe and fine. Has there been any law enforcement with you in the last couple of years? No, ma'am. Damn it. Can you describe your relationship with Lauren? Me and Lauren's relationship is so loving. She is sweet. She is my baby. She looks into me for comfort, for guidance. When she's scared, she talks to me. Um, she just loves me. Me and her relationship are, we're, we're so close. We bond, we cuddle, we do everything together. That's that's my youngest daughter. We are very close. Okay, what kind of activities do you share with Lauren? Me and Lauren go shopping. We have Mommy and Me Fridays every weekend, Monday. Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, I take each of my girls individually to spend quality time. We go to the library. We do family trips. We just came back from vacation. We cuddle. We do one-on-one -on -one time. We read together every night. I help her with homework. Me and Lauren, relationship is great. We literally do everything together. And how do you discipline Lauren? Put her in timeout. Is anyone else allowed to discipline Lauren? Nope, solely just me. Okay. Does Lauren have a relationship with a defendant? No. Does she know who he is? No, she knows his name, but she does not know him, nor will she. I don't think she'll recognize him either. Okay. Who does she view as her father figure? My fiance, Antonio Richardson. And how long has he been in Lauren's life? For four years. Okay. Do you purchase the items that Lauren wants and needs? Yes. Me and Antonio. Are there any special needs for Lauren? No, not as of now. There's no medical, educational, or speech needs? No, ma'am. Okay. And you heard defendant state in his opening statement that he pays child support. Is that true? Yes, the defendant pays $25 a month in child support, but the problem is he's inconsistent with it. Only why I know he's inconsistent because he keep have he has those um causes or show hearings as far as to why he's not paying child support. I get those in the mail quite often. Has he ever purchased or provided Lauren with food, clothing, or gifts? No, ma'am. Has he ever participated in doctor's appointments? No, no doctor's appointments, no. Has he ever participated in getting her enrolled in school? No, ma'am, and she's attended three different schools. Okay. Are you currently working? Yes. And where are you working? Masashi Auto Parts. And how long have you worked there? For three years. And how many hours a week do you work? 34, between 34 and 40 hours. And what is your rate of pay? $22 an hour. How many days a week do you work? Four days a week. Do you know what your weekly gross take-home pay is? Yeah, I usually take home about $1,300. And that's after taxes? Yeah, after taxes. Okay. Do you receive any sort of overtime pay? No. Do you receive any payments from profit-sharing pensions or retirement? No, ma'am. Do you receive any military benefits? No. Any disability benefits? No. Do you receive any tips, gratuities, or lottery winnings? No. Are you receiving any unemployment benefits? No. Do you receive any public assistance like Medicaid or child care assistance? Uh, yes, I get Medicaid as a secondary insurance for whatever my um, primary doesn't cover. And yes, I get child care because I have to go to work and I need to get my kids to school for the days that no one else can. Okay. But the state's covering all of your child care expenses? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Do you have any in uniform licensing or other costs that you have to pay as a condition of your employment? No. If Medicaid secondary, how much are you paying for insurance? Um, about $70 a month. Is that for you and Lauren? Yes. 
Do you support any children other than Lauren? Yes, I have two other children as well. And who are they? Layla Cannon and Lamaya Cannon. And how old is Layla? Layla's nine and a half. And how old is Amaya? Seven. Okay. And do you currently live in a house or an apartment? A house. And how long have you lived there? For four years. And how many bedrooms is your house? Three bedrooms. And can you describe the sleeping arrangements? Yes, my kids have their room, I have my room, and then we have an extra room, they have a basement, and they just go between if they want to sleep in this room or the other rooms. Okay. The basement who, is the play area. Who lives with you? My grandmother. Okay, so it's your grandmother, you, and then your three girls? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Do the girls have any chores or responsibilities? Yes, every day. And what are those? They clean the living room. They help mommy with the kitchen when I'm done cooking. Wake up in the morning. They have to help with the breakfast in the morning. Um, they do the bathroom with me. They do the dining room. They want white windows. They're really good helpers. Okay. Are there any special house rules? Yeah. No yelling. Be loving and caring. And everybody's kind to each other. Okay. Do you have any relatives that nearby? Yes. And who are they? My mom and my brother. Do you have any relatives in Arizona? Yes. And who are they? My sister and my child's grandfather. Kid's grandfather, sorry. If your request to change domicile were granted, where would you be living? In Tucson, Arizona. Do you have a house prepared there? Yes, ma'am. Can you describe that house? Yes. Four bedroom, three bath, two car garage, fenced in backyard, three sided backyard. Um, I live in a gated community with a swimming pool. We have a spa, access to playgrounds, parks. Um, the house is a three-story house, two living room, two dining rooms, um, really big kitchen, all new appliances, washer and dryer in there. Um, let's see what else. Four bedroom, three bath, another bath, a bathroom in one of the girls' bedroom. It's really nice. And is Antonio currently renting that house? Yes, he is. Okay. What opportunities are in Arizona that will improve the quality of life for you and Lauren? So the opportunities start with me first and foremost is going to school. So that is the most important thing because I'm trying to land a career. I've been working in Battle Creek at Masashi for the last three years, but I'm looking to make more money and stable money for me and Lauren, for all my kids actually. So going to school, Finishing having a cosmetology license will allow me to make over 70000 a year, and that will improve our quality of life. On top of the education system, they have a great education system with smaller schools and great top-rated schools in the community. Also, the extracurricular activities that they offer at the university, the school itself, and throughout the community. Okay, you said that you are wanting to go to cosmetology to your school. Where is the school located? In Tucson about 15 minutes away from the house. And have you visited that program? Yes, I have. Is there any sort of a financial assistance available to you for that program? Yes, I have already been approved by financial aid and that financial aid covers most of my tuition, actually all of my tuition. And I also have loans coming back that I can utilize until I'm done with school. And how long is it gonna take for you to complete school? A total of 10 to 12 months. Excuse me, what was that? 10 to 12 months? Is yes, correct? Yes. Okay. correct. Is there any sort of job placement assistance through the school? Yes, ma'am. They place you with job. They place you at a job while you're still enrolled in the school. So she said at about eight to 10 months, they start doing workshops where they have salons and business owners come in and they kind of do mock interviews to see where you're at, where do you need to be. Then they come in again towards the end of placement to choose who they want. And then if you don't get choose, they branch out to other communities and try to see where they can place you. Is it like a guaranteed job placement or they do their best to place you? She said it's a guarantee. She said over 98% of her students get job placements at this school. That's one of the main reasons why I've picked it. Okay. And you had stated that you could make possibly about $70,000 a year? Correct. Is that more than what you're making now? 
Yes, ma'am. About how much do you make at Musashi per year right now? Per year right now, I only make about 40000 And then you mentioned the schools are better in Arizona. What school would Lauren be attending? So the school that we went to go view, we had an open house and it's called the Grazia School. And it is wonderful. Like the classrooms are smaller in ratio. It's like 15, 13 to 15 students is what we noticed. Um, they have two student aides in there, teacher aides, sorry, to where if the child is falling behind or needs help with reading while the teacher is still teaching, that's great. Um, they have extracurricular activities before and after school free of charge just for attending the school. They have a lot of in-community building that they have for children for them to socialize because it's so hot out there. Um, I like the curriculum too as well because they're introducing them into STEM at a very early age and that's exciting for me, especially for Lauren because she likes to build and get on stuff, put her hands on stuff. Okay, and you mentioned there's some activities at the local university? Yes, they have a robotics program and my kids are really into building robotics. Like that's that's their thing. We do that at the library here at Wither Library. And so out there, they have a whole program based around it to where every break, winter break, spring break, summer break, they come and get a group of kids together and they run a robotics program where they learn how to build robots and they go to championships and university hosts and it's all free. Okay. And in living with your fiance, you would have a dual income household. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. And would that be a significant improvement for you? Yes, it will. And is your fiance currently working in Arizona? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Do you have any sort of criminal history? No. To the best of your knowledge, does the defendant have a criminal history? No, he does not. Does your fiance have a criminal history? Oh, sorry. Kevin does have a criminal history. My fiance does not. Okay. And what criminal history are you aware of of Kevin? Um, I believe he had a simple assault charge put on his case. He had domestic violence against me, and then he had assault with a deadly weapon as well. He had a couple evictions as well on his record. Okay. Do you use any drugs or alcohol? No, ma'am. Do you know if the defendant uses any drugs or alcohol? Yeah, I heard he used to drink alcohol. You heard or you observed? I never observed, but I only heard from his own mother. But other than that, that was three years ago, so I'm not sure prior to. Okay. And does your fiancé use drugs or alcohol? No. Have you ever been the subject of a Child Protective Services investigation? No, ma'am. Has your fiancé ever been the subject of a Child Protective Services investigation? No, ma'am. Do you know if Mr. Wines has been the subject of a Child Protective Services investigation? I'm not sure. Okay. Do you have you ever been the subject or participated in abuse and neglect proceedings? Have I or Mr. Wine? Sorry. You. No, ma'am. Has your fiance ever been the subject or participated in abuse or neglect proceedings? No, my fiance have not. Do you know if Tevin has participated or been the subject of abuse or neglect proceedings? Participated because he was the abuser to me. Is, was this an N.A. case under the abuse and neglect docket, or was it just a separate matter that was handled by the police? Sorry, I didn't, sorry you froze. I didn't get that last part, ma'am. Was it an abuse and neglect case under an N.A. docket with the court, or are you talking about some other abuse? Just in prior to me, I'm not sure about from the courts. Was it abuse of a child or an abuse of an adult? Of an adult. Okay, so that's not that's a, like a child protective or an abuse and neglect program to a child case, right? Right, correct. Okay. Are there any were there any sort of PPOs in place? Yes, there was. Um, I got a PPO, I believe, in two thousand nineteen against him. And what happened? I was picking up our daughter. We had scheduled parenting time. This is after we after other domestic violence incident previously, and this was just the last straw. Um, went to go pick up the daughter because we had to do the parenting time drop offs at the mediator's house. So it was his mother's house and she's staying in the arbors in Battle Creek. Went to go drop her off. He was calling me on my name and he reached in the back seat to put the child in the back seat. Lauren was still in a car seat carrier. My other two children were in their car seat, buckled up still in their booster seats. And he got upset at me and punched me through the back seat of the car. He punched me right in my face right here. And um, 
through the car and park and he ran into the house and I drove off across the street to some more apartments and I called the police. I stayed and waited. And when the police came, he noticed my face, he noticed the swelling, he noticed the red mark and he said, okay, I'm gonna go get him. And within two days he was arrested and I followed up with my duty and I pressed charges and I got a PPO and I did everything in my power to not let that happen again. After the PPO was entered, had he exercised parenting time? Um, yes, after the PPL was entered, I believe we we were still had to do the drop offs and I was the mediator was his mother. And so I was dropping my baby off to his mom every weekend at a location that we had agreed on. And how often did that occur after the PPL was entered? Um, I'm not sure. It took a while because he had to go through um, anger management classes and everything. So I don't know the exact date. Yeah, I'm not sure of the exact date, but it, it was some time. Okay. Do you have any physical issues that would affect your ability as a parent? No, ma'am. Do you have any mental health issues that would affect your ability as a parent? No, ma'am. Are you seeing any counselors or therapists? No, ma'am. And what school does Lauren currently attend? Fremont International. And what is the student-to-teacher ratio at Fremont? Um, she has 20, 26 to 28 kids. When I drop off snacks, that's usually I drop off for like 30 kids in a classroom and it's one teacher in there. Does Fremont offer any sort of tutoring or teacher's aides? No, they do not have any tutoring. They have a teacher aide in the building, but I believe it's two teacher aides throughout the whole building. So it's not per classroom. Do they offer any sort of extracurricular activities? No, the only extracurricular activities that they offer is 21st century and that is for um, for kids who need, I guess, child care after school. What is Lauren's attendance like? Wonderful. She's always on time. You know, I have to work, so she either catches the bus or my fiance takes her to school. And she's always on time, never late. And what grade is she going into this fall? First grade. And when does the school start in Arizona? School started last week, last Monday. Are there going to be any issues transferring her into Arizona late if the change of domicile is granted? Um, no, ma'am. There will be no issue. So when I was down there on vacation, I wanted to make sure if I was granted domicile that I had everything in place and that they won't lack of any schooling. And so I got it in place to where all I have to do is submit my application and, you know, the spots will still be open as long as I can apply before September. And when does school start at Fremont? The 15th of August. Does Lauren like school? Yes, she loves school. Okay. Is she currently participating in the activities? No, as of now, she is not. Okay. Why do you want this change? I want this change for a better quality of life for me and my daughter. I honestly think we deserve it. We've been through a lot. I've been through a lot. And just by them being my kids, we've been through a lot over these last couple of years. And they deserve a new change of scenery and just to be around good, loving people who really care for them. And this change will help with that. The dual income household has helped me tremendously over the last four years. Um, me, me and my children have been emotionally, physically, mentally taken care of, financially taken care of. And... We've been honestly blessed to have him in our lives and just this move and going out to Arizona and us being a family for this vacation has showed us like what we're capable of and how it feels to just be around us, good people. Have the true, have Lauren been to the house in Arizona? Yes. Yes, she has. Okay. What is your proposed visitation schedule? So my proposed visitation schedule is um, once Lauren gets to know Tevin Wines. Um, if we can start out on the phone or on Zoom, they can see each other and she can get acquainted with his face and his voice so she knows he's not a stranger to her. And then once that progresses, I think it will be good if he can come up to Tucson and do some, like you mentioned, non-overnight visits so he can get acquainted with her and so she can feel comfortable around him. And then I can do some Michigan visits as well to where when they have a break and it works out for both of us where she can see him again, non overnight. And then we just do that until the child gets comfortable. Okay. And then would you propose transitioning into the state parenting time schedule? 
Yes. Oh. And are you willing to facilitate a relationship between Lauren and Mr. Wines? Yes, I am. And you heard that he said this was forced upon him. Um, are you keeping Lauren from him? No, not at all. I never have. Okay. And what do you propose for transportation if the change of domicile is approved? Um, I propose that Mr. Wines provides a transportation means solely because he is very inconsistent with seeing the child already. It has been three years prior to this. He has been inconsistent when he put in the order the first time. And so I don't feel comfortable paying for transportation in case he doesn't show up. It's been multiple times where he hasn't showed up. So transportation should be provided by him just for security. Okay, and in our motion, we requested the use of an Our Family Wizard or Parenting Time communication app. Why do you think it's important for that application to be used? I love that application. I love it, love it, love it. I think it's important because it allows the court to see the communication process between the two parents, and it allows to know the courts or court officials to see that communication is actually happening between the kids and the parents. Um, there's no, There's no way to talk disrespectful or inappropriate on my wizard and it's all monitored. And so it's, I love the app and it's have very you, efficient. Have you and Mr. Wines had communication issues before? No, um, actually, to be honest, I communicate through his mother in the past. I rarely communicated with him. I was communicating with her because she was the mediator. I had to meet with her for pickups and drop offs. So I wouldn't see Mr. Wines for months and I would be talking to his mother. So me and his communication was never very good. And also, the, the mediator was put in place by the referee at the time because of domestic violence. So the court order was to not even have communication with him, to, with the mediator. And so I was following up with that order by doing that with his mother. Okay. Are there any other instances of domestic violence other than what you've already testified to that put the PPO in place? Yes, there is. What happened and when? Prior to that, prior to um, the one with the PPO, me and Mr. Wines, when we were together and we were living together in these apartments and I was calling the police almost every week to get him out of my house. He was destroying things. We had police reports, police incidents of him, of Mr. Wines destroying the house, punching holes in the house, trashing the house, wouldn't leave the house. The police told me to evict him in order for him to leave. Um, and I ended up having to almost get to that process, but then he ended up stealing my book bags when I broke up with him one morning. He stole all of my books, my, sorry, my college books to KCC, my cell phone, my wallet, and my computer out of my car. I had a police report for that as well, and it carried all the way on to Grace Health, and it carried on because they caught him at Grace Health. They tracked my phone. They didn't catch any of the stuff on him, but um, he discarded of it by then, and so those are two incidents, but him destroying the house was on multiple occasions. Like I said, I was calling the police multiple times in a week to try to get him to stop. And they said he wouldn't let him leave because he was a resident of the home. Because he had a diploma there for more than 30 days. So I had to physically evict him if I wanted him to leave. And that carried on for months, for months. And when he took your book bag and your phone, did that impact your ability to attend KCC? Yes, ma'am. I keep everything in my book, my school backpack, and I have my computer, my four classes of books, coursework in there, my wallet, and my iPhone. He took my iPhone, started texting my family members, sending them threats in a group chat, texting them, trying to fight my brother, cussing out my mother and sister. Um, he, I don't know, destroyed my laptop because I never got that back. Tossed my wallet I, with all my ID, social security card, school ID, tossed that. Tossed the schoolwork because I couldn't finish school like I had to drop out of school my my I was an A student and my grades dropped drastically because I didn't have any coursework but they didn't have any resource money to provide me with any more coursework to finish the last six weeks of school so I had to drop out and fast forward to three years later as of now in April 2024 I tried to apply to KCC again and they told me that because of the last incidents I had to do an appeal and I had to explain the appeal to what happened and that appeal letter I explained to the a director and president of KCC about my domestic violence and everything I was going through at the time. And I made a police report with the um, KCC patrol officer at that time. 
because it happened off of KCC's campus going into the hospital off of Harvard Street. And so they were aware of the incident and I had to do an appeal just to get back into school to prove that I was worthy of continuing my education without any interactions, sorry, disruptions. And were you allowed back into KCC? Yes, the appeal was accepted. But are you currently pursuing a degree at KCC? No, ma'am, I'm not currently pursuing it. Is there anything else the court should know? Um, nope, not that I can think of. Okay. I've got no further questions. Okay. Mr. Wines, uh, you have opportunity to ask the uh, plaintiff questions if you wish to do so. Who, Larry? Or yes. Jennifer? No, the plaintiff. Oh, um, you know I've tried to reach out to you, Larry. Sir, sir you get to ask questions, not to make oh, statements. Why, why have you changed your number? and made it in, impossible for me to reach out to you. I have not changed my number. I have had the same phone number for four years. I have other kids who fathers have been able to contact them over the years, changed my number one time in four years. And I've had the same number for schools to reach me, for doctor's appointments to reach me. Me keeping the same phone number is crucial because I have children and I have appointments and I have a job. I can't change my phone number sporadically because I have people who need to stay in contact with me for emergency contacts, for doctor's appointments, for school rides. I don't change my phone number. I have the same phone number, the same phone, the same service provider for four years. Okay. Why, when you seen my mom a few weeks ago at the, at the school and she tried to speak to you, you just sporadically walk past her and act like you didn't know her. She wanted to see the kids and stuff. And we got pictures of that. So why did you do that? Sorry, sir. I don't remember seeing your mom. I was picking up my kids from school a few weeks ago, like you said, but I don't remember seeing your mom. I'm there to pick up my kids. I don't really interact with people too much. So not sure about what you're talking about. When did you get with this, with your fiance? According to you, six years ago. But okay. that is incorrect. Ma'am, he's not asking that. He's asking when. So I answer the question. I got with him four years ago. Okay. Why did you take her away from me when you got with him? I did not take your daughter away from you. If you can recall, there was a phone conversation. You called your daughter four years ago. She was one and a half. You asked to speak to her on the phone. And she started talking. And she wasn't saying anything. She was saying no. And you was like, why are you making my daughter say no to me? And I didn't say anything to you. Then you called back and you heard my fiance on the phone. And sir, you told my fiance, you can take care of her. I don't got time for this. He knows that. So that was the last thing, the last conversation you had on the phone. I don't know what. I never would take your daughter away from you. You stopped seeing her. You stopped getting her. The plan was for the mediator. We were supposed to have contact between me, you and the mediator to meet up a place of contact. There was no messages to meet up. I'm supposed to drop her off. I don't know where to drop her off. If I don't have any communication. Where am I supposed to drop her off to? If nobody contacts me. Well, how do I know? Just show up at a store and hope somebody comes. Do you know where my mom lives? No, I do not know where your mother lives. Okay. Uh, do you know my mom's number? No, I do not know your mother's phone number. Didn't you just say y'all had recent contact when we was, when I was seeing my daughter? Sir, that was four years ago. I did not have your mother's phone number. I did not have, I don't number. have any of that. Years. Sorry, what was that? Did you change your number in the last four years? No, I had the same phone number. Did you block me? No, sir, I do not block you. I do not have your phone number. I do not, I cannot block you if I do not have your phone number. Okay. Where, where do you pick my daughter up from school at again? Fremont International School. Right around my mom. Um, have you spoke with your mom? I speak to my mom daily. 
did she tell you that I told you to reach out because she comes to my job often? I talk to my mom daily and no, she's never told me that. She told me that you said have Lyric call me, but I don't have your phone number, sir. My mom said my mom and her husband said that they have waited around in Dollar General on Columbia multiple times for you to come out the back with a phone number or anything. And she said you never had a phone number. She's seen you for months. Before you started making the complaints about the parenting time, she was seeing you and you never offered a phone number. As well as the times before when you were working, I guess at another store, she said that she would see you out by Dollar Tree Plaza or somewhere. She said that you always, she would see you and you never said anything about a phone number or asking for my number as well. Have you tried to reach out to me? I cannot reach out to you because I do not have a phone number. Do you have Facebook? I do not have a Facebook. Do people around you have social media? I do not have a Facebook. People around me do not have social media. And if they do, I'm not on Facebook because that is my right. And I don't believe in social media. Okay. When's the last time you actually tried to reach out to me? Do you recall even trying to? Mr. Wines, I opposed upon the parenting time order. Me and you have a mediator because of the domestic violence. Her. I am supposed to reach out to your mother. I do, I do not have your mother's phone no more. I do not. I have never once reached out to you or contact you about our daughter. So I have not. Okay. Well, my mom has had the same number for 18 years. Objection, your honor. It's supposed to be question. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, Ask any questions you want, sir. Okay. Sorry about that. Uh, do... Do you ever try to reach out to my mom? No, sir, because I do not know your mother's phone number. My mom hasn't tried to reach out to you? No, I have not received a phone number from your mom, a text or call from your mother. Do you have her blocked? I do not have your mother blocked because I do not know your mother's phone number. Uh... I've tried. Oh, okay. Um, do you know I could Google your name and your addresses and your phone numbers to get in contact with you? Uh, Attorney Jennifer Reed, this is getting confidential because of the domestic violence case. My my address is supposed to be confidential, like as far as the courts. Well, yes. I don't. Have he hasn't with asked. You. Excuse me. Ma'am, he hasn't asked for the number. I think he was asking if you have a number or oh, whatever okay. that, he could, that he could contact. He hasn't asked for it. Okay, I'm sorry. I heard that. Sorry, Your Honor. Do I have a number? Do I have a phone number? Are you asking that? Is that what you said? Yes. Yes, I do have a phone number. Do your brothers know me? Yes, my brothers know you. Uh, have I tried to contact them over the years to get in contact with you? You contacted my brother once last week, telling my brother that I was in danger and that um, you wanted to see your daughter. And I speak to my brothers every day. And so when he called me, yes, I was very aware of it. Do you have a good relationship with my mom? Have you ever, ever had any problems with her through third party? I'm going to object to relevance. Sir, do you want to address that? She's asking, how is it relevant about the relationship with your mother? Because she said we go through third party, Your Honor, so we don't even have contact. So I was just trying to get this through you guys to let you know that there's never been no problem. Okay, okay well, and my mom. Parts can overrule the objection. I think they've talked, they, she has talked about the grandmother being a mediator and kind of a go-between to handle uh, parenting time, et cetera. So I think it is a, a reasonable uh, question. Go ahead. Okay. Do you want me to re-ask that lyric? Or yeah, please. Please. Okay. Um, have you ever had any problems with my mom through third party? Um, um, a few times. Sorry, what was that? I'm going to do one at a time. A few times, um, only issues I had was like when it was time for pickup, nobody would text me back. And that only happened sporadically. 
And then she would apologize and tell me, oh, something came up. We can do it next weekend. We can figure out another time. We can do it in another few days. That was the only issue I had with her. Has my mom kept all three of your kids, not only my kid? Yeah, every time I asked, not every time, a few times if I asked her, she would keep my other kids, but that's because Lauren wanted her sisters to come. Lauren would cry for her sisters, and that's how they would come. Um, who took care of all three of those kids before your fiancé? Me. I never helped take care of none of them kids. I never lived with you. Yes, you live with me, but sir, you know you have not kept a job, and you know I've kept a job, and I take care of my kids fully to the max. I own the house, I have the car, I have the job. I financially, emotionally took care of my kids. You were a boyfriend. So I never bought nothing for the kids. You never bought anything for the kids. Wow, okay. With that being said, do you feel, how do I put it? Do you feel that you could still reach out to my mom? Yes, I feel like I can reach out to your mom. Me and your mom has no issue with each other. So why haven't you reached out through your mom to get to my mom? Because they know each other. My mom, my mom does not hang out with your mom. My mom does not have your mother's phone number. My mom does not have any contact with you or anyone in your family, nor has she had in the past. And it has always been like that, sir. My mom has never had your mother's phone number to where they have been texting back and forth. They have never had drop offs with Lauren. Our mothers are not friends. Do you know I still have your number? And when I call it, it goes straight to voicemail? I don't Every have. That's fine, sir. I have the same phone number. I don't. I don't know, sir. I have the same phone number that I had for years. Like I said, my kids been going to the same couple of schools, the same is daycare. Your, my number has not changed. Is your phone number in your name? Why is that um, relevant to the case? Is this a question? Well, answer the question, ma'am. No, my fiance pays my phone bill. Okay. No, my phone is in my fiance's name. Does my daughter like your fiance? My daughter loves him. She's crazy about him. She's the only man that she knows. She's known him since she was one and a half years old. Okay. So with that being said, why when I call your phone, don't I ever receive no text messages or calls back? My mom, also, why when my mom calls your phone, she never gets a call back or nothing back? We Objection. It's a compound question. We need to ask one question at a time. Yeah. Go ahead. One at a time, sir. Sorry about that. Uh, why does when my mom call you, it also goes straight to voicemail? Sir, I'm not sure. I'm not even sure how you how we even got each other's phone number. If you said that you were blocked and you were calling it, then you said you didn't have my number. I'm not sure what number you are even calling. You said I changed my number multiple times. Then you said I blocked you. It's either I changed it or I blocked you. Either you had it or you didn't. So I'm trying to. I'm trying to understand what you're asking me. You said I changed my number multiple times. Now you're saying I blocked you. If I changed my number multiple times, have you had these multiple phone numbers? How are you still calling the number that you're blocked from? How are you are you calling a phone number that you know that I don't have? She's asking me a question. Am I allowed to answer or I'm just No, asking. no, you're not. Ma'am, you can't ask him questions. I'm kind of confused to what he's asking me. Well, you can stating. say you're confused, then don't ask okay. him questions. Good. Okay. Sir, I'm confused on the question that you're asking me. Okay. Do you feel there's a problem between you and my mom or y'all good and good standings? Objections have been asked and answered, I think, by this time repeatedly. Okay. What's your response, sir? 
you, sorry, I couldn't hear you. Skip. Say, say what? What? What's your response to the objection about asked and answered? Oh, I'm just uh, trying to figure out why it's been going on so long without any any communication. I get I haven't seen my daughter, but there's been no I, no phone calls or nothing. It's just been stripped away from me, not by the courts, but from okay, her. Sure, this isn't this isn't a question. Ask a question if you have it. Do you know what's been stripped away? I'm going to object, Your Honor. There's somebody in that room telling Mr. Wines what's going on. Sir, I just heard somebody talking to you. I told you to get the person out of the room. Sorry, I'm in somebody's else house. I have to go outside. Okay. Okay. Sorry about that. Well, don't let it happen again, sir, or otherwise the court could find you in contempt or the court could uh, again vacate and throw out all your testimony at this point. It won't happen again, sir. Okay. Go ahead. Do you know that I'm there for my daughter if you need me? Um. I do not know that, sir. You have been very inconsistent in her life. She's six years old and you have had multiple chances prior to this date to reach out. It's been over three years and you've just started putting in complaints about parenting time. I believe you are very selfish when it comes to um, our daughter. So, yes, I do not believe that you are there for her because you have not shown that. Also, when we were together, you never attended doctor's appointments. Granted, she was one and a half years old, so she was barely in the day. I was trying to go to the daycare and get to go to school and everything, and you were not there, so I don't believe that. Okay. When will... Okay, I, I got to make sure I put this in the right way, Your Honor, so bear with me. Um, Have you spoke to your brother, Jason? I speak to my brothers every day. Has he told you that every time I see him, I ask what's going on and there's no response? I'm going to object to hearsay. Okay, court will sustain the objection, sir. You can't ask what somebody else has said, okay? I'm sorry. This is my first time going through this. I understand. I understand. Well, when you when you represent yourself, you accept that responsibility to handle the handle the case and ask questions just as if you were the attorney. So you don't get special consideration because you're representing yourself. Okay, I understand. Does have you heard from other people that I have tried to reach out to you? I'm going to no, object sir. again, Your Honor. It's still a hearsay issue of what she's hearing from other people. Well, yeah. sustain, sustain, sir. You can't, again, you can't ask her what other people are saying. Oh, okay. So, Your Honor, I'm speaking to you in this matter. Uh, with that being, sorry. sorry. Um, with that being said, I've only asked these questions because it's been so hard to reach out to her. I understand. I understand why you're doing it, but it's not a proper question. So I can't have you to ask it if it's not a proper question, if it's a hearsay question. Okay. Did you ever genuinely want me to have a relationship with Lauren? Of course. We were in a relationship. You're her child's father. It has just been your actions over the years while we were together, the domestic violence, I could not have my daughter live with that nor see that. So that has prompted me to break up with you. And since we broke up, you have been absent from her life. I get that the parenting time order was put in place and your mother was a mediator, but it has been times where your mother was upset with you because you wasn't visiting her then. So I cannot make you be a father. Yes, I would love for you to have a relationship with your daughter, you are the one who are who is solely responsible for that. I have a part in it as well with being a co-parent, and I have been a co-parent. This is my third child, so I am well aware of being a co-parent. My I am very well aware of 
what to do. You just has not exercised that in six years. Do you recall our last text together? I'm going to object to relevance. Well, I don't know what the relevance is at this point, so I, I will allow it subject to uh, relevance. A misunderstanding, sir. You can ask the question again, sir. Oh, do you recall our last text together? No, sir. I haven't spoke to you in over four years. I do not. Do you have any, any, like, malice towards me? No, sir. Why has it been so hard for us to just co-parent through third party then? Sir, we were supposed to co-parent through your mother and we went for a pickup one random weekend and she did not answer the phone. And that is how it started. I have not heard anything. Nobody has reached out to me. Nobody has seen me. You have not put in no parenting time order until this last couple months. That is your right as a father to put in a parenting time order if you if you believe that your rights have been stripped from you. Sir, you have waited three years to do that. You waited until you heard that I was moving to do that. I have did everything in my power for you to see your daughter without being traumatized by being in your presence. I, I, I have been trying my best for you to have a relationship with your daughter without being brought up about the past and the domestic violence. I have done my part, my best and my ability I got punched in the face and I had to drop my daughter off to you two weeks later. I have done my part with your mother and you. Your Honor. I have tried my best. I got I have a question. Your Honor Brian Kirkham. Yeah. Sir. Uh when she's going too far in depth, do I just gotta sit there and listen? Well, if it's not responsive, you can always object to the responsiveness of the question. Object to that. Okay. Wow. Okay. So we'll wait for that now. She's already done it. So in the future, you can object. Go ahead. Do you do you know you could contact me anytime? Upon the parenting time order, sir, I believe a third party is in the best interest, and that is what the order was put in place, and I believe in following the rules, so I will follow what the Order says. Why hasn't the third party been contacted? In I'm going to object again, Your Honor. This has been asked and answered repeatedly, and my client has testified repeatedly. She does not have Mr. Wine's phone number. She does not have the mediator's phone number or his mom's phone number. Okay. She has answered it before, sir. So move on, please. Okay. Do you? plan on letting me have a relationship with Lauren? Yes, sir. I answered that question previously. I don't believe so, but okay. Uh, do you feel like I have a fair chance at being a father in this situation? I believe if you try to be a father, you can. That's the only answer I have. If someone wants to see their child, they have to put in the efforts. That's it. Is There's your no trying when being a parent. You have to do it. They hindering me from seeing my daughter. No, sir. It hasn't. No, no. And you said you've been with him. Oh, it's not a question. Sorry. You've been with him for three years, right? Objection. That's been asked and answered. It has been, but I'm getting it's this all gets to the gets me to my point that I'm trying. Well, to she's already answered the question though, so you can't just keep asking a question over and over. Or she also asked, she answered that question with Miss Reed too. So move on. Okay. Why do you feel like take taking my daughter to Arizona will help build? any relationship i um honestly you have not seen your daughter in over three years so the relationship that you have with your daughter is none 
you have not contacted the courts in over three years, nor me in regards to having contact, any relationship with your daughter. So I took it as you did not want to have a relationship with your daughter. I have moved on with my life and I am engaged and I have made plans with my future husband and my kids because you were absent. You have abandoned her. So I object. had no acknowledgement. I had. Okay, hold on, ma'am. Please file it. He said, I object. What's the objection, sir? Uh, that didn't answer my question. Well, she stated that uh, basically that you have not had contact, et cetera. So I guess that's sufficient. Ask your next, next question. Okay. That's all I have. Okay. Your Honor. What? Uh, I have people in the room willing, which is her willing to testify for me. Okay, well, that's fine. You're, it's not your turn yet. Ms. Reed has to present her witnesses. And when she's okay. done, and I will tell you, as I said before, they shouldn't be in the room with you. Okay, they said they're in the waiting room, I guess. Okay, so. that's fine. Then when it's your turn, that you can have them testify. Okay. Ma'am, you had mentioned that originally you said that your insurance would run you $70 per month. Are mm -hmm. all three of your children on that? Yes, sir. Um, they take money out of my check weekly and it goes towards my insurance. Okay, that's not what I asked. I knew they would take it out. I was just asking if there were three children on that. So there's three children in you, so there's four people on the uh, insurance. Correct, yes. Okay. You had mentioned a uh, figure that you said you thought you'd be able to make over 70000 a year once you have your cosmetology uh, license. Where did you get that number from? The school. They said that based off of the average salary in Tucson and the demand that it's possible you can make that or above, depending on the rates that you offer and the services that you provide. Okay. Uh, I didn't catch you. You'd mentioned that, uh, that the defendant had a criminal history and you went really quick through uh, what those were and I didn't catch them all. Would you... Kind of tell me what they were again, if you're aware. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. Um, he has a domestic violence case against me. He had a simple assault as well. He had a- Hold on, hold on. Hold on. Was the assault with you or someone else? With me. That was when he punched me in the face. Oh, that was out of the same incident then? Yes, sir. Okay. So we had one case there, which was mm -hmm. domestic violence and assault. What other yes. cases? He had a separate case that was, I believe, assault with a deadly weapon. And how are you aware of that? Um, speaking to my attorney, Ms. Jennifer Reed, we looked it up while trying to see what all we needed as evidence for this case okay. and to get the date on the exact order that I had. Okay. Anything else? Um, other, I believe he had eviction okay. on his record. But I'm just sure. looking for any criminal uh, action. Oh, okay.
Okay, I don't have anything further. Anything else, uh, Ms. Reed, any redirect? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. Lear, you had mentioned some parenting time complaints that were filed this year by Mr. Wines. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Correct. How many parenting time complaints has he filed? I, I believe four or five almost every weekend. Did we have a show cause hearing on some of those parenting time complaints on July 9th? Yes, ma'am. Did Mr. Wines appear at that hearing? No, he did not. Were those dismissed because he did not appear? Yes, ma'am. And do we have another show cause hearing coming up towards the end of this month on additional parenting time complaints? Yes, he put an additional parenting time complaint after he didn't show to the one on the ninth, and now we have another cause hearing. Yes. And he has not filed any other parenting time complaints in the last three years. Correct, yes. But he knows how to, correct? Yes, he does. Correct. Have you kept your address up to date with friend of the court? Yes, ma'am. Mr. Wines is questioning you of why his phone calls went straight to voicemail. Have you received any voicemails from Mr. Wines or his mother? No, ma'am. Have you received text messages from Mr. Wines or his mother? No, ma'am. I have no further questions. Okay. Is there any, uh, as a result of my question or Ms. Reed's redirect, do you have any recross? Um, I could, I just need to know what I can do, sir. This is my first sign, you know, and what I can't. Okay. As I'll again, not as again, <laughs> You, you accept that responsibility. So the court's not going to give you special consideration because you choose to represent yourself. I'm allowed to ask questions. You're, 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 you're allowed to ask questions relating to any of the questions I asked or that Ms. Reed asked oh. on redirect. Okay. So no, no, nothing. I ain't got nothing to say on that, but I, I didn't don't know how to, um, I just learned how to file complaints. Like I said, this is my only child. Okay, sir, sir, that's not a question. All right, no questions. Okay, thank you. Ms. Reed, uh, any additional witnesses? Yes, I'd like to call Antonio Richardson. It's my understanding he's in the waiting room. Okay. Yes. You bring Hello. Good. Good morning, sir. Good morning. What we're going to do is uh, we're going to ask you some questions. So I ask that you would raise your hand, be sworn in, and then we'll proceed. Do you solemnly swear or affirm the testimony you are about to give shall be the whole truth and nothing but the truth? Yes, I do. Okay. Go ahead, Ms. Reed. Good morning, Antonio. Can you hear me? I can hear you. What is your relation to the parties in this matter? Um, Lyric is my fiance, and Lauren is my daughter. Is she your daughter or is she Mr. Wine's daughter? Mr. Wine's is her biological father. Okay. And how long have you been dating in a relationship with Lyric? About four years. Okay. And can you describe your relationship with Lauren? Um, my relationship with Lauren is good. Um, that's my that's my baby. We get along fine. We do a lot together. Um, she FaceTimes me when I'm at work. Um, she give me hugs, tell me I love you all the time when I come home. Um, we just do a lot together. Showed her how to ride her bike. Um, we do a lot of family vacations. Take her to different zoos, museums. We just do a lot. We do a lot together. Me and other uh, as a whole family. Where do you currently live? Tucson, Arizona. And how long have you been there? Um, about eight weeks. Okay, and are you currently renting a house? Yes. Can you describe the house for me? Um, I have a four bedroom, three bath, bi level. Um, 
privacy fenced in backyard, two car garage, um, two central air units, um, two living rooms, fireplace. Anything else? <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> and is the four bedroom house in preparation for Miss Cannon and her daughters to move in with you? Yes, it is. I'm waiting. I'm waiting on them. Yep. And are you currently working? I am. And where are you working? Um, at a barber shop in Tucson. And how long have you worked there? Uh, it's about a little over a month. And based on your current clientele and what you've been making over the month and in, on the general income of other barbers in your shop, what do you predict your gross income to be this year? Um, averaging them anywhere from eight to ten thousand a month. So you're looking at maybe eighty to a hundred thousand dollars this year. Yeah. Are you willing to support Lyric and her children? I am. I, I have been for the past three three plus years. Um, so yeah, I'm I'm definitely ready for that. Do you have any criminal history? I do not. Do you have any children protective services history? I do not. Have you ever had any court proceedings regarding abuse and neglect of any children? I have not. Is Lyric currently in any danger? No, she's not. Is Lauren currently in any danger? No, she's not. Are you in any way restricting Lauren's ability to visit Mr. Wines? Not at all. Are you willing to facilitate a relationship between Lauren and Mr. Wines? Am I willing to facilitate a relationship? Yeah, yes. for sure. For sure. Um, I personally have never even seen this man. I, I have never seen him and Lauren hasn't seen him in over since I've been around. So I don't even know what he looks like. So it's hard. I, yeah, facilitate relationship. Yeah, I don't even know this man. But. Okay. I have no further questions. Okay. Uh, Mr. Wines, uh, you have opportunity to ask uh, Mr. Richardson some questions if you do, if you wish to do so. Mr. Richardson, do you have any kids? Yep. Do you have close relationships with those kids? I do. Why do you make it hard for me and my daughter to have a relationship? How do I do that? He's asking me a question, sir. I'm I allowed have, to. I understand. Uh, just, just, Mr. Richardson, you can't ask him questions. You just answer the question if you can. I don't have an answer for that because I don't do anything to stop that. So it's okay. And that's your answer. Do you physically discipline my daughter? No, I don't. What's your occupation? I'm going to object. That was asked and answered by myself. Mr. Richardson is in a, works as a barber. Well, barber you just shop. okay. I'll um, go ahead and answer the question, sir. No barber. You've never seen me before. I have not. I have. You've never seen me at Phase One Barbershop before. I have not. Did you used to cut with Mitch? Cut hair with Mitchell? Yeah. So you have Okay. Has my daughter ever asked you to call and talk to me? No. Objection. It's hearsay. Sustained. Do oh. you... Do you tell Lyric to reach out so her and her dad can have a relationship? I don't understand the question. 
Are you hindering? Go ahead. Maybe you can rephrase it, sir. All right. Are you hindering anything from me and my daughter having a relationship? Not at all. Do you recall seeing my aunt? Do you know Crystal Wines? I do not. Do you recall seeing Crystal at Dudley and telling her she couldn't talk to my daughter? I do not. Lyric, do you recall? Oh, is this only for him? Yes. Okay. What type of relationship do you have with Lauren? I'm going to object. That was asked and answered. Well, specify, sir. Again, he's talked about being engaged and them having, a, again, that relationship for almost four years. So maybe uh, if you have specific questions. Do you put, do you discipline any of the other, any of the other kids? Is this about Lauren or do I? I don't know what to do. Yep, he's, about, he's asked I, I, about he's asked about the other children that uh, presumably the plaintiff has. No. Do you know Ma Malika? No, I don't. Uh, has she tried to reach out for me to get in contact with you guys? I don't even know who Malika is. No, Malika has, has contacted me. Has your, do you have contact with your son? What? Do you have contact with your son? Do I need to answer that? Is this yes, about sir. Lauren? Or, okay, yeah, no. I do. Has he told you? I've reached no, out he to has Objection, hearsay. Sustained. How do you discipline my daughter? Objection asked and answered. Yeah, sir, he's, he's testified that he doesn't discipline your daughter, so. Okay, okay. Do you, do you transport my daughter to school? Every day for the past three and a half years. Also the doctor's appointments. Also the conferences. Also the extracurricular activities. Also to the Y Center, also to karate class, also to soccer. I'm good. Do you want my daughter to have a relationship with me or not? Uh, I don't have an opinion. Okay, that's all I have. Okay. Anything else, Ms. Reed? No, Your Honor. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Richardson. That'll conclude your testimony. You're free to go. Have a good day. Thank you. You as well. Ms. Reed, next witness. I have no further witnesses. Okay. You rest? Yes. Okay. Mr. Lines, uh, now is your opportunity to present your witnesses, if whatever you have. Uh, Malika Linwood. Okay. Yeah. All right. All right. Ms. Linwood, uh, you're muted. You have to unmute and uh, join the uh, visual. Okay. Are you able to hear us, ma'am? Yes. Okay. What we're going to do is we're going to take some testimony from you. So we'll have you raise your right hand, be sworn in, then we'll proceed. Do you solemnly swear or affirm the testimony you are about to give shall be the whole truth and nothing but the truth? Yes. Okay. Go ahead, Mr. Wines. Sorry, I couldn't hear you. Skip. So go ahead, Mr. Wines. You can ask your questions now. Malika. Yeah. Hey. Uh. Have we re we recently spoke, correct? Yes. And you told me that you have been in contact with Larry. I'm going to object to the form of the question he's leading. Okay. 
Sir, what you do is you can ask her if she's had contact with the uh, plaintiff, et cetera. You can't lead a person, so you can't effectively. Uh, okay, okay. You can't effectively tell them what you want them to testify to, okay? Okay. Have you had contact with Lyric? Yes. When's the last time you spoke with Lyric? It had to been, um, I want to say my visit, it had to been about a month and a half ago. Okay, who is Lyric to you? Lyric, I consider Lyric as my day one. And let me give you all that definition. Every morning, every night, for years next to each other, you know, as a friend, a best friend. Okay. Um, have you saw Lyric and the kids re any time recently? The last time I saw Lyric with my eyes, like, in person was five years ago, my daughter's birthday. And she was only allowed to stay about five minutes or so. And I, and I very rarely been able to stay in contact since then. Is it hard to reach Lyric? It's mostly impossible. Um, you know, or well, she reaches out when she can, and that's rare. How does she reach out to you? I'm going to object to relevance. Uh, and I don't want to say that. Anymore. Hold on, ma'am. Ma'am, if there's an objection, you need to stop and let us figure out the objection. Okay. How, how is how is this relevant, sir? Uh, I'm trying to figure out how she connects to everybody else because through phone it doesn't work for me. Well, okay. Her contacting and how she reaches out to everybody else isn't relevant to how she may reach out to you or. You okay. Know, so, if you could ask them specific questions as it pertains to you, then that would be fine. Okay. So you said the last, when's the last time you've seen her? Sorry. Like five August, years? August 15th. Okay. When you spoke, what did you guys talk about? Objection, like, hearsay, so, and relevance. Okay. How's how that relevant, what they might have said five years ago, sir? It was about, it was. Ma'am, hold on. It was, it was. Um, Ma'am. Stop talking. There's an objection. If there's an objection, you need to stop talking so that we can work out the objection. Okay. Sir, how is it relevant what they talked about five years ago? Well, she didn't. She's talked to her recently. She just said. Well, she said she last saw her. Okay. She did talk about a month and a half ago. But how is that relevant to this case? Um, to tell you that my my daughter is in danger. Okay. Like, well, you need to ask questions pertaining to that, as opposed to ask just general. I mean, they could have talked about the weather. They could have talked about any myriad of things. Malika, we have no relationship outside of this case, correct? Yes. I'm going to object again. He's leading. Well. I'll allow it. It's, it's kind of preliminary to, uh, again, the testimony. So I'll allow it. Go ahead. Yeah, we have no relationship outside of this case, correct? Right. Right. Did you reach out to me concerned about Lyric? I did not reach out to you. About two weeks ago, We, I, I was visiting Michigan, and I ran into you, remember? So I asked you, have you spoken to Lyric? And I asked you, have you seen your daughter? Because my friend is in danger and she has been in danger for five years. And Objection. I was you have been in contact with her because I'm not. Objection. Okay. Hold on, ma'am. Like Again, there's an objection, so stop speaking. Okay, Miss, what's your objection, Miss Reed? Well, there's multiple issues. We have lack of foundation for the allegations of danger when there's already been testimony there hasn't been contact in over five years and we have some hearsay issues as well as some relevance issues of what's going on okay well i guess we need to have more to ferret out the objections on that so sir if, if she's saying that again that the uh, plaintiff is in danger you're going to have to establish a foundation as to how she knows and what that might be okay 
how do you know that Lyric is in danger? From Lyric herself, um, I can't tell you a specific day, a specific conversation or phone call or even a phone number, uh, ladies and gentlemen. But throughout the years, I have been speaking to my friend before she left or, you know, was captured. I have been speaking to her. I know about her situation. I am one of her best friends. Okay. And she cannot help herself. Objection calls for speculation. And there's still lack of foundation about the allegation of being captured and that she can't help herself. Okay. Well, part will disregard that. We're talking, you know, she says she's in danger and she's found that through speaking to the plaintiff to allow her to go into that. She just set a foundation for that. Yeah, right. Miss Malika, what did Lyric tell you when you spoke to her to make you concerned? Well, I've been I've been gone and residing um, in Arizona for about five years. That's like I said, that's the last time I, I seen her physically. But uh, for about six to seven years, I want to say a solid five years, um, uh, you know, the year prior to that, the whole year, you know, we would be able to meet up in person when she was able to run an errand or do something in her life, like she would get like an extra three minutes, we would be able to connect in those times. But it was it was very short. And I, I was just, you know, it was a wel welfare check and a hug to make sure she was okay. And then I wouldn't see her none for another year after that. Do you feel like my daughter is in good hands being around her fiance? Objection no. calls for speculation. Okay, I'm answering the question. Okay, ma'am. Again, if somebody's objecting, you have to stop talking. Okay? Because we have to figure out the objection before we can take your, your answer. We may not, we may bar you from answering that particular question. So what is the objection, Ms. Reed? It's speculation as she's testified that she hasn't seen my client over five years. How can she testify to if the child's in good hands? Okay, well. Maybe, uh, Mr. Lyons, you'll need to uh, discern that and set a foundation for how she can answer that question. Malika, how could you say these things and you haven't seen her in five years? Well, when I refer to a lyric as a day one, and we go from every morning, eight in the morning to 10 o'clock at night, every day for years, I did mention that, right? Did everyone hear that? So if, if she goes from my day one, and then, you know, I move into a whole nother state, I see her the a year or two prior, almost every other day, almost every week prior. And then it it, it's, it goes from that to once, once a week, to once a month, to once every six months. My friend is in danger, is what I speculate. Objection. There's still okay. speculation. Okay. Again, Carl will sustain the objection at this point. You need to set a foundation. Just because she is not having contact, okay. doesn't mean someone is in danger. Okay. In what ways do you believe Lyric is in danger? My personal belief, or do I need facts on this? Her, uh, my personal belief is um, physically, I have seen bruises on her, though, you know, when, when we talk. I'm not going to tell you guys how we talked. It, it's been five years since the in-person. Can everyone hear that? Since in-person. I've been on video. I've been t contacting her, calling her ever since then. It's bruises on my friend. I, I used to be able to speak to the kids. I can't speak to the kids. I can't see my, my friend. For her babies, um, I don't feel like something is right because she can't freely call me. Objection she, calls for speculation. Fourth of July, ma'am. Again, when when the attorney objects, you need to stop talking. Right, sir. I didn't hear it. Okay, that's fine. And I was in a sentence, and she said it. Okay. Okay. So you, sorry. Okay. Carl will sustain the objection. Go ahead, move on, Mr. Wines. Um, the last time you seen Larry, how did that altercation go? I'm going to object to relevance as the last time the in-person contact was made was five years ago. Well, she did say the last she has seen her on Zoom, so that may set the uh, foundation, sir, as to when, when you talked the last time, are we talking the five years ago? Are we talking, you know, some other time? 
in which it was on Zoom. So maybe clarify what you're talking about. Okay. When's the last time you've seen Larry? When's the best time? Okay. The last time I seen her on video, okay? Yes. Not, not in person. The 4th of July, not the 4th of July, it must have been a week before that. She she um said that we can we can um hang out and get get together and it, it'll be a little family trip. And I was already kind of a little sus about that, but I'm like, okay. But that you don't know that's the last time we were able to speak. So I've been I've been messaging her ever since the 4th of July, like the week prior to 4th of July, all the way up until what this morning, yesterday, the day before yesterday. Okay, ma'am, ma just and, to clarify. Yeah. Are we talking what year of the 4th of July? This is 2024. Okay, July, thank you. A month ago. And these past, what, every other day or every three days, maybe, I am contacting her. And she's, she, she's, not, she's not getting back in contact. Let's put it like that. But I don't think she's able to. Okay. Objection, speculation. Sustained. Sustained. Go ahead, Mr. Wines. Okay. I was just making sure we are clear. Do you believe not only Lyric is in, let's say, not in good hands, do you believe the kids are okay? I'm going to object. It's a speculation again. Sustained. There's been no foundation laid for the question, nor is she able to testify to that. Okay. Um, how did the last altercation go with you and Lyric when you seen her on video? Um, she looked a little scared. Well, with my eyes and how I know my friend for over five to six to seven years, um, looking around, trying to make sure her surroundings are clear and safe so that she can whisper a couple of words that she was able to whisper. My friend, um, you know, I never seen her like that. So I believe personally with my speculation, my observations that, you know, she was looking scared and frantic. Do you guys know what frantic mean? Um, I don't think that she was like freely able to be on the phone with Objection. Speculation. Okay. Sustained. Malika, do you believe I'm a good father? Yes. I have seen... Objection. Lack of foundation. Okay, sir, you're going to have to establish why she uh, comes to that uh, opinion. You said what? Again, she's objected to speculation, so you're going to have to establish how the witness has come to that opinion, because otherwise it's speculative without a foundation. A misunderstanding. I don't, I don't, I can't help you, sir. I've explained that. All right. So Wait, have you spoke to Lyric since for the last encounter? No. You have tried to reach out, you said? Yes. There's been nothing said back? No. Does Lyric reach out to you just as much as you reach out to her? No. It's about, um, she reaches I'm out. I'm going to object to relevance. A year. Okay. Sir, what's the relevance of whether the plaintiff reaches out to her or not? The relevance is because it's been impossible for me to get in contact. So I was wondering if she is keeping a close, you know, keeping you close. Explain to them how you feel. Like, Ma'am, hold on. Explain to them how you Ma'am, hold on. Okay, well, I'm going to sustain the objection. I, I don't think it's relevant as to uh, an inference, if you would, if she's having difficulty contacting someone else as to contacting you. So move on. If Miss Linwood is still there, I don't know. I'm still here. Okay. Go ahead, Mr. Wines. Um, I, I don't even know what questions I could ask. It seems like, um, When when you spoke to Lyric the last time, or yeah, when you spoke to Lyric the last time, did she did you guys plan anything? 
Yes, we did. We planned. I'm going to object to relevance. I don't see how any of this is relevant to this current case. Well, yeah. you're going to have to explain, and Mr. Uh, Lines again have her establish why it's relevant and whether they made plans for anything. Okay, you just on to the next question. Go ahead. Malika, do you know do you know anything about Lyric's fiance? Um, I have we have we have mutual friends and they're all considered day ones. I'm not speaking on any names specifically. Uh, we are all females. And we all know who we date and when we all started dating these people. I'm not familiar with his full actual name, but I know exactly who he is. And all of our friends and our clique know who this man is as well. Um, ever since she started dating this man, she's, um, you know, it's been different. Let's just say that. So I don't get objected. It's been a little different. And um, he's a dangerous man. He's known on the streets. Objection. Lack of foundation. Sustained. Sir, you have to lay a foundation if somebody's going to make a statement. Okay. 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 Do you believe he's dangerous? Okay. Yes. Objection. That's, speculation. That's, that's, that's not laying a foundation, sir. Do you believe he has my daughter's best interest since you do know him? Objection. That's speculation again. Being sustained. Well, he obviously don't know how to ask. Ma'am, no. Don't, don't talk. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, sir. Malika, do you, do you plan on keeping a close friendship with Lyric? Objection. Yeah. Relevance. Sustained. All right. Have you have you ever met my daughter, Malika? Lyric Wine. Lauren Wines. Yes. How was that interaction? Um, they um it was kind of like, you know, I know a kid. I have three. I have three children myself. So, you know, the fact that I see I, I meet them, you know, at the birthday party, they wanted to be happy, they wanted to be kids. They want to enjoy themselves, but for them to only be a, a, attending a birthday party for four and a half, five minutes, they kind of got really, really sad in the face on the way out the door. Lyric, her eyes were watering like she wanted to cry. Like, um, I don't think that um, that it, it was happy times inside. They just, you know, faked the fun. I'm going to object. I don't see how this is relevant. Yeah. How, how is it relevant, Mr. Wines? Tell them what you need. Yeah, yeah I, I'm just trying to um, get down to the point of. Can you I know, talk for like two seconds or no? Just Lynn, what you need to stop talking. Go ahead, Mr. Wines. I just want to be an active father. And... Well, that's fine, but it has nothing to do with this witness is the, whether you want to be an active father. So ask the witness relevant. Uh, questions and we can move this matter along. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, I'm here. Okay. Can y'all hear me? Or is this yeah. Okay. Um, when when you guys talk, did you sense the same person that you used to know? Objection calls for speculation and a sense, and I still don't understand how this is relevant. Sustain. I don't even know what to ask. All right, that's that wraps um, that wraps it up pretty much. Oh, okay. Okay. Thank you, Miss Reed. Do you have any questions of the witness? I do not. Okay, Miss Linwood. That concludes your uh, yeah. questioning. You're free to go. Yeah. Have a good day. I love you. Goodbye. Next witness, uh, Mr. Wines. Um, Brandon is my next witness. He should be in the room. Brandon? Yeah. Brandon what? 
Um, I'm not sure of his last name. Uh, he's in the waiting room, though, he said. I don't have anybody in the waiting room right now in, on Zoom here. Yeah, there's no one in the waiting room now. Okay. All right. Well, that's my only witness then. That's your only other witness? Yes. Okay. And that person's not here, so do you rest, sir? Yes. You, you have no more witnesses, correct? No more witnesses. Okay, thank you. Ms. Reed, do you have any uh, rebuttal witnesses? I do not. Okay. Okay, looks like that concludes the uh, proofs. And uh, Ms. Reed, do you have any uh, closing argument to make? I do. So Lyric's requesting sole legal custody because there's been swearing and apparently apparent based on the testimony communication issues and there's been domestic violence, there's been PPOs and she believes that she cannot co-parent and it's been demonstrated there's a co-parenting issue regarding this child. So she's requesting sole legal custody so she can make those sole decisions for the child. She has been making the sole decisions for the child and it's been testified that Mr. Wines has not been active in this child's life for the last three years. The big question is regarding the change in domicile request. First, the trial court, again, must determine whether the moving party has established by a preponderance of the evidence the factors enumerated in MCL 722.314. Number one in that analysis is whether the legal residence change has the capacity to improve the quality of life for both the child and the relocating parent. And I believe Lyric has met that burden by clearing convincing evidence, not necessarily by a preponderance. She has testified that this move will offer her an ability to attend a school for beauty to get a cosmetology license, where she's going to be able to have some grant funding or some financial aid to help pay for the majority of that school. Upon completion and during that school, she's going to be able to have almost guaranteed job placement and location that she has an opportunity to make almost double of what her current income is. She's also testified that this move is going to have the ability to improve both the life of herself and her child by that one increase of income, but also that there is an increase and a better school environment in place for Lauren with a lower to student teacher ratio, with ability of two in-classroom teachers aides, with some extracurricular activities focused around STEM offered for free by the local university, as well as the improvement in their living situation of a larger house in a gated community, with a pool and other opportunities available within that community. So that's a very clear life improvement for both Lyric and the child. The second factor is the degree to which the court is satisfied. If the court, I'm, I'm sorry, I moved on the third one. The second factor is the degree to which the parent has complied with and utilized his or her time under the current court order governing parenting time with the child. It's been clearly established that through testimony that Mr. Wines has not had parenting time or exercised his parenting time or even sought to exercise his parenting time in the last three years. Only when he found out that Lyric was planning to move did he file parenting time complaints. One of those we went to a hearing on, Mr. Wines did not appear. The referee dismissed that parenting time complaint because he did not appear. So he has not complied with the parenting time order. The third factor is the degree to which the court is satisfied the court permits the legal residence change, it's possible to order modification of the parenting time schedule or other arrangements governing the child's schedule in a manner that can provide an adequate basis for preserving and fostering the parent's relationship with the child and each parent. Right now, Mr. Wines does not have a relationship with his daughter. His daughter, as Lyric has testified, does not know who he is and looks to Mr. Antonio Richardson as the father figure as that who has been the primary, primary father figure throughout her entire life, at least for the last four years. That's who she looks to for love and affection as well as her mom. And she's going to need some time to get to know Mr. Wines. And my client has testified that she's willing and able and will facilitate that relationship. But she does believe there needs to be a slow process of reintegration and that she's willing to do the 
parenting time through the winter breaks and the spring breaks and the fall breaks to try and reintroduce that. So maybe the summertime parenting time next year is not as such a shock when she does not know Mr. Lines. The next factor is the extent to which the parent opposing the legal residence change is motivated by a desire to secure a financial advantage with respect to a, a support obligation. There has been no testimony regarding that factor, but I have stated, and I believe my client has stated with her, getting this, going to school with the potential of making about $70,000 a year and up, that would reduce Mr. Wine's child support obligation as it almost doubles her income. The next factor is the domestic violence, whether that violence was directed against or witnessed by the child. My client has testified that there was domestic violence in the presence of the child that resulted in a PPO and potential some criminal charges for domestic violence and assault. Once the court looks at the, parent, the factors under the domicile statute, second, um, the court must look at if the factors support a change of domicile, then the court um, must determine whether an established custodial environment exists. We would present that the established custodial environment is clearly with plaintiff as defendant has been absent for the last three years. And the child looks to plaintiff and Antonio Richardson for love, affection, guidance, needs of daily living. And that has happened over the last three years, which is an appreciable time. Third, if an established custodial environment exists, the trial court must then determine whether the change in domicile would alter or modify the established custodial environment. And it does not as the established custodial environment would remain with plaintiff. And then finally, if and only if the trial court finds that the change of domicile would modify or alter the established custodial environment, must the trial court determine whether the change of domicile would be in the child's best interest considering whether considering the best interest factors. Now, we were also requesting a change in parenting time, so we went through the best interest factors, and we believe that all of those factors favor plaintiff as Plaintiff shows the child love, affection, guidance, needs. Um, plaintiff has the capacity to show the, the child love, affection, guidance, and provide for her needs. She has the ability to provide for her financially. And while we believe that the defendant has the ability to provide for her financially, he has been subject to multiple show causes for failure to pay a very minimal amount of child support. He has not provided her food, clothing, gifts or any sort of other support and my client has not had contact with him for the last three years there is domestic violence there is a severe breakdown of communication as has been repeatedly testified which is why it's important that we have a communication app so we're not running into the let's contact everyone and everyone's family to try and get a hold of somebody it can be all through our family wizard it has the red receipts on there. It has the calendar so we can track parenting time. And we're not trying to petition the community, as it were, to try and get a hold of an arranged parenting time. I believe my client has met her burden to change domicile. And I believe she's met her burden to change legal custody. And we're requesting that she have sole legal custody, so that she be permitted to change domicile to Arizona. That we have a graduated out-of-state parenting time schedule to reacclimate the child with the defendant. That would include... Zoom calls, video calls, and I do believe our family wizard, if they pay an additional amount, might offer also some sort of communication, but Zoom and maybe FaceTime or Skype is free, and then child support calculated under the formula. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Wines, uh, your closing argument. My closing argument is that I, my main concern is that, um, even with that being said that she said that we are going to go over i don't believe i have any contact with my daughter whatsoever if that's the case because i haven't i've been trying to reach out for lyric to for three years and she constantly changes her phone number i never even knew where she lived she's always nowhere my family stays she's nowhere i stay she used to drop my daughter off but she's never made it clear where she is or her number she changes in blocks my mom i'm gonna object your honor he's testifying to evidence that was not offered into evidence and now he's testifying during a closing i understand it's it's, it's closing argument that they will disregard any uh argument that doesn't set isn't satisfied or it's substantiated by the testimony good uh, try to reach out to 
Okay. We're getting some interference. Is somebody talking in the background? There, can you can you mute yourself? I'm sorry, yes. Sorry. Okay. Okay, go ahead, Mr. Lyons. I've been trying to reach out for Lyric to Lyric for the whole time. And me and Lyric, we used to have uh times where you know where we I would see my daughter and then she'd go like a week without seeing my daughter and then she'd reach out. So it was you know, and I've always been a selfless dad. I'm not the type of dad to where if my daughter doesn't want to be with me, she she can be wherever she wants. I'm a selfless dad when it comes down to it. So <laughs> always made sure that I've tried to keep contact with my daughter. I have been trying to reach out to Lyric and I wasn't sure on how to go through the courts. I had to learn everything by myself. So, yeah, that's why I started putting in putting in the complaint because I had I learned how to do it myself over time. Um, I am uh, attending school, KCC, for my trade this fall. I am working right now. Uh, I have a shelter for my daughter. I have I'm building right now for me and my daughter so i don't feel like her moving to tucson arizona will help me and my daughter build any type of relationship whatsoever because it's been hard over the three years to contact lyric to build continue building that relationship with my daughter so i ask that the court you know be considerate of my feelings and me and my daughter's relationship that's it. Okay. Anything else, uh, Ms. Reed? No, Your Honor. Okay, thank you. Well, in this uh, particular case, the court has heard the uh, testimony in this matter. Uh, the matter is before the court on the plaintiff's motion to modify uh, legal custody, parenting time, support, and change of domicile. So we have all of those issues. The court notes that the uh, final judgment in this case was uh, from September 27, 2018. And that was subsequently changed on September 17, 2019. In that order, that was order regarding custody, parenting time, and support. It provided physical, primary physical custody to plaintiff, joint legal custody, and parenting time every Saturday from 12 o'clock until Sunday at 6 o'clock p.m. Again, that's uh, from 2019. Uh, we have, there was a period of time when the parties had uh, provided for some parenting time in this uh, particular matter. The testimony has shown that that happened maybe for a couple years and that that was sporadic to some extent. And the parties, because of the uh, domestic violence uh, case and uh, the charges in that matter, that they had to use the um, paternal grandmother as a stated as a mediator, but I'd say as an intermediary in uh, in this uh, particular matter. The court will note, and I'll address the issue of uh, custody first in this case. Uh, the plaintiff is asked for sole legal custody. She already possesses sole physical custody. And the court will look at the statute as the joint custody, and that's MCL, 722.26a, and that provides that in custody disputes between the parties, the parties shall be advised of joint custody. They're obviously aware of that because they do have joint legal. And uh, court will uh, look at in this uh, particular matter to determine whether uh, there should in fact be uh, joint custody, the court has to consider the best interest factors, and I'll address those in a moment. In this case, the statute provides under subsection uh, two, it provides that a uh, court can grant joint custody. If the parties agree on joint custody, the court shall award joint custody unless the court determines on the record based upon clear and convincing evidence that joint custody is not in the best interest of the minor child. The question under subsection B is 
whether the parents will be able to cooperate and generally agree concerning important decisions affecting the welfare of the child. In this case, it's clear that, uh, again, at least the parties, there was not much, if any, testimony as it related to the uh, time prior to the three plus years that there's been no contact. But even before that, there was testimony that uh, that the uh, defendant was not involved in doctor's appointments for uh, the child. He was not involved in school enrollment. He was not involved in, again, other school activities. And there's been no testimony to the fact that he has uh, in this uh, particular matter. So it does appear based upon a total absence of involvement by the defendant that he has abdicated those responsibilities and that to the plaintiff in this particular case. Uh, as a result, the court does note, it appears that she has in fact provided solely for the child during that three plus years without any involvement of the defendant. He will state, as he has, that it's because he's been, uh, again, the plaintiff has not involved him in those decisions. She has not reached out to him to discuss things with him. Uh, but again, communication is one of those things that uh, you probably can't uh, simply look at and say, well, it's this person's fault. I mean, communication is a two-way process. And if the defendant wishes to have communication, he needs to initiate, he needs to be able to uh, seek to enforce that. And uh, in this uh, particular case, as the court looks back through the file, no time during the three plus years has the defendant ever filed any petition in this to seek to uh, to initiate or seek to force the communication with the plaintiff on those particular important decisions in the life of the child. And as a result, that's why the court states that he has in fact abdicated that those particular responsibilities. In this uh, particular case, it's clear that uh, based under the appropriate statute that I referenced that uh, again, it's a matter of whether the parties are able to cooperate and generally agree, not always agree as to important as decisions affecting the welfare of the child, which they have not done. As a result of the fact that they have not done that and that the defendant has not taken action to enforce that provision in any way, the court will recognize that plaintiff has been solely responsible for a good deal of the child's, well over half of the child's life on making those decisions without any input from the defendant. As a result, the court does believe that she has met her burden of proof in this matter to establish that it is in the best interest of the child based upon, uh, again, facts that I will get into when I get into the best interest factors that in fact it is in the best interest of the child and the court will find that this by a clear and convincing evidence even though well by clear and convincing evidence the court will find that in fact uh, it is in the best interest of the child that she be awarded sole legal custody and the court will so order in this matter I want to address next the issue of, again, the change in domicile. Change in domicile is covered by MCL 722.31 in this matter. And uh, what the court has to look at is this read is already addressed is the uh, court has to engage in a four step approach and first, with, folk, with primary focus on the child, has the moving party established by a preponderance of evidence the following factors. First factor, does the change have the capacity to improve the quality of life of both the child and the relocating parent? The plaintiff has 
testified that, in fact, it does have the uh, chance to improve the quality of life by moving to Tucson. And she points out that uh, the factors that she looks at, she says, first, again, that uh, she is going to go back to school. She seeks to have her cosmetology license that she, in fact, would make approximately $70,000 a year in contrast to the $40,000 that she's making at the current time, that she has done some research in that. She's looked into the school. She has apparently acquired financial aid, which would pay for her tuition, that she would complete that training in approximately 10 to 12 months, and that they have an excellent job placement where there is potential for 90% of the graduates to get jobs and that she would, in fact, uh, have uh, that opportunity in Tucson. Also, there's been much testimony about the uh, house that she would have. The state has been testified to by both her and Mr. Richardson that, uh, in fact, the house that they would be living in is a house which would have four bedrooms, three baths, two, two living rooms, various other rooms, in this particular matter, as well as a fenced-in yard, that in fact that it's more than uh, able to provide for and to facilitate both the uh, plaintiff and uh, the minor child, as well as the plaintiff's other children in this particular case. So that would appear to be established in this particular case. The uh, court notes that, uh, again, she's went through other things when she had testified. She testified that it appears that the student to uh, teacher ratio would be greater in the school that, uh, that the child would go to in Tucson, that, uh, that in fact, the child could, even though school started in Arizona last Monday, that she would be able to get her into school, that she uh, would, in fact, uh, be able to be enrolled, and that she believed that that school is superior to uh, Fremont, which has a higher parent-to-teacher ratio and limited, uh, I guess you say, limited opportunity. She had mentioned the one thing that her children, I think she looks generally, are involved in uh, robotics, that, in fact, currently, uh, the child has exposure to that through the library, but if in Arizona she would have exposure to that through a program through the local university, and that that is preferable. Court notes as well that uh, she uh, testified in this case that uh, that there would be other opportunities for the child being in the home where there is a two income household. She has testified as did Mr. Richardson's about uh, providing for the child and, uh, and supporting her uh, during the time that the parties had again, been together and that uh, uh, Lauren as he said, he looks at Lauren as his daughter, uh, notwithstanding the fact she isn't, but he looks at her, that he's provided for her in that way. The uh, plaintiff has testified that other than the nominal uh, child support of $25 per month that the uh, defendant has not provided for uh, Lauren in this uh, particular matter, other than that particular amount. And the defendant does not refute that. Uh, and as a result, the court is taking that into consideration. Uh, it does appear that based upon, again, all of the testimony, and again, the court can't reiterate everything, but based upon the testimony, it does appear that the uh, change in domicile does have the capacity to improve quality of life of both the child and the relocating parent, and the court will still find. 
Next factor is the degree to which each parent has utilized their parenting time and whether the change is inspired by a desire to defeat or frustrate parenting time. Clearly in this matter, uh, although that is contested and disputed by the defendant stating he didn't have a way to contact the uh, plaintiff, that uh, he states that her phone number was changed, that she, he had been blocked and both his mother as well. The plaintiff testified that she's been on the same plan which was paid for by her fiance for approximately four years, that her number has not changed, that in fact, uh, she has likewise not moved, that she has that she's not uh, blocked either the defendant or his mother, that, uh, and in fact, the court notes and looking at the file, he knows that he can pursue enforcement action as he has recently initiated as it related to parenting time that likewise he could have initiated over the approximately three and a half years a uh, enforcement action as it relates to parenting time and he has not done that until recently until being informed that the uh, plaintiff intended to move so court will find in this matter he has not had the pairing time in the last three plus years approximately three and a half years and uh court will find that her move in this matter is not uh been i guess you'd say uh precipitated if you would or uh, inspired by her desire to defeat or frustrate parenting time, which has not occurred for, again, the three and a half years. Court addresses the three and a half years only because the child's only six. And court has found in the past, oftentimes, almost every time when you address issues concerning children, you can, children have a different perspective on time. As you get older, your time changes. And Children, I've had cases in which the children have, uh, children have testified, but children have also stated things to such that they, something may happen and a child may happen three months ago, six months ago, and children will talk about that event as if it was years and years ago. In contrast, for adults, it would seem like it was just maybe yesterday or just a little bit of time ago, but children, it seems like a long time ago. And in this case, again, the parenting time has not occurred in three to three and a half years. So again, this child has very little of any uh, maybe remembrance. And as the plaintiff had testified, she doesn't know the defendant. She has no relationship with the defendant, wouldn't even be able to recognize the defendant. But the court does not believe that she is, uh, again, changing the domicile in a, in a manner to frustrate or defeat parenting time. Next factor is whether the court satisfied changing change parenting time would preserve or foster the parental relationship of each party and whether each party parent is likely to comply. The court does believe that the parties would be likely to comply, although the court does have some question as to whether the uh, defendant will uh, again take advantage of and facilitate utilize the uh, parenting time which might occur in this uh, particular case. Uh, so the next factor is whether the party opposing is motivated to secure, secure a financial advantage. There's been no testimony about that. So the court will not consider that in this particular matter. Next is whether there's domestic violence. Obviously there's been testimony by the plaintiff uh, again, identifying and describing the domestic violence that she had with the uh, defendant that he perpetrated that in fact uh, it resulted in criminal charges it also resulted in her acquiring a personal protective order in this matter so the court is taking all of that into consideration court believes that after the court identifies and reviews all of the factors the court has to to determine whether a change and domicile is appropriate, that the factors do support a change in domicile in this case. The court then has to look at, does 
the change in domicile and does it in fact change the established custodial environment. An established custodial environment exists if over an appreciable time, the parent and the children naturally look to the custodian in that environment for love, affection, guidance, emotional ties, and uh, so the court in looking at that particular uh, those issues, the court notes that uh, the statute provides that the age of the child, the physical environment, and the inclination of the custodian of the child as to the permanency of the relationship shall also be considered. In this uh, particular case, the testimony is shown and has been testified to that uh, Lauren does in fact look to her mother for, again, the uh, guidance, discipline, necessity of life, which she has provided for over that period of time when the uh, defendant has not been involved and for parental comfort. She's testified specifically about that, that again, there's uh, signs of affection between she and Lauren that uh, they hug, that they have a good relationship, that, uh, again, uh, the court clearly believes that uh, based upon the evidence in this uh, particular matter, that, in fact, the established custodial environment is with the plaintiff mother. Then the court has to look, does the change in domicile, does that alter the established custodial environment? Court does not find that the change of domicile would in any way alter the uh, established custodial environment in this particular case. So the court will not uh, take that into consideration in this uh, matter. As a result, then the court will find in this particular matter that a change in domicile is appropriate. The court will allow the plaintiff to change the domicile of the child to the state of Arizona in this particular matter. There's also been question then next as it relates to parenting time. There's been very little, if any, testimony as to parenting time other than that there should be a phased in process because the uh, there just hasn't been any contact for again that three plus years in this matter. You can uh, again you can look at what the basis was for that. The uh, plaintiff will state that well there's been no contact because he hasn't initiated it. The defendant testified repeatedly, well, I attempted to, but I was not able to get a hold of the uh, plaintiff. I was not able to, in fact, uh, acquire the parenting time that had previously been ordered. The court will note has been testified to that, uh, again, there was uh, proceedings that he initiated through the uh, front of the court to enforce the uh, parenting time, but he didn't appear at the hearing. And as a result, the, the matter was dismissed in this particular case. So the court has to look at, in fact, the appropriate statute, which is MCL 722.27A, and look at uh, parenting time. Well, parenting time shall be granted when it is in the best interest of the minor child. And the court has to look at the best interest factors. The court, that's why I stated the court would look at those best interest factors as we proceed in this particular matter. First, the court has to look at the first factor is the love, affection, other emotional ties existing between the parties involved and the child. In this case, I've already alluded to the fact that the under the established custodial environment that the child and the plaintiff have a excellent relationship. There are signs of affection. Uh, they have emotional ties, etc. Uh, the 
the record is almost completely void of any, uh, in, I guess you'd say, a testimony on behalf of the defendant as it relates to this factor. And it uh, could be because of the length of time that he's not had communication or contact. So the court will find that this factor does favor the plaintiff mother. Next factor is the capacity and disposition of the parties involved to give the child love, affection, guidance, continuation of the education and raising in a particular religion or a creed. Been no testimony about a particular religious upbringing, so the court will not consider that. But the uh, t the uh, plaintiff will note that the uh, she had talked about being involved in the school and that the child in Fremont School and in the current school, and that she has demonstrated the capacity and disposition to give the child love, affection, and guidance. Whereas the defendant has simply asserted that but there has not been an established relationship such, such as to demonstrate that in this particular case, the court will find that this factor favors plaintiff mother. Next factor is the capacity and disposition of the parties involved to provide the child food, clothing, medical care, and other remedial care recognized in place of medical care and other material needs. Clearly, the plaintiff has done this because she's almost solely been responsible for this for the time that the parties have not had contact. Uh, again, they alluded to and addressed the fact that the uh, defendant, notwithstanding the minimal amount of uh, uh, child support of $25 per month, that there has been enforcement action against him for uh, payment of support. The court will take uh, notice, if you would, judicial notice of the court's own file, and there have been uh, various uh, enforcement proceedings uh, pursued against the defendant in this matter. And uh, again, the is the plaintiff that solely provided all of the medical care for the child. And as a result, the court will find that this factor does favor the plaintiff mother. Next is the length of time the child has lived in a stable, satisfactory environment and the desirability of maintaining continuity. It does appear that uh, Lauren has been in a stable, satisfactory environment for the last at least three and a half to four years where the uh, defendant has not been involved. And uh, so, the, and the court notes that during that time, Lauren has not been in his care. So obviously the environment in his home is not a stable, satisfactory environment for the child. The court will find that this factor favors the plaintiff mother. Next factor is the permanency of the family unit, the existing or proposed or custodial home. Uh, in this matter, there's been no testimony from the defendant as to any changes in his family unit. Uh, there's not been any testimony about the change in the plaintiff's home uh, as she is, there's perspective or a possible change that she is engaged, but uh, and she has a fiance, Mr. Richardson, as we've seen, but there's uh, nothing else in that regard. The court will find that this factor doesn't weigh in favor of either of the parties. Next factor is the moral fitness of the parties involved. Uh, in doing so, again, there's been minimal amount of testimony as to this factor, but uh, the court will note uh, that the court can consider offensive behaviors as it relates to moral fitness, and some of that would necessarily be domestic violence. I'm not going to address that under this factor because it'll be addressed under factor K. Court doesn't find that this factor favors either of the parties. I will not weigh it. Next factor is the physical and mental health. There's been very little testimony, although the uh, plaintiff has stated that she is uh, physically wet, well. She has no mental health issues, not seeking any treatments, not in any uh, therapy or anything of that nature, not in any medication. And there's been no testimony about from the defendant about this, but there's been no testimony that he is not in uh, appropriate mental or physical health. The court will not weigh this factor in either party's favor. Next factor is the homeschool and community record of the child. Clearly, uh, in this matter, the home record is in the home of the plaintiff, as the, she's not been in the home of the defendant 
for again, uh, three plus years. She has been in school uh, at Fremont. Uh, <clears throat> she's going into first grade this next school year. And uh, again, it's been she and Mr. Richardson has been provided for uh, the attendance at school. She stated they've, that Lauren has not missed any school, that she's had good attendance and that they provide the transportation uh, daily for her to attend school. She's pretty young, so she there's been no testimony about any community record. The court will find that this factor does favor the plaintiff mother. Next factor is the reasonable preference of the child. The court did talk to Lauren and uh, notwithstanding her being very hesitant to speak to me, I, I don't know if uh, my uh, reputation precedes me or if it had been simply blown up that uh, I was some evil monger or monster or whatever, but uh, she was very reticent to speak to me. But when she got in the room, she was very, uh, she was very open, very polite, very direct. And uh, really it was a pleasant to, uh, it was pleasant to speak to her. She even, uh, uh, I guess you'd say she even rebuked me. I talked to her about how things were going in school and she was fine. I related to her that uh, unfortunately when I was in elementary school, I spent far too much time in the principal's office and she rebuked me saying that I shouldn't do that. And uh, so she was very open. She did express a preference that the court has taken into consideration. Next factor is the willingness in, a, in that factor. Uh, so the court is considering. The next is the willingness and ability of each of the parents to facilitate and encourage a close and continued parent-child relationship with the other parent. The testimony of the defendant is that the plaintiff has not been willing to do that, that she has not done that, but her testimony is that the uh, defendant has not reached out. He's not sought to, uh, again, take his uh, scheduled parenting time from the order of 2019 until just recently when, in fact, she was uh, uh, had filed the petition to change domicile and move. The court finds that uh, in this matter that, again, the plaintiff has been willing to facilitate that relationship, but that, in fact, there has not been the attempt, if you would, to uh, facilitate that on the part of the defendant. So the court will not find this factor to weigh in favor of either party. Next factor is the domestic violence. And uh, there's been testimony about that, that there was domestic violence by the uh, defendant. The court is going to take that into consideration, weigh that factor in favor of the uh, plaintiff. Next factor is any other factor considered by the court to be relevant in the particular child dispute. In this matter, the court notes that uh, other factors that are relevant in this case, the, the uh, testimony of the plaintiff is that the uh, she has two other children whom uh, Lauren has uh, resided with her entire life. The court is taking that into consideration in this uh, particular matter and will take that into consideration for purposes of determining her best interest. So taking all of that uh, in her best interest and the court will then consider the factors the court has to look at uh, in determining whether and what to what extent the uh, parenting time should be. First factor, special circumstances or needs of the child. The court determined there are no special circumstances or needs. Second factor is whether a child less than one year of old, that's not applicable in this case. Court will not consider it. The next factor, likelihood of abuse or neglect of a child during parenting time. There's been no testimony about that, so the court will not consider it. Next factor is the likelihood of abuse of a parent during the exercise of parenting time based upon the domestic violence. The court is concerned about that, but uh, obviously there's ways to facilitate that, so I don't think that's an issue. Next factor is the inconvenience or burdensome impact of travel. Obviously now with the change in domicile, there would be uh, inconvenience and burn some impact of travel. However, that's something that could be worked out in this uh, particular case as time goes on. Next is whether parents reasonably expected to exercise court-ordered parenting time. 
the defendant has not exercised the court ordered parent time in the past. So the court takes that into consideration. Next factor is whether a parent frequently failed to exercise parenting time. Uh, the court uh, would recognize, as I've stated, that he has not exercised his parenting time, so I'm considering that. Next is the threatened or actual detention of the child. Uh, there's been no testimony about that. And next is, again, any other relevant factors, as I have testified, or as I've stated in this matter, as the testimony has shown, is that the uh, defendant has abdicated that parenting time now for well in excess of uh, three years in this matter. So the court is considering that. And the court believes that based upon the testimony that there has to be a gradual reintegration of parenting time if the defendant wishes to do that. First, the court would in fact note that the parties aren't able to communicate, haven't communicated. And so the court will uh, order that the parties would communicate through our family wizard app and uh, that, in fact, uh, they would uh, attempt to, uh, well, they would, that they would within uh, seven days of today's date, that the parties would uh, basically uh, acquire that app so that they can communicate. The court would caution each party so that they know and I think that there's been testimony that, that the plaintiff knows at least that, in fact, that communication through our family wizard is kept uh, through the app and the court would have access to that. So uh, that's good because then the parties can't make false claim. Well, I tried to contact them. I didn't try to contact them or whatever they might state. There's a record of that, so the court would be able to see that in a subsequent proceeding should that be necessary. So the court would order that the parties would enroll and acquire that apps within seven days of today's date. The court would allow in this particular matter that uh, the uh, defendant would have an opportunity to uh, communicate with Lauren through the Our Family Wizard app or arrange through Zoom or other uh, type of uh, application like that, that they would, that he would be entitled to communicate with her for, uh, again, for one, I guess I'd say one day uh, per week or up to half an hour and uh, communicate. I understand this is going to be difficult at first until the relationship can be established and reestablished. And I would state for your purposes, Mr. Uh, Wines, that the first couple or first few or whatever may be very short that, in fact, you may be only able to talk to her for a limited period of time, maybe a couple minutes or something of that nature. And in fact, what I'll do is at least I'm going to change that for the uh, communication would be for uh, up to 10 minutes for the first, I guess I'd say the first 10 communications between the parties, between the defendant and Lauren. And then after that, it can graduate graduate for another 10 minutes, so up to 20 minutes, then up to a half an hour for each succeeding 10 uh, visits. So if the defendant doesn't communicate with her, so there's only been nine, it would be the next 10 before it would graduate and go up. The uh, court would then at that point entertain uh, the opportunity of the defendant to have some face-to-face -face contact with Lauren in Arizona or in Michigan based upon where the parties may be. If Again, if the plaintiff is in 
Michigan, then it may be able to be arranged here and that that uh, initial contact would be supervised with another third party that Lauren is acquainted with and familiar with. And uh, that that would be, uh, again, a limited a limited contact for, let's say, an hour, and uh, that it would be in a public place supervised by a, uh, I guess I'd say an individual of the uh, plaintiff's choosing, but I would say not Mr. Richardson, uh, as that may, again, be more awkward and a problem in this particular case, but it'd be somebody that Lorna would be very familiar with. After that, the court would entertain, again, mm -hmm. as long as that's proceeded and proceeded well, the court would entertain a motion to expand preparing time at that uh, particular point. And uh, I guess we can leave it at that and uh, uh, simply wait until all of that occur. And then we would have uh, some uh, parenting time in this matter. The court is does note that again there is apparently a referee proceeding in this matter that uh, Miss Reed had referenced to later this month. In view of the testimony I've heard and everything else, what the court is going to do in this particular case, especially with the change in the parenting time. The court is going to uh, dismiss that referee proceeding in this uh, particular matter, and that uh, we would proceed with uh, parenting time as the court is outlined. With that, I'll ask uh, Ms. Reed, is there anything else that you believe the court needs to address or has failed to address before we conclude? Um, for child support, I'm going to need some tax returns or documents from Mr. Wines to calculate that order. Okay, the court will order in this matter, uh, Mr. Wines, that you would provide to Ms. Reed a uh, your most recent tax return, if that's 2023, you provide that, and a recent paycheck stub showing year-to-date income, and that you would provide that to her within 10 days of today's date. Can you do that, sir? So who met Jennifer Reed? Yes, provide that to Miss Reed, the attorney. Yeah, I could do that. Okay, thank you. And oh. uh, sorry, I guess I'll ask uh, Miss uh, Miss Cannon. You can uh, provide that to your Miss Reed as well. Your most recent tax return and your most recent paycheck stub, and uh, that. At the time that you exchange the uh, order or for, provide that to uh, Mr. Wines, Ms. Reed, that you would provide him with that paycheck stub and a recent tax return as well. Okay. And the part oh, uh, in this matter note, as the uh, Ms. Canada testified to that she paid for uh, insurance of $70 per month for the four individuals you would simply prorate that, uh, uh, Ms. Reed, as it relates to uh, to Lauren in this matter. That's correct. Okay. Anything else, uh, Ms. Reed? Just to go over everything one more time so I make sure that order I'm preparing is correct. Um, so plaintiff is awarded sole legal custody. Her request to change a domicile to Arizona is granted. For parenting time, the defendant is going to have either our family wizard or Zoom calls with the minor child one time per week for up to 10 minutes for the first 10 weeks and then 20 minutes for the following 10 weeks and then ending in a half an hour. He has to be consistent in those phone calls and video calls or that time resets. So if he's not consistent in like week nine and he misses it, he still has to do 10 more weeks of phone calls. And then uh, not, he, not ten, that he'd have to do 10 weeks total, not that he would then have to do 10 consistent weeks, because I don't want to get in a position where he misses a week and then, OK, he's got to be 10. Once he has 10 in, then it would progress to the, okay. the greater time. He's going to have 10 calls. OK, we just going to clarify that in order. 
And then once he's graduated to a half an hour of video calls, which should be after 20 weeks of contact. Correct. Then we can schedule through the parties a visit. Is it one visit or is it multiple visits for an hour if she's in Michigan or he's in Arizona? It, it, it's one visit initially to okay. break that ice. And then the court will entertain a motion at that point to expand. Okay. So after the 20 weeks of one per week phone call during a break or some other time when the child's not in school, Correct. they're going to arrange one in-person supervised visit for one hour in a public pace, not supervised by Mr. Richardson, but by someone who the child is familiar with. And then the court will entertain a motion to expand parenting time. And then child support is under the formula with the appropriate credit given for plaintiff's payment of the health insurance premium for Lauren. Correct. And then we are dismissing the referee here. Yes. Oh, I believe I have everything. Okay. Mr. Wines, is there anything that you believe the court has not addressed or have failed to address before we conclude? You're muted, sir. I don't have no way to Arizona. Um, I go, I'm go. i going to be going back to school and stuff. So, And I work a job in Battle Creek as well. So, Okay. Well, what happens is you're going to have you're going to have to at that point rely upon the plaintiff if she happens to be in Michigan at that particular time. After that, uh, Ms. Cannon, if you are going to be in Michigan after again those twenty phone visits, and the court would simply order that you would have to attempt to facilitate that face to face contact that the court has addressed. Yes, Your Honor, I will. Okay, it may be that you're not, you know, if you're not in, if you're not in Michigan for months after that, obviously you don't have to make a special trip to do that. It'd only be, again, because the defendant's not obviously making the trip uh, out to Arizona. So, but if you are here, we'll attempt to facilitate that. Oh, okay. Okay. One more. Anything else, Mr. Wines? Yeah. Uh... When will the visitations for the wizard start? Okay. Uh, I guess I will ask at this point, I don't know the party's work schedule, so I'll go to plaintiff first. Ma'am, when would you be able to work out and whether that those, I guess you say those video visits would occur? When would, uh, is there a particular day of the week which is better and a particular time? Your Honor, I believe Sunday will be good. Um, that way, she'll be free to talk and she can have her own quality time with him on the phone and I'll make okay. time for that. Okay. Sir, would Sunday work? Yes, if that works for them. Okay. What time, uh, Ms. Cannon, would work for you? Sunday around, church, around 4 p.m. Okay. Fine. That work for you, sir, 4 p.m. on Sundays? Yes, that work. Okay, okay. Then you can put Miss Reed. You can put that in that it would those would occur on Sundays at four o'clock p.m. Okay. And okay. how do I get this app that you're talking about? I'm not familiar with it. What? The Family Wizard, or I'm not. Our, it's familiar. called Our Family Wizard. You can go to the App Store and you can look it up, and then you download it. You have there is a cost to the utilizing that app, you'll have to set all of that up. And then uh, what happens, you can uh, then communicate with Ms. Reed's office as it relates to uh, to doing that. What I'll do is I'll order, and you can put this in the order as well, Ms. Reed, because it, in case they have some difficulties uh, setting this up, et cetera, I'll have that the first visit would be on August 18. 2024. That way, uh, we've got time to set it up and everybody has time to get acquainted with the app. August 18th? Yes, August 18th would be the first uh, phone visit. At 4 o'clock, correct? 4, 4 o'clock p.m. Okay. Anything else, Mr. Wines? 
Um, Could you repeat that? Again? No, that that's it. Okay. Anything else uh, as a result of what's happened, Ms. Reed, that we need to address? No, Your Honor. Okay. Ms. Reed, I'll direct that you would uh, prepare that order and submit it uh, for, uh, obviously, for approval and uh, then uh, provide it to the court. All right. Thank you. Okay. Thank you both. You're free to go, and I wish you the best of luck, and I hope uh, things uh, get back on, uh, again, a routine and uh, for Lauren's best interest. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. You're free to go. Thank Have you, a good Mr. day. You too. Bye. When you just see someone and instinctively know that person's going to rub you the wrong way. It's nothing specific about them. Nothing, not the way they look or anything else. You just have that gut feeling that that person's going to be an asshat. And you're right. Yeah, that's what happened here. Is that wrong? Is that being judgmental? I just, you just know? Oof. Let's go to court. We're hearing calls number DF1816726, Garcia and Martinez. With the parties in the Garcia and Martinez matter, please raise your right hands. Do, do each of you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give in this cause will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Miss Martinez? Yes. Mr. Garcia? Yes. You may both lower your hands. Mr. Dale, you may proceed. <laughs> Thank you, Judge. Uh, we're here today on the state's suit for modification of support order and to confirm support arrears. Uh, Your Honor, we have a uh, proposed order from the state uh, before I state those terms and take testimony, I would like to offer no evidence what's marked for identification purposes as State's Exhibit A, a copy of the payment record in the case. State's A is admitted. Thank you, Judge. Uh, may I state the proposed order and then take testimony? You may. Thank you, Judge. There are three children of the case. Uh, the state's, uh, the proposed order includes a Child support judgment uh, seven against uh, Mr. Garcia in the amount of seven thousand six hundred and forty-seven dollars and seventy-eight cents, and that is after a release judge of three thousand six hundred and eighty-four dollars. And the state uh, is asking that Mr. Garcia repay that amount in the uh, in in the amount of $45 monthly beginning September 1st, 2024. Your Honor, the proposed order also includes a medical support judgment of $4,998. And that's as of August 22nd, 2024. State's requesting that Mr. Garcia pay that at, at $25 a month beginning September 1st, 2024. That judgment was four thousand nine ninety eight even. Four thousand nine ninety eight and twenty eight cents. Okay, twenty eight cents. And your honor, the mother will be ordered to maintain the child in the three children on a government medical assistance program moving forward. The state's requesting father pay $65 a month beginning September 1st, 2024. And parties are ordered to pay half of all unreimbursed medical expenses. Mr. Garcia has uh, no other children for whom he owes duty of support. However, um, his alleged uh, Income only income at this time is Social Security disability. As such, based on that, Judge, the state's requesting he pay guideline support of $164 a month beginning September 1st, 2024. State's requesting court costs be billed to Mr. Garcia, and the order does not include any non disclosures. Excuse me, Mr. Judge. Dale, I'm going to ask that you repeat those judgment amounts for me, please. 
Yes, uh, child support judgment after release is $7,647.78. And the medical judgment is $4,000. $998.28. And Judge Mother is requesting a non disclosure. I apologize. And the payouts on $4,998.28. Yes, the payout $25. And the payout on the child support $45. Okay. Okay. You may call your first witness. Thank you, Judge. Before I do, uh, the mother is alleging uh, the father um, has another side job, Your Honor, and the father disagrees with the child support arrears. Okay, one second. Mr. Garcia, we are in court. If you were in mm -hmm. court, you would not be allowed to take a drink of your drink, okay? Oh, sorry about that. That's okay. Right. We just have to I'm conduct sorry. ourselves like we're in the court. <laughs> Thank All you, right. sir. Thank you, Judge. I'll call the mother first. Um, Ms. Martinez, what is your name? Amanda Martinez. Okay. And Ms. Martinez, did you hear the terms of the state's proposed order that I stated to the court? Yes. Okay. Um, do you understand all of those terms? Yes, I do. Okay. And you're in agreement to release some money to this OT, is that correct? Correct. And you understand, are you re releasing that money freely and voluntarily? Correct. Has anyone threatened or coerced you into releasing any money? No. And you understand that once that money is released today that you won't be able to come back and ask for it later? Correct. I understand that. Okay. And you're in agreement to essentially releasing uh, one year's of arrears. Is that right? Yes. Okay. And why are you... Um, agreeing to release one year's worth of arrears? Uh, we lived, um, we were living back together um, the year of 2020. Um, so that's the reason why I'm releasing one year. Okay. And you're in agreement <laughs> to enroll the children in government health program? Yes. Okay. Um, and is your understanding that Mr. Garcia does relieve Social Security disability income on a monthly basis? Yes. Okay. And you understand that the state's requesting that he pay child support of $163, which is based on that amount that he receives for benefits, correct? Correct. Okay. But you're asking that his child support uh, be more than that, right? Yes. Okay. And why are you uh, making that request? Um, I know he has another job. He works for his sister. Um, he's told me that. Um, so that's the reason why um, it's not fair, fair to me. Um, I, I do have three kids. We have three kids together and 164 is not going to, it's not enough. Okay. Um, what kind of job are you alleging he, he does on the side? He does. Um, he works for a, a plumbing company. Um, I believe he's take, he takes calls all day. So you're alleging he works um, in an office setting? Correct. Okay. Um, it's a family plumbing business? Mm hmm Yes. Okay. So you understand the state has no uh, evidence of income for that job, correct? Correct. He works for his sister, so I'm sure his sister pays him under the table. Okay. So what are you requesting his child support be set at today? At least 400, 400 a month. I think that's fair enough. Okay. Anything else you would like to tell the judge regarding uh, the amount you're requesting? Um, I believe it should be more now that I think about it um, because he does have that other job. So I would say 700 a month. Yeah, I think that should be fair enough. Okay. And to your knowledge, how long has he uh, worked uh, in this 
family business? Um, I would say longer than a year. I would say about maybe two, a year to a year to two years. Okay, and why do you think that? Um, because he ever since he was disabled, um, that's I know that's why he needs some kind of income coming in. So, um, his sister offered him that job. Okay, what kind of disability uh, does Mr. Garcia have, to your knowledge? Um, he receives, um, he only has one kidney, so he receives that kidney dialysis. So that I know that's what he has as a disability. Okay. And you're requesting that your home address shall not be included in the order, correct? Um, correct. I mean, he already knows it, but that's fine. Well, do you, are you asking your address not be included? Or are you okay that your address be in the order today? I'm okay with it. Okay. I pass the witness, Judge. I'd like to call the father. You may. Thank you. Mr. Garcia, what is your full name? Antonio Manuel Garcia. And Mr. Garcia, did you hear the terms of the state's proposed order that I stated to the court previously? Uh, you mean the first part you said about 164 and whatever else? Yes. Did you hear the terms that I stated before yeah. I called Martinez? Oh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. And you're in agreement with all of those terms, except for the uh, child support judgment, correct? Yes. Yes, sir. I'm, I'm, I'm disagreeing. Oh, did you say disagree or agreement? You agree with all of the terms that I stated, except for the child support judgment, correct? Yes. Okay. Um, you understand that Miss Martinez is releasing essentially one year's worth of child support arrears that you owe? Yes, sir. Do that. Okay, and that would come out to be seven thousand six hundred and forty-seven dollars and seventy-eight cents. Correct. Yes. Okay. Um, how? Uh, how much? What do you disagree with regarding the arrears? Okay, so this this is my thing. I wanted the judge to hear me out, or you to um. So, yeah, I'll, the only thing I get is the disabled disability, number one, right now. And that was a job four years ago when my kidneys were up and Mr. going. Mr. Garcia, Mr. Garcia. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. He asked you is why don't you agree to the $7,647? What is it about that number? You think uh -huh. you shouldn't have been ordered to pay child support? You, did you live with the kids? Were you giving Yes, yeah. Oh, yes, yes. Okay. I'm sorry. That's okay, yes. So that was ultimately why I wanted to see you. That's that's what you just said. Okay, within just y'all within those four years, she put me on child support, right? I lived with her two years out of those four years. Here I am, a grown man, staying with her, paying all the bills, still paying her child support, living with the same roof under my children, which makes no sense. She's hung that over my head since day one. She did not want to marry me because what do you? She was so worried. Oh, you're trying to get off the of child support. I don't care about paying child support. I'll pay you the child support, but it ain't fair. I can't even go to work and get a regular job right now because I'm disabled. And then she okay. wants to be greedy. I'll take off a year. I'll take off a year. A okay. year? I was with you for two years and paid your bills. Okay. Okay, sir. Thank so, you. So, Mr. Garcia, you're asking that, that there be a total of two years of credit. Correct. 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 To make the okay. fair trade. Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, and regarding your current income, you received Social Security disability? Yeah, dis disability. I'm 100% disabled. I'm on acute ending kidney dialysis is what I'm on. Okay. Do you have any other source of income at this time? No, not as we speak, not at this time, no. Okay. When was the last time you were employed? Um, the, la job? the last time I, I had a regular job, I was giving her regular child support, was at a company called Lifeline. I was transporting kidney patients. I was picking them up, dropping them off. That was the last time. That was it. That was the only time I could move. I've been in and out through hospitals the whole time. Okay. How long or when did you start receiving your disability income? I started receiving it probably like uh, my first payment. I didn't get until like maybe June. June of which June? year? This year, I believe. Okay. Is your family own a plumbing business? They own a business, but I don't work for them. I'm a liability. I cannot work for them. 
you can't work in an office type setting and take phone calls. They don't want, they don't want me there period. Cause I'm a liability period. They don't know if I'm going to croak or have a stroke on the job or whatnot. Okay. How long have, has your family had that business? It's, I, I don't know. They probably had it for over five years or so. My sister and them owned that business, but that was when I was healthy. I was working, being a plumber. I ain't, I ain't got no energy like that. Okay. When was the last, or when did you stop? Uh, working for them? And, yes. That's probably like, oh, shoot. I don't know. Probably about four, three, four years ago, somewhere around there. If they, I mean, Texas attorney takes out my, my child support. They can go back to look it up and that'll give you the dates where I last worked for them. Okay, but you don't work in an office setting taking calls or anything like that? No. Even on a part-time basis? No. I've told her I went to go look for some office jobs, but even they won't even hire me. Okay. You want to write past the witness? Okay. Then I will order a child support judgment after release of $7,647.78, order it paid at $45 a month, Order a medical support judgment of $4,998.28. Order that paid at $25 per month. Order mom to maintain government health insurance. Order dad to pay cash medical of $35 a month. Six. The state was requesting 65, Judge, but. Yeah, I know. I'm ordering 35. Okay. okay thank you. I'll order child support at $164 a month. Court costs as billed. All start dates will be September 1st, 2024. Mr. Garcia, I understand that you lived with her for two years. But for those two years, you did nothing to get that child support stopped. You could have had that child support I tried. stopped. Mr. Garcia, Mr. Garcia. She would not do it. The state yeah, told no, no, her you have to be no, married. No. Mr. Garcia, are you listening? Okay, did, I'm gonna you to did you go talk to a private attorney to get them to stop it? Did you file something with the court yourself? You do not have to depend on the state or her to get your child support modified. You could have filed they, a modification I know. And a I long asked, time ago. I asked so, them. They kept you, telling me you got to be not, married, Mr. Garcia. Not listen, asked, when, when you call you, down there to the the, you call Mr. down Garcia, there. Mr. Garcia, you're listen. not listening. Okay. You're not listening, sir. I said, you do not have to call the state. You can file something with the court system yourself. You could have gone to the court, filed a modification. You could have gone to a private attorney, filed a modification. So you didn't. It's her money. She's the only person that can release it. She's released a year of it. That's all she wants to release. And so that's why I ordered the judgment in the amount that the state asked for. Okay? Now. See what I'm saying? You call down there and they, they don't want to tell you all that. Just, yeah. Let me talk for a second. Please hear me out, Judge. When you call down there and say, hey, I'm with my baby mama. We live together under the same roof. They say, oh, Mr. Garcia, you, no, we can't do that. She can only do that or y'all got to get married. They won't tell me no information. They won't give me no information. You got to fight with the, the ladies on the phone in order to get somewhere. Just Mr. like I'm telling you, you can't Mr. get nowhere Garcia? on that. There are other options other than the state of Texas. They well, are not. Knows about these options. Okay, sir. You don't know about them, and I can't. I can't do anything about that. Yeah, but you want to sit you there. You're gonna you didn't with her go with to the court system. It. You didn't go to you're the be, court. You're gonna and side with her when she's court. being greedy about the situation, sir, though. Mr. Garcia, I'm not siding with anybody but the law. That's all. I don't side with yeah, anyone. No, you can. You can really. You can do what's right instead of just. Oh, well, it's on you. You didn't do it. No, Mr. I tried Garcia, to do it. Mr. Garcia, I understand your frustration, sir. But you have to understand what I have the ability to do. I do not have the ability to release her money. It was her money. Okay, so can you, you lower the child support thing for me, Mr. Judge? Excuse me? Which, what, what did you lower? What did we lower the, ch the, 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 the child support to then? Lower it? I didn't lower yes. the child support. I lowered the medical support. Okay, so what am I paying for regular? I'm still paying the same thing? The child support is $164 per month. Okay. That, that is right. based on your disability. Right. Okay. The medical support is $35 a month. Right. Because I have discretion in that, and I can order something different from what they asked for. 
Okay. okay. All right. Thank you. I appreciate that at least that much. Okay. I, I'm right. not, Mr. Garcia, I'm not against you. I'm yeah. not. I just right. have to appreciate do what it. I can do in the bounds of the law. Right, right, right. Okay. okay. I appreciate it. All right. Now, All right. do Thank either you, one of you have any questions? No, not at this time. Um, I have a, I mean, no, I guess not. I mean, it's not worth it. Okay. I mean, if he can't pay a 164 a month, you know, that's on him. So now that I've made my ruling, you have three days to appeal, 30 days to file a motion for new trial. This case is out of the 256th District Court. I am not the last word on this. Judge Sandre Mont Street is the judge in that court. She might have a different opinion. So you can follow an appeal with her. Okay. Now, does everyone understand? Yes, ma'am. Yes. All right. Anyone have any questions now that I've stated that? No. All right. Then thank you both for appearing here today. Good luck to both of you, and you are both free to go. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Today, we're headed to Lenawee County, Michigan, where the competency of mom and dad is being questioned. The child has already been removed from their custody. And there's some concern about even letting them have supervised visits. Let's go to court. Two, one. All right, we are on the record today because there was a petition for emergency removal filed yesterday. Uh, after hours, I did review that, sign that, and authorize the department to remove uh, the child, in this case, a newborn infant, and place the child into foster care given the content of the petition. Today, we've uh, come together to conduct a preliminary hearing that is required to follow that within 24 hours. The attorneys have appeared and had the opportunity to meet with each of their clients, which are the parents, uh, respondent parents in this case, ahead of today's uh, preliminary hearing, which I appreciate. I have received a jury demand as it relates to uh, both parents. And I've been uh, informed that they would like the opportunity to have the petition read aloud onto the record. So I think that covers what I've understood to be happening so far. I have the names of our participants beginning with our guardian ad litem. My apologies, Judge. I couldn't get unmuted there quickly enough. Michael Underwood, legal guardian ad litem for the minor child. Michael Brooks, I represent Mother Jacqueline Lomas. Jacqueline? Hello. Welcome. Michael McFarland, representing father. Please tell the judge your name. I am Dakota Herman Duckworth. I am the father. Thank you. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Nasaja Thomas, counsel for the department. Ms. Harvey. Sarah Harvey, the department. Thank you. All right, um, Stephanie Ames, would you swear in Dakota Harvey Duckworth and Jacqueline Lomas, please? Raise your right hand, please. Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, so I'll be God? Yes. yes. Thank you. All right, I have to ask each of you a number of questions. Uh, so that's why I've had you sworn. Uh, is it true, Mr. Uh, Dakota Harvey Duckworth, that uh, you wish to have a jury trial in this matter? Yes. You do have the right to a jury trial, both of you do. And during that, the department would have to prove the allegations by a preponderance of the evidence. You have the right to an attorney. You'll have an attorney at each hearing. And that attorney can help you and decide whether or not to call your own witnesses to cross-examine witnesses brought by the department. And of course, to help you decide whether or not you want to testify yourselves. I you would also, like to testify myself. Okay. Well, let me let me go through and I'll let you know when I'm ready to ask you a question. All right. So you have the right to have the petition read, which I am happy to do for you today. You also have the right to seek placement or return of your child to you and the right to admit or deny the allegations in the petition and make a statement of explanation. Do either of you have any reason to believe that you have uh, that you're members of a Native American tribe or band or that you're eligible for membership or that your child would be eligible for membership? Mr. Not, Herman Duckworth. Not that I would know if my dad was kind of dark skinned, but I don't know if he was somehow in love. So, 
All right, Ms. Lomas, do you, are you a member of any uh, Native American tribe or band, or no. you know if you have eligibility for that? No, I do not. Okay, very good. Uh, I know that your child is very new, but are there any other cases out there uh, that would concern your child, like a guardianship, for example? No. Okay. Is that okay? Very good. Okay. All right. Well, and then uh, at this time, I will go ahead and read the petition for you onto the record. So the first page, well, let me ask you this too. Dakota, Harmon, Duckworth, do you have a copy of the petition? Right here. Good. Ms. Jacqueline, do you have a copy? She may not. Uh, we only grabbed one of them, I think. Uh, I have to ask Ms. Jacqueline Lomas this question. Ms. Lomas, did you receive a copy of the petition? I'm sorry. Uh, I, don't, um, I think my lawyer grabbed one. Did I grab one? No. Uh, I yeah, asked you if you had one. Oh, I do not. Um, I do not, actually. I well, do well, not. Wait a minute. I did ask her, and she said yes, she'd seen it, and she read it. Oh, um, I, yes, I read it. I read it, but I did not grab it. I'm sorry. Well, you don't have to have it with you right now. I just want to make sure you have a copy somewhere. Yes, I have a copy somewhere. Okay. All right. Very good. So what it says is it's a petition for child protection proceedings, specifically as it relates to Siley, Starman Duckworth. And I'm going to omit his uh, personal identifying information. Uh, the next paragraph identifies the parents, Dakota Harmon Duckworth, a respondent parent, born 11-16-1999, residing on Winter Street in Adrian. The child is, again, I've identified him already. And the mother is identified as Jacqueline Lomas, also a respondent parent, also residing at the same address uh, in Adrian, date of birth 1-29-2000. The second page indicates there are no pending or resolved cases within the jurisdiction of the family division of the circuit court involving the family or family members of the person subject to the petition. Four, the named children come, child comes within the provisions of MCL 712A.2B1-6 as follows. Specifically indicated are paragraphs three and four. The parent or other person legally responsible for the care and maintenance of the child, when able to do so, has neglected or refused to provide proper or necessary support education, medical, surgical, or other care necessary for the child's health or morals, or has subjected the child to a substantial risk of harm to, the, to his mental well-being, or has abandoned the child without proper custody or guardianship. The second allegation of violation of the statute is the home or environment by reason of neglect, cruelty, drunkenness, criminality, or depravity on the part of the parent is an unfit place for the child to live. Paragraph five, the reasons why it is contrary to the welfare of the child for the child to remain in the home. Medical personnel express concerns for Jacqueline Lomas's cognitive ability to provide basic care for the child. Jacqueline did not find out she was pregnant until three weeks prior to giving birth. She does not initiate care for the child and needs prompting for all basic needs. Dakota Harmon Duckworth has mental health concerns, which he refuses treatment for. This includes homicidal ideation. Is very volatile and aggressive with staff. There are concerns for the safety of an infant. Paragraph six, the reasonable efforts made to prevent the removal of the child include CPS investigation, care pregnancy center, medical treatment in hospital, continuous infant care education by staff. The specific allegations um, in paragraph seven are in an attached addendum. This particular page contains the request in paragraph eight to authorize the petition, take jurisdiction over the child, issue an order removing the child uh, from the home. It was signed, of course, by Sarah Harvey and Nastasia Thomas and authorized by myself on August 20th, 2024. The attachment reads, addendum to petition for protective custody and jurisdiction as to respondent parents, jurisdiction and venue. Jacqueline Lomas is the biological mother of the subject minor. Two, Dakota Harmon Duckworth is the legal father of the subject minor. He signed an affidavit of parentage at Prometica Hickman Hospital. No filing number is available at this time, but will be requested. Three, the subject minor is not a member of or eligible for membership in an American tribe, Native, Native American tribe or band. Jacqueline Lomas and Dakota Harmon Duckworth were asked on 8 19 24 and denied that they or the subject minor have Native American heritage. Four, the subject minor is a resident of Lenawee County, Michigan. The subject minor is currently located at Chromatica Hickman Hospital in Adrian, Michigan. Five, the incident of alleged neglect occurred in Lenawee County, Michigan. Factual allegations, neglect and unfit home environment. Six, 
On 8 17 24, CPS received a complaint which alleged physical neglect of the child by Jacqueline Lomas. The complaint included the following information. A. Jacqueline Lomas did not find out she was pregnant until she was 36 weeks. She gave birth at 39 weeks. 7B. During these three weeks, she presented at the Hickman ER on three separate occasions. Subsection I. On one occasion, she reported that she thought her baby had died because she had urinated. I. I. On another occasion, she found her baby had not, quote, eaten, quote, inside her that day, despite the fact that she ate a whole pizza. Subparagraph so Roman numeral 3i. On another occasion, she believed her baby had disappeared because she felt a hard pit in her stomach. Eight, EMTs who transported Jacqueline from her home to the hospital reported to the ER staff that they found the home to be, quote, unlivable, quote, with garbage throughout the home. The parents were sleeping on a dirty blow-up mattress on the floor. At hospital admission, both parents presented with head lice. Nine, hospital staff report significant concerns for Jacqueline's cognitive ability to care for the baby. Ten, Dr. Amy Hammond is the baby's pediatrician. She expressed concerns to the worker and provided a written document which is included with the petition. See Exhibit 1. Eleven, professionals believe Jacqueline lacks the ability to provide basic care to the child. She has been given instruction on feeding and diapering multiple times and continues to struggle understanding or participating in these basic actions. Dr. Hammond reports that this is well outside the normal understanding of first-time parents. 12, Jacqueline struggles to answer yes or no questions without long pauses to think. She will often guess when she does not know the answer. 13, OBGYN Dr. Baird reported to the worker that Jacqueline was unable to answer simple postpartum questions, such as how much bleeding she was experiencing or if she had used the restroom since the birth. 14, Dr. Bear also expressed concerns regarding Jacqueline's cognitive functioning. 15, Jacqueline is unable to maintain a feeding schedule for the child. 16, Jacqueline does not make efforts to hold the child or to bond with him. She is not attentive to him without prompting and assistance from staff. 17, when the child begins to foster cry, Jacqueline becomes highly agitated, which is a concern for his safety while at home. 18, Jacqueline reports that she sees a provider at ACPC. These records have been requested, but not yet received to confirm this. 19, Jacqueline was referred to prenatal neurology and maternal fetal medicine due to taking seizure medication throughout her pregnancy. Jacqueline made no attempt to see either specialist. Dr. Hammond finds this concerning given the numerous appointments and medical care that newborns require. 20, there are no alternative arrangements available in the parent's home to adequately safeguard the child. 21, Dakota Harmon Duckworth and Jacqueline reside together and intend on raising the child together. 22, Dakota reported to the worker and hospital staff that he has a diagnosis of anxiety, bipolar disorder, suicidal ideation, and homicidal, ide homicidal ideation. He reports that he refuses to seek mental health treatment from providers because they want him to, quote, try different things, quote, which he refuses to do. He provided the example of deep breathing and reported, quote, I don't have the cognitive function like that, quote. 23, Dakota reports that he uses THC to control his mental health. He reported that this is not medical marijuana. He reported that he needs to be, quote, zoned out, quote, all of the time to be calm. 24, while at the hospital, Dakota repeatedly exhibits aggressive and volatile behaviors. Security has been called on him. On more than one occasion, these behaviors were triggered by someone asking him to safety plan around his marijuana use. This is something he has yet to agree to. 25, there are concerns about domestic violence in the home. Dakota self-reports that he has aggression issues, screams and yells often, and argues and fights daily with Jacqueline. He reported to the worker that the baby will see this daily. 26. Dakota reported to hospital staff that after they reported that he had lice, he went back to his home, had a panic attack, banged his head against the wall, and then shaved his head. 27. It is unclear if Jacqueline has the ability to provide for the child's material needs. 28. Jacqueline receives SSI payments. Her mother, who resides in Washington, is her payee. 29. Reasonable efforts were made to safety plan for this child, including searching for relatives to assist the family. 30. The family has no family supports who live in the area. The family members reside in Washington. 31. The child is medically ready for discharge. 32. Placement with a licensed foster home has been secured for the child. Statutory citations. 33. Statutory grounds for adjudication. Based on the above stated allegations, jurisdiction is proper under the following subsections of MCL 712A.2B. The child are under the age of 18 and A1. The child's parents, when able to do so, 
Neglect or refuse to provide proper or necessary support, education, medical, surgical, or other care necessary for the child's health or morals, who is subject to a substantial risk of harm to his mental well being, who is abandoned by his parents, or who is without proper custody and guardianship. And B2, the child's home or environment with either parent, by reason of neglect, cruelty, drunkenness, criminality, or depravity on the part of a parent, is an unfit place for the juvenile to live in. 34, statutory grounds for removal. Based on the above stated allegations and pursuant to MCL 712A.13A9, removal of the child from the respondent parent's care and custody is necessary, and placement of the child into foster care is necessary as the following are true. A. Custody of the child with the parent presents a substantial risk of harm to the child's life, physical health, or mental well-being. B. No provision of service or other arrangement except removal of the child is reasonably available to adequately safeguard the child from risk, as described in subdivision A. C. Continuing the child's residence in the home is contrary to the child's welfare. D, consistent with the circumstances, reasonable efforts were made to prevent or eliminate the need for removal of the child. E, conditions of the child away from the parent are adequate to safeguard the child's health and welfare. Relief requested. One, authorize this petition for protective custody and jurisdiction as to respondent parents, Jacqueline Lomas and Dakota Harmon Duckworth. Two, issue an emergency order removing the child from the care and custody of his parents. Jacqueline Lomas and Dakota Harmon Duckworth, placing the child in the care and custody of the department to be placed in a licensed foster placement. Three, take jurisdiction over the child pursuant to MCL 712A.2B1 and 2, and four, set this matter for adjudication trial. Respectfully submitted, Nastasia Thomas and Sarah Hardy for DHS, HHS, I'm going to pause right here real quick because this brings up a really interesting question in my mind. For almost anything we do in life, we're required to have some kind of training first, some kind of test before we're allowed to do it. Even very simple things. But yet we go to the hospital, we pop out a baby and they say, okay, here and send you home on your way with no real training, no instruction manual. I mean, even Ikea gives you an instruction manual, even though, you know, it's kind of hard to understand. There's at least some pictures, you know, you can kind of get the idea with the baby. Nope. Here you go. Good luck. And the only time anyone steps in to do anything is after you've screwed up royally. And it's the baby that suffers when you screw up, which usually ends up making a messed up adult. That's kind of a problem. And there was a recent case in Florida that I wanted to share with you all, but I just hadn't been able to bring myself to do it. But I think this is the right a one-month-old infant was taken to the hospital with a severe head injury. Upon examination, the doctors determined that the baby had multiple skull fractures, as well as healing fractures and other areas of its body. The mother was ultimately arrested. She is a teenager who had said that she wished the child was not in her care and had admitted to squeezing the baby and causing the injuries. I'm going to cover this case in a little more detail on its own stream, but this is an example of WTF is going on in this world that this happened. Yeah, it's a huge issue. And what are, what, what can be done about it? I, I really don't know. There's an exhibit that was attached and served with the petition um, that I'm not going to read. Uh, it's not been incorporated into as part of the petition. Uh, and it is available uh, for the parents and their attorneys to review. There is also the order to take the children into protective custody. In the file at this point, and there is a proof of service indicating that Dakota Harmon Duckworth and Jacqueline Lynn Lomas were filed with it, were served with a petition, notice of this hearing, and the ex parte removal order personally uh, by Hannah Trout on August 20th at 8.25 p.m. Last Miss Trout in the future to put eight twenty twenty four, but that's all right. Okay, so I've received a uh, request for uh, jury demand for both parents and this file, so I'm happy to schedule that um, as it relates to the preliminary hearing itself. I have already authorized the petition. Uh, any testimony as it relates to placement? Uh, pending the jury trial request, Ms. Thomas. Thank you, Honor. If Ms. Harvey can be sworn in, please. All right. 
You swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so it be God? Yes. All right, before we begin, um, gentlemen, obviously you have, your clients each have the right to uh, decline uh, or waive the probable cause aspect of uh, this hearing for purposes of removal or placement. Uh, but I'm also aware of the concerns on the uh, abilities of your clients to, to be informed on those pieces. My client wishes to proceed with the probable cause hearing, Your Honor. <laughs> I'll go along for the ride because you're gonna do it anyway. Well, Mr. Brooks, I think it's imperative that we uh, ensure that we follow the protocols here, uh, especially given I'm not sure that your clients, based on the information I have, can really afford to waive any of their rights to that right. That is a concern of mine as well, Your Honor. All right, Ms. Thomas. Go right ahead. Thank you, Your Honor. Ms. Harvey, um, where are you currently employed? By the way, County DHHS. And what is your position there? I'm currently a CPS investigator. And as a CPS investigator, is that how you became familiar with this family? Yes. And did you draft the petition that is before the court today? Yes, I did. And you heard the judge read the petition into the record? Yes. And is everything that the judge read into the record that you signed to accurate to the best of your belief and knowledge? Yes, to the best of my knowledge. As the investigator in this matter, how did you um, learn about or what tools did you implement to learn about the allegations that you um, put into the petition? Um, this this uh, referral came in over the weekend. So an on-call worker had actually commenced this. Um, so on Monday when I was assigned, I read through um, the allegations and the referral. I also spoke to the on-call worker who uh, went to the hospital and met with the parents, and I spoke to multiple medical staff at the hospital. Do you have an opportunity to speak with the parents? Yes, I did on Monday. Okay. And when you spoke with... Um... When you spoke with medical professionals at the hospital, what concerns were brought to your attention? Um, in, in regards to um, the mother, there were um, major concerns that they had noted regarding uh, a possible lack of cognitive function and her understanding of uh, basic needs for her child. Uh, they reported that they had to uh, multiple times explain simple tasks like diapering, um, they did not feel that she, after multiple attempts to educate her, could understand a feeding schedule. Uh, one example was that a nurse indicated that she thought that Miss um, Lomas could feed her child, but she did not think that she would remember when she fed her, when she fed him last, or how much he had eaten at that time, and she didn't believe that she could, she would wake him up at a set time to feed him. Uh, that was a major concern of theirs. Uh, they also had major concerns regarding her bond with the baby. Uh, there didn't seem to be much bond or a interest in bonding. Uh, in regards to uh, Dakota, there were major concerns regarding um, a number of events uh, in the hospital unit itself in which there were major aggression um, issues. Um, he had to, he left the hospital on multiple occasions because he was very oh, upset. Um, that's what was reported to me. Um, he also would speak over um, Jackie when Jackie was asked questions, when they were trying to gauge if Jackie had an understanding, he would answer for Jackie, uh, which made it very difficult for nursing staff to understand. He also, um, explained some mental health diagnoses, which were very concerning and explained that he was not seeking mental health treatment for those that instead he chooses to smoke marijuana. Um, there were multiple staff members that uh, had various conversations and, uh, with him in which he became aggressive. Um, at one point he postured towards a uh, hospital staff member 
Um, so safety and security became a major major issue um, in that regard. During uh, your investigation, who uh, who informed you of Miss Lomas um, attend going to the hospital during her pregnancy and um, not really have an understanding of what it was like to be pregnant? Um, hospital staff, um, they had updated me on the number of occasions in which she had presented in the ER and what she had presented for. I have requested those records in full, but I have not yet received them. What were the concerns of those prenatal visits to the ER? Um, they, they quoted, I can quote them as saying they were irrational concerns. Um, they did not feel that they were concerns that a typical first time mother would present to the ER for. I apologize for that. And um, what, can you just elaborate a little more on what those concerns were? Yes, um, at one point, um, as was read in the petition, um, it was reported to me that she came to the ER and indicated that she thought her baby was dead because she had urinated. Um, another instance was uh, she was having a, like, a panic attack and, and a paranoia moment that she didn't believe that her uh, child in utero had eaten enough that day. Um, and I believe there was another incident uh, in which she felt that she uh, had lost the baby, that the baby was dead because there was a pit in her stomach. Did anyone report concerns about the living environment of the family at that time? Yes, when on my first um, discussions with hospital staff while they were updating me from things over the weekend, um, hospital staff told me that when EMS had dropped her off in the emergency room. The EMS um, workers had indicated that their home was, in their words, unlivable. Um, it was very dirty. There were- I'm gonna object, and I realize that hearsay is allowed, but this is compounded hearsay. This is what the nurses were told, but EMS, this worker was told by the nurses. So I, I think it's not probative because it's so far removed, that's my objection. Uh, would you like to respond, Ms. Thomas? Your Honor, I think it speaks to the um, concerns of the department that the home environment is an unfit place for the child to reside. And I, I understand Mr. McFarland's concerns, and it is on us at trial to um, secure testimony from those witnesses according to the court rules. Yes, uh, duly noted, Mr. McFarland, but the objection is overruled because hearsay is admissible at this stage. Thank you. All right, uh, you may finish your answer. Um, they had indicated that the parents were sleeping on uh, what they described as a dirty blow up mattress. Um, and nursing staff also indicated to me that while they were in the hospital, the nursing staff was having to clean up their room because there were dirty diapers. Um, inside their hospital room on the floor. There were uh, numerous bottles after they would stop, after they would be done feeding um, the baby, they would just leave the bottles uh, laying around. So nursing staff were having to clean up after them. Um, as it relates to the baby's pediatrician, what were some of the concerns that are highlighted? I know that they are in the um, petition, but what there's also an attached letter. Um, and I believe that you all, did you also speak with uh, Dr. Amy Hammond? Yes, I did on more than one occasion. And what were her concerns for this family and the safety of this child? I'm going um, to reiterate Mr. McFarland's objection to hearsay on hearsay. Uh, same response, Ms. Thomas, or anything different? Same response, Your Honor. Very good. Uh, the objection is overruled, but duly noted. Thank you. Uh, I spoke to Dr. Hammond myself, and Dr. Hammond told me that her concerns regarded uh, mom's cognitive ability, 
She felt that um, she had on numerous occasions attempted to explain how to uh, make a bottle using formula and uh, it seemed after numerous times mom still did not seem to grasp that that concept. Uh, she had major concerns for uh, Jackie's ability just to provide basic care um, for the baby. Um, she had concerns that uh, Jackie did not attend either either one of the specialists that she was referred to and that a newborn requires uh, a lot of medical care, especially this this child was uh, didn't receive prenatal care. We don't know what medical conditions may come up soon. Uh, she was concerned about the parent's ability to make and keep appointments and care for the, for the child. Uh, she was also concerned um, about the safety issues um, with the father in the hospital. At some point in time, um, Ms. Lomas became ready for discharge, correct? Is that correct? Yes. Was the baby also ready for discharge at that same time? Um, the baby medically was ready for discharge. However, um, Dr. Hammond did not discharge the baby due to um, continued social concerns, which revolved around the fact that um, she did not feel that Jackie had yet grasped the concept and um, understanding of feeding and diaper changing and basic skills. Did you observe or did medical staff um, express concern about Ms. Lomas's um, ability or willingness to bond with the child? Yes, um, more than one hospital staff indicated that they felt there was minimal um, attempt to bond. She would hold the baby, but you would need to give the baby to her to hold. Um, that she didn't want to pick up the baby, that when the baby cried, she often wanted to hand the baby to someone else because uh, she became very anxious and um, panicked when the baby cried. Uh, there was also very little uh, skin to skin when he was first born. Um, she did not participate for very long in that. In any of your investigation, um... Did you discover any adult guardianships over either of the parents? No, there are no adult guardianships that I know of, but I do know that um, Ms. Lomas has a payee. A payee for what? Um, she has indicated that she receives Social Security income, uh, and she has a payee for that income. And did she in indicate why she receives Social Security income? Um, she herself did not. Dakota interjected and said that she received Social Security um, due to the fact that her father had died. And her mom also told me that she received Social Security because her father died. Are you familiar with Social Security income payments? A little. To the best of your knowledge, does an individual over the age of 19 receive Social Security payments for a deceased parent? To the best of my knowledge, no, not without them having some form of disability acknowledged by Social Security itself. Um, is it standard for a recipient of Social Security income to have a payee without having an underlying disability themselves? No, it's not standard. Sure, I'm going to object. I'd like to void here because she says she's somewhat familiar, yet she's going into quite some detail. I would like to know what her familiarity is because she's already testified she's only somewhat familiar you are more than welcome to cross-examine uh, mr mcfarland and i will be happy to let you do that after the conclusion of the direct damage thank you uh, Ms. harvey one of the notes and or one of the allegations is that uh, the department provided reasonable efforts by searching for relatives um, can you just provide a little more information on that point Yes, I asked um, and discussed with both parents, um, relatives, um, who their supportive people were, et cetera. Um, Jackie indicated her mom, who is here visiting from Washington State. Um, I had heard also someone say her sister, so I asked her about her sister. She named a sister named Erica. Um, she said she doesn't really talk to her that much, but she had six children and she had helped her raise them in the past. Um, 
Dakota indicated to me that he, he gave me his mother's name. Um, he indicated that he had been in and out of foster care um, growing up. Um, he also has a sister named Brandy. He believes she lives in Utah, but he's not really sure. It appears that all of their other supports live in the state of Washington. You indicated that um, Ms. Lomas's mother is present today? Yes. Is there concern or is, uh, would there be a sufficient safety plan if she were to stay at the home with the family and the child? I do not believe that it would be enough of a safety barrier. Um, when I had discussions with um, Mrs. Lomas or Ms. Lomas, um, she, when I brought up my concerns, she minimized my concerns. She had multiple excuses for certain behaviors. Um, there were moments where things were very contradicting. Um, for example, Dakota's aggression. She would report that right now he's doing well and she hopes that he continues on this path. But yes, indicated he does yell. Yes, he does scream. Yes, in the past few days, he has had to leave the hospital because he is very aggressive. Um, so those there was a lot of those contradictions. Um, when asked about uh, cognitive function of um, Jackie, uh, she reported that there were no cognitive issues for Jackie. Um, and it, it seems, based on medical personnel's opinion, um, that there may actually be more than uh, we are being told. Based on the information that you gathered in your investigation, do you believe that there is a substantial risk of harm to the child's life, physical health, or mental well-being? Yes. And generally speaking, I know that you've testified a lot to this. How would you summarize that risk? Um, I believe that there's a risk for neglect of basic care. Um, and I believe that there is a risk also of um, domestic violence in the home, even if it is just verbal. Um, and I believe that there could also be a major safety concern um, since Dakota has indicated he does have suicidal and homicidal ideations and they're not being treated. Thank you. And um, the child is currently in a licensed foster home. Is that yes, correct? Yes, that's correct. Yes. Okay. And are there any safety concerns within that foster home? No, not to my knowledge. Does the foster, do the foster parents have um, a basic understanding of infant care to the best of your yes. knowledge? Yes. Okay. I have no further questions, Your Honor. Cross examination, Mr. McFarland? I do. This foster care home, are they a potential adaptive placement? Um, I believe so. I think that that's one of the first questions um, that they talked about permanence with the licensed foster care home. I believe that. I can't completely speak to it. You don't know that personally? Correct. Not that I've seen. So we don't. Someone may know. I myself do not know. Oh. I know you received HIPAA training, which is what medical records you can connect to cure, correct? Yes. My understanding is you can't just ask doctors questions without getting some type of authorization, correct? Or an order. Or a form, I should say, a form by the state, correct? Yes, Miss Lomas signed a 1555. Mother signed this? Yes. Now, your petition indicates you have some problem with her cognitive abilities, correct? Mm -hmm. Is that yes? Yes, medical personnel have, have concerns regarding her cognitive abilities. So how can you have her sign a form authorizing if you have concerns regarding her ability to make decisions. She has no other legal guardian, therefore she is her own legal consent. So you don't think her cognitive abilities impair her enough that she does not understand at least what a release is, correct? She understood what I was, what I was getting. Um, she does not have a guardian. I have no other um, way to legally stop her from making her own decisions. The doctors expressed to you that you, they had concerns with her cognitive abilities, correct? Correct. Your Honor, I'm going to ask that any testimony concerning mother's 
uh, met any discussions with medical staff regarding mother's medical conditions be stricken as there's been testimony from this worker that the medical field believes that mother lacks capacity and yet she signed a release. I, I don't think we can pick and choose capacity. Uh, I think there's a, uh, if the claim is she lacks capacity, then I, I don't think she has capacity to sign a release. So that's my objection to the testimony regarding any medical experts hearsay, and that I think it would actually need uh, capacity to sign a release. Would you like to respond for the record, Ms. Thomas? Thank you, Your Honor. Um, Ms. Harvey is, um, has testified correctly that uh, until or unless there's a judicial determination that this individual um, does lack the capacity, we have to honor and respect any releases that she signs or any information that she provides because she can make her own decisions to the best of our knowledge. Um, if Mr. McFarland would like to adjourn this hearing and get his client um, or client or mother or whoever uh, screened for that cognitive impairment and we can go through an adult guardianship process we are happy to oblige with that leave that to mr brooks to make that call as, as that's his client okay. it does involve my client's child also is why i'm raising these objections um so i'm going to overrule the objection uh, because she doesn't have a guardian that we're aware of and uh Ms. Harvey as well within her bounds as she described to ask her to sign that release if she so chooses. And the other reason we're here and your clients have a right to a trial is because there is a presumption that they are able to fit, to be fit parents unless uh, they, that can be proven otherwise. So this is a preliminary hearing to determine whether or not they are fit. And the investigation into that and those records are a necessary part of that. I will not be ruling on mom's capacity or lack thereof. I am frankly, not really concerned about that. I'm concerned about whether or not she can provide a safe environment for this child. Secondarily, um, I do also, by the same uh, token, uh, I'm not responsible for a guardian, even if one of your clients may need one. Frankly, I'm here just to determine whether or not this child can be safely returned to the parents or if other provisions need to be made. So that's what I'm prepared to listen to. And so that's why your objections overruled. And I'm certainly not going to allow Ms. Thomas to engage in looking into guardianships for the parents either. Thank you. Uh, you did have a conversation with mothers, with the maternal grandmother who's here in court, correct? Yes. Did you ask her about Native American heritage, the equal issues? No, I don't. I did not ask her about Native American heritage. Any reason why not? If your belief is that to qualify to have a pay either maybe some type of mental issues, is there any reason or fit any disability issues? Is there any reason why you haven't asked maternal grandmother? To be honest, it was just policy to ask parents. Um, I did it. She she seems very uh, knowledgeable of her answer. She explained to me her ethnicity um, and her Hispanic heritage in that conversation. Okay. You indicate that maternal grandmother was using excuses to my client was your testimony, correct? There were excuses for some behaviors, yes. Would those excuses also be categorized as explanations as far as you my could client. say that they were they were her opinions of explanations, yes. Are you the person we would ask regarding? Supervised visits, unsupervised visits. Are you the person who would have an opinion, or is there somebody else who'd have an opinion on parenting time for my clients and my client in the intro? I believe that myself and a foster care worker would both have opinions on that. Is it true that you're asking for supervised parenting time? Yes, we would. Okay. With a newborn, at least three times a week, two hours a visit, is that what you're trusting? I would, I myself would request whatever the current standard is for visitation, and I do not know what that is at this time. Uh, any opinion as to mothers, the maternal grandmother as being a suitable supervisor? Um, due to some of the concerns, we would actually uh, like a supervisor to be due to bonding and things like that. Perhaps someone uh, more therapeutic, uh, maybe Brene Moore, would be a suitable supervisor. In this, in this instance. 
my client tells me that somebody was over there just the other day from the agency and inspected the home and it does not appear to be disheveled or disorganized or filthy. That is correct. Grandma indicated that she cleaned the house. Mm -hmm. Did you view the house? Yes, I did. So the house right now. Is right now, yes. Yes, it is. So that's not a detriment to return the child to the house as far as cleanliness, not right? Today. Correct. Not today. Okay. It appears to be appropriate for return of the child, at least safety-wise and cleanliness-wise. Would that be an accurate statement? The home itself has today. Transportation. Do the parties have parents have issues with transportation? Yes, I believe they do. And what would the agency be able to do to assist them with transportation for parent? That would be a foster care question. I don't exactly know what all of the standards are right now. Is there a worker here today to testify to that? Yes, there is foster care worker here today. Okay. Mr. Brooks? How old is this child? Three days. Four days? Yeah. Four days, Four days old. All right. And where is the foster care home where the child is at? Um, I believe it's in Blissfield. You indicated my clients have transportation issues. Where do they live? They live in Adrian. And what are their transportation issues? I believe that they do not have transportation. I don't know specific reasons why. Did you ask? Or has anyone checked to see if they have driver's licenses? Um, I know that um, Dakota does not have a driver's license. The identification that I saw was just an identification card. Um, and I'm not exactly sure. I know they don't have a vehicle. I'm not exactly sure it's the driving license status of Miss Lomas. All right. Now, you have indicated in your testimony several references to cognitive disabilities with regard to my client. Is that right? Cognitive impairment were what was what the medical staff were saying. To Thank me. you. Can, are you capable of giving in layman's terms some idea of what those term that term means? Um, it would be the uh, ability to function, reason, make good decisions, perform um, activities, our day-to-day -day brain function of how we go through life. Oh. Would you consider that to be the uh, same type of issues as emotional issues as opposed to what you described? I think that they can be very separate issues. Did you say separate? Yes, they can. They, you can have one without the other. When you... This, you have discussed these issues with my client, have you not? I did ask her. Um, actually, my, the on-call worker actually asked her and had the conversation with her about it, not myself. So you weren't there? I, I was not. I was told um, and read in my sack was the contact from Would that conversation. Fair, fair to say that you have not discussed the concept of cognitive impairments with this woman? Um, I didn't per se exactly asked for cognitive impairments. Um, I asked her if there were uh, any reasons why um, she had social security, um, trying to ask if there were a disability um, in which she didn't, to be honest, she didn't answer um, two of my questions. And then the other, she indicated her social security was not disability. And it was because her father died. Do you think it would be advisable if you or someone in your position to or, or to explain in as plain English as possible what the concern is with I, cognitive impairments? I believe a medical staff would have to explain um, because it is not my, my expertise. However, we, it is something that we would like to have assessments done for um, to really just get to the bottom of the question. Well, you it appears you believe the issue is threatening enough that you have the authority to remove this child from these two, isn't that right? Medical staff indicate that it is a major concern. We need we then listen to medical staff and their concerns because that is their area of expertise. 
has there been any parenting time plan created at this point in time or have they simply not seen their child? Um, it has only been since, um, I believe, around eight o'clock last night. Um, it is the plan that when court is finished today to call with the plan. So what is the current parenting time plan? There, there currently is not one. We will be discussing that after the hearing. After this hearing? When after this hearing? I believe immediately after the foster care worker is here. All right, well, it's 4, 425. Are you saying by, say, 5 o'clock there will be a visitation plan, or are you there, there, not saying that? Based on the court's rulings, we will have the discussions after our hearing. Have you discussed with my client's mother, the lady who apparently is the lady sitting behind me, uh, whether she is a suitable candidate to take care of this job. We did um, discuss whether or not she would be interested in guardianship, um, which she in, she indicated that she would. However, there would be concerns because she does not seem to um, share the same concerns uh, that we do regarding um, the parent's ability. Um, in some instances, uh, she agrees, but then in other instances, there are major questions as to um, whether the parents would uh, be, a, be unsupervised with the child, et cetera. To your knowledge, does this child have any special needs? Not that I know of. I have no further questions. Ms. Underwood? Uh, Ms. Harvey, have you been able to observe whether the parents have purchased any baby items such as a crib or bassinet or car seat for the child? I do know that they worked with Care Pregnancy Center. Um, there is a bassinet in their home. There is, uh, there are a few outfits. There were, two, I saw two boxes of diapers and two containers of baby wipes um, and some bottles. I believe that they also had WIC um, for formula. Okay. And uh, Miss Lomas is the mother you indicated is in town, but she resides in Washington. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Is there any knowledge as to how long she will be remaining in the state of Michigan? No, I do not know. Um, I asked um, because there were indications that they would all be going back to Washington State. Um, I received different answers, sometimes um, three to six months. Uh, sometimes as soon as the baby is able to travel, um, there really wasn't an, indi an indication on that. Um, I don't believe that there is a set date that she is going back to Washington State. I don't have any further questions. Thank you. Can you redirect, Ms. Uh, Thomas? No, Your Honor. Thank you. Any recross, gentlemen? No. No. Thank you for your testimony. Your next witness, Ms. Thomas? I have no other witnesses, Your Honor. Mr. McFarland? I would like to call the maternal grandmother. Patty, uh, ma'am. Ma'am. Patty Lomas. Lomas, come on up to our witness. Please, please do here. Sorry. Please do here. You swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Step here. Be careful. Get up there. All right, is your full name Patty? Or is it Patricia? Patty. All right, could you scoot up to our microphone? That's that old black thing right there. Could you spell your first and last name, please? P A D D Y L O M A S. Thank you. Ma'am, could you speak up just a little bit louder? There's a vent right over my head. Yes. Thank you. Uh, is it true that you are currently residing with both mom and dad? Yes, yes it is. Your Honor, it's not gonna work. She's gonna have to speak louder. Pretend like I'm on the back door <coughs> to the good show. Okay. Are you living with mom and dad right now? Yes, I am. Okay. If, uh, do you have any plans to return to Washington immediately? No. Uh, do you want to be considered for placement of the child? Oh, my doctor, yes. If the court determines that 
parents cannot live with you, would you find some place in Adrian to live by yourself? I would. Okay. Next question would be if the court instructs that the parents cannot visit uh, with you, that it has to be in another supervised setting, would you abide by that? Would you follow the court order? I don't know. Do you have any criminal history? Have you ever been uh, convicted of any crimes? No. Have you ever been investigated by Child Protective Services? No. Have you ever been investigated by Adult Protective Services? No. And would you be able to live here as long as necessary? Let's say if this case was open for 14 months, would you be able to stay here for that period of time? I will. <clears throat> I will. How long do you think it would take you uh, to actually find a place of your own? I don't know the area and I don't know how uh, avail the avail availability of places, but I would, do, I would start doing that right now, right away. Okay. Let me ask you, do you have any Indian blood in your family line, either your family, your father or your mother's? Uh, on my mother's side, yes. Okay, and what Native American tribe might that be? Um, I don't know. I just know we have some Native American. Is there anybody alive who would know what Native American heritage that is? My mother passed away. Okay, know. well, thank you for letting us know. I no further questions. Thank you. Mr. Brooks. Ma'am, do you consider the state of Washington your home? Uh, yes. Right How long have you lived there? Since 2006. 2006. Uh, were you born and raised there? No. Where were you born and raised? I was born in Mexico. All right. Uh, and you've lived in Washington since 2006? Correct. And before that, where did you live? I lived in the state of California, the state of Arizona, Nevada. I lived in Michigan, that's where Jackie was born, 1998, 2004, I believe. So in 2006, you lived in a number of different states. And in 2006, I lived in Washington. Thank you. Are you married or single? I'm a widow. My husband passed away. You're a widow? Yes. Do you have any other children who live with you? Do you have any, uh, and I don't want to get too personal, but do you have anyone else who lives with you? Anyone? Anyone else who lives with you? My granddaughter lived with me, and she, I think she moved out of the house uh, last week. She's 20. <laughs> Permanently? Yes. Do you work? I don't. You've heard all of the testimony about the allegations of cognitive impairment that have been thrown around here, have you not? Yes, I heard, I heard. Are you aware of what that means? Yes. Tell me. Well, that they believe that Jackie is not capable of taking care of her child, which I can agree with that because she has been babysitting before. And she has done a good job. She cares, she's a very caring person, and she's very, very responsible in that respect. I understand she's got uh, some medication that she's taken, and I think she's, uh, that is, uh, has some side effects as of uh, maybe sleepy or drowsy or something to that effect, I'm not sure, but. That's what I'm thinking that's happening, except, and, and another thing is that they don't have much social life. So when you're isolated, you tend to be more quiet, you know. How but far did your daughter go in school? She, she graduated from high school. She, did she graduate? Yes, she did. Has she had any schooling beyond high school? Yes, she has been going to school, college. How far did she get that? 
um, she was just taking general classes, uh, no, nothing yet. Uh, and how long was she engaged in that? How long did she go to school after? After high school, right. Um, I think in like a couple of semesters. To your knowledge, did she pass, pass her classes in college? Most of them. Most of them. There you go. Let me ask you one last simple question. How many kids have you got? Three. I guess I have two questions. Are you capable, in your opinion, of taking care of this infant child? Very, very capable. I have nothing further. Ms. Underwood? Uh, good afternoon. Can you hear me OK? Yes. OK. Uh Prior testimony indicated that you were the payee for Jackie's Social Security. Is that correct? Yes, I am. How much does she receive on a monthly basis? Around fourteen hundred. And what is the reason for that uh, Social Security? Well, she started, started getting Social Security since she was born. Uh, based on my husband being older and retired, and uh, when he passed away, he got we got she. He passed away when she was four years old, actually. So we get, we started getting uh, survivors benefits since then, her and I. Okay, so those are those benefits named for Jackie or are they named for you? Well, some are for her and some are for me. So and we both get. Do you provide her with those benefits so she can use them for living expenses? Yes, I do. And how long do you in intend to be in Michigan for? Well, as long as it takes for everything to be clear and good for my daughter to have her baby back. And then do you intend on returning to Washington? Well, I don't, beyond that, I don't see a, a reason to be here for them either to be here because they have no family, no nobody around. So their family is in, in the West Coast, in Washington, in California. Are you in, concerned with the father of the child's uh, behaviors? Am I concerned? Yes. Well, um, I what I have seen is that since I've been here, he was taking care of Jackie when she was having a lot of uh, getting up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom. And she, but because she was in the last phase, she was going to the bathroom a lot. Yes, yeah, she, she was nervous. She was concerned because she had never been pregnant before. And you were you, with your first pregnancy, it's always worrisome. I mean, I, I remember. Ma'am, I was when asking I, you about uh, the father's behavior, not the mother's concerns. Oh. Can you? Can you limit your testimony? I, I asked if you're concerned with the behaviors of the father. Well, so far not. I mean, he sometimes he raises his voice because he, I think he gets excited and he wants to be heard. But I have heard other people um, doing the same thing, you know, like they get, they want to be heard. So they raise their voice, but, well, I, I don't think so in the overall. What was the condition of the home before you cleaned it? It wasn't picked up that good, but because I, I gathered that Jackie has been not feeling well and Dakota was taking care of her a lot. So I came for that reason to help, to make sure, you know, they got some, not just uh, help in the house, but with, uh, you know, um, Jackie needed somebody, uh, you know, mother, sister, somebody more close than, you know, somebody that had been pregnant before, somebody to, uh, she had a lot of questions. So she, she would be asking me a lot of questions and I would be there to help her. 
and that's where it oh ma'am i'm going to ask the question again what was the condition of the home before you cleaned it well it wasn't well cleaned i quite like what i was saying it is that you know was there trash lying around the home there was uh, things around the house uh, like um you know, a couple of bags of uh, garbage that needed to be thrown away, you know, thrown away and a couple of boxes, you know, here and there, but um, that was picked up right away. I mean, how long did it take you to clean the home? <laughs> how long? Yes. Well, between Dakota and I, Jackie didn't help because she couldn't do it, but uh, we just cleaned here and there, you know, due to the kitchen, I looked dishes and just did whatever had to be done to, to be in perfect condition. I have no further questions. Thank you. Ms. Thomas. Thank you, Honor. Uh, Ms. Lomas, uh, you indicated that you are the payee for your daughter's social security income. Can you explain why you are a payee or why she needs one? Well, uh, <laughs> because we got it that way since she was since the first day she got it. She was a minor, she was a baby, a child when her father passed away. So it has been under she gets her check under my name ever since then. And I I thought that um since getting together with you know um, others, she wouldn't be able to focus on, you know, paying her things, her own things, instead of um, I don't know, it just stayed like that at the point. Okay, and did um, she have any special education services when she was a youth, like an IEP? Uh, she did, but I, I'm going to tell you why. When she was in, um, when her father passed away, she was four, and we were barely moving from Michigan. And um, so we were left, we sold the house in Michigan, and we went to Arizona. And then my husband went to get to Mayo Clinic to, to Minnesota to get, because he had cancer. And I was, um, Ma'am, I, I don't think we need a full explanation here. I just was wondering if she did receive any educational services when she was in school and you answered affirmatively, correct? Yeah. Okay, so she didn't go to school. I didn't want to let her go anywhere. She was, because we're mourning her dad's death. Okay. So she didn't go to school then for, until she was six and a half. And that's when, when we went to Washington and we saw this church and it was a Catholic school and, I, and I, it was a nice place. And I said, we're gonna move here. She's gonna to go to this school. And that's when she started going to school. So they put her in kindergarten instead of first grade because she had never been to school. Even though she knew, you know, how to count and the basic things, you know, a few, few things here and there, but so they put her in kindergarten. So we're kind of, kind of behind. Now, okay. She had I Miss Lomas, I'm I'm sorry to cut you off, but we are um the court is closed, and so I just wanted to confirm about the IEP. Um oh. and with that, it, I have no further questions, Your Honor. Thank you. All right. Um counselors, I would be inclined to adjourn today's preliminary hearing and uh, take it back up on Friday, August 30th, to allow the department to thoroughly investigate the home, uh, to investigate the placement request by this relative who clearly has placement priority, assuming she passes a background check and has an appropriate environment for her grandchild. Uh, Your thoughts? My client's agreeable to that, Your Honor. Was that this Friday or did you say the 30th? The 30th. Yeah, that's fine. In the meantime, the child would stay um, in the placement, but the department has the authority 
um, and has placement. So in the event that um, this relative is able to show us that she's an appropriate caregiver and has a safe environment, I frankly, I would expect the department to be utilizing that and moving the child even before we came back. So with that, Ms. Thomas, I look for any arguments or objections on that point. No, Your Honor, we would be agreeable to that. Um, I believe that when the petition was filed, it was um, Ms. Harvey's understanding that uh, Ms. Lomas would be returning to Washington. As she testified, there was no clear indication of her intent to stay. Um, so that was not explored. Um, and obviously the living environment would also need to be explored as well. So I have no objections to that and um, can join at any time on the 30th. Ms. Underwood, I look forward to your thoughts on this as well as your opinion on what would serve the best interest of this child at this point. Uh, Your Honor, I believe that based on the testimony given so far today that the child remaining in foster care uh, at this point is in his best interest until we can further um, navigate placement with maternal grandmother. Uh, I do have some concerns. Um, however, I trust that the department will fully investigate those and ensure that uh, if the child were to be placed with maternal grandmother, that it would be in a safe environment. Um, but at this time, if there is going to be any sort of parenting time, I would ask that it be supervised by a professional uh, at this time. Ms. McFarland? Well, I, I said I had no uh, disagreement with an adjournment. Is there another issue? Supervised parenting time until we come back or DHS otherwise verifies that it's safe to have one or more of these parents with this child unsupervised, given the allegations in the petition at this I, time. I've discussed that and as opposed to no parenting time, we agree with that. We'd also like to have maternal grandmother have parenting time. Right? Mr. Brooks. Well, one of the questions I asked earlier was, once the hearing is done, can we have a schedule by five o'clock? And the uh, witness said, yeah, we can probably get that done. And so I guess what I'm saying is I don't want to be back here on Friday and nobody's put their heads together and given us anything which has happened so frequently in these well, cases. It'll be next Friday and um, the department's going home with a, horn, a list of homework, including uh, to investigate um, Ms. Patty Lomas as far as uh, her request for placement. She's a relative, she has priority investigate where she's at and if and give her the opportunity to find a different safe place if she so chooses to in order to secure placement uh, to develop a parenting schedule that would allow for both parents to have some supervised parenting time and allow this grandmother to see her child or grandchild as well uh, to begin the investigation into the potential native american heritage am i missing anything miss thomas no, Your Honor. I am anticipating some sort of parenting time between now, hopefully, and Friday, and certainly by a week from Friday. Uh, I would expect that as well. I know there are transportation issues with the family, but it sounds like the child is relatively local, uh, and there are some resources and a family member here. So I would also expect. That. Thank you. What time was that on the 30th you're proposing? Uh, 10 30. Client's fine by that. 10 30 a.m. on September, I'm sorry, August 30th. One question in addition, Your Honor. I anticipate that there's probably medical appointments for this child uh, in the interim where clients be able to participate by Zoom or at least uh, getting information as a result of these appointments. I don't see why they wouldn't be allowed the information as far as the appointments go or anything else. I'll leave that to the department to organize that. And it's somewhat, somewhat going to depend also on uh, how cooperative the parents are with the department at this point. There are some concerning things in this petition, which is why I authorize removal. Uh, so as long as the parents are being respectful, and I understand it's a difficult situation, but as long as you're uh, being respectful to the department, I expect the department to be respectful back and you all be able to work together. Um, in the best interest of this job. All right, then we're going to uh, recess for the day. Uh, the removal order will remain in place given the allegations in the petition. Uh, you've heard me on the rest of it, and we'll see you back here Friday the 30th at 10 30 in the morning. That's all for today. Your Honor, is it possible to appear via Zoom for that hearing? I do have a scheduled vacation that day. Yes. I'll be out of town. Okay.
We appreciate uh, you taking the time to appear. So do you have that written down? <laughs> Four one two one. Okay, so we're back on the record in this file. Um, there was a removal last week, and we have the beginning of the preliminary hearing. We've adjourned to today to allow further investigation because we learned that um, the grandmother was here locally, and I asked the department to do some more investigation into the household and uh, to to look at that relative placement. So I'm looking forward to the updates. I did have a brief um, sidebar with the attorneys in which essentially, in my opinion, seemed like it was a bit of a preview uh, for the information that's gonna be presented today uh, in the efforts made to answer the question uh, that the court's already uh, posed to the department. But if there's any additional comments, we'll look forward to those from the attorneys after appearances. Uh, good morning, Your Honor. Nicole Underwood, guardian ad litem for the minor child. Ms. Saja Thomas, counsel for the department. Ms. Harvey. Sarah Harvey, DHHS. Michael Brooks, I represent the mother, Jacqueline Lomas. Your name for the record, ma'am? Jackie Lomas. Michael McFarland, representing father. Please introduce yourself. I'm Dakota Herman Duckworth, but I'm the father. Thank you. Right, Mr. John, do you need anybody to spell? No, I've got them. Good. Okay, thank you so much. All right, comments about the sidebar, beginning with Ms. Thomas. I have no additional comments, Jenner. Thank you. Ms. Okay, thank you. Ms. Underwood? No, Your Honor, thank you. Gentlemen? No, I would say the court's comments are accurate. Thank you. All right, so Ms. Thomas, let's get to it then uh, in answering the questions about uh, placement in the home of the parents, please. Thank you, Your Honor. I'll ask if that Ms. Harvey be sworn in. Ms. Harvey, come on up for our witness stand. You swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so I'll be Yes. Okay, Ms. Thomas, proceed at will. Thank you. Um, Ms. Harvey, at the last hearing, the court had asked the department to explore whether the maternal grandmother was an appropriate placement option for the child. At this time, what efforts have been made to uh, make that determination? Uh, Jill Hyland is the worker who has been working with the family on that topic. Um, I do know that she has been to the home. She has started the home assessment. She's met with grandma. Um, they do need to meet again, um, I believe it's next Thursday, um, to continue on that topic. Um, she, because grandma's residence is in Washington, it is going to take some time for um, the background checks and the things like that to come back because there is a, a, it's not as easy as if um, we were talking about someone residing in Michigan. Uh, but all of the, that is underway um, and actively being pursued. At this time, the maternal grandmother still is staying with the parents. Is that the is that accurate to the best of your knowledge? Yes, um, she has not secured any housing outside of the <coughs> parents' home. And would it, there's a policy, I believe, that allows a child to be placed with a relative and the relative essentially to live with the parents. Um, it, would that be an appropriate situation for this family? Um, I do not believe it would be appropriate. Um, there are some safety concerns um, surrounding some statements um, that Mr. Harmon Duckworth has said. Um, in regards to the safety of his son um, and his mental health. Um, in order for the court to make those decisions, the court's record needs to reflect the facts that it's considering. And what, from your investigation or that you've learned through Jill's um, documentation and the department system, gives rise to such alarm? Like, what does it mean that there's safety concerns regarding his statements? Okay. Um, Mr. Harmon Duckworth has made statements, uh, statements that I have myself witnessed and statements that were sent to, um, to Ms. Heilman. Um, specifically to Ms. Heilman this week, um, it, it, all of it stems around the topic of marijuana use. Um, he reports that he needs to uh, be high in order to be for the people around him to be safe and for his son to be safe was the statement that was made this week. Um, previous to that, uh, he has reported that he uses marijuana to uh, calm himself so that the people around him can be safe. Um, it, we 
also speak to him about the fact that if he, if he is the primary parenting person, he cannot be under the influence. Um, if there's obviously going to be a time where someone else may not be the primary caregiver at that moment, um, he cannot be under the influence and be a caregiver in those moments. Um, and he has openly said that people around him are not safe when he is not under the influence. Have you heard or witnessed any concerns regarding, um, in the petition, I believe that there were homicide or suicide ideations that were concerns. Does that remain a concern for the department at this time? Yes, we've seen no remedy to that. Have there been any instances in which he has um, appeared to have ho homicide ideations? Um. There was one small concerning incident. I say small because it was short in, in time frame um, with Ms. Heilman in the home uh, where she felt unsafe as Mr. Duckworth was um, coming close to her carrying a knife. Um, and she said, uh, can I help you with something? Because he was coming closer into her personal space. He said, I'm carrying this knife in a safe way. Uh, if I wanted to hurt you, I would carry my, my knife like this. And then he did a slashing motion and held the knife up. Um, that made uh, the worker feel very unsafe at the moment. Um, it also just goes to the topic of safety concerns inside the homeless parents. Were there any concerns about his use of uh, kitchen knives in general or uh, weapons? Um, outside of that incident, um, he, he did just state that um, in the past he's had a, he has carried with him a broken knife so that he couldn't use the knife on someone if he felt like he wanted to harm them. He also had a plastic knife so that he could use the plastic knife and he wouldn't harm someone with the knife um, if he had those two objects. Um, there are concerns though that if he, he reports, if he is not using to a substantial amount, then there are safety concerns. There are obviously going to be knives in a home where steak knives, you use things to cut things. Um, there are going to be knives in a home. Uh, it's unsure the safety of anyone in those moments. Has a mother posed any safety threats to anyone at the department or herself or potentially the child? No, there have been no firm safety concerns regarding mom, just parenting concerns. Okay. And does it seem that the mother or the grandmother are able to mitigate any of those safety concerns posed by the father? Um, it is my understanding from my own experiences and from other workers' experiences um, that there's reason to believe that both Jackie and her mom um, can become fearful of Dakota in those moments. Um, they both seem to kind of back away. I don't think that either one of them have the ability to stand firmly and stop him from actions. Okay, um, I'm sorry, uh, but we're gonna have to ask you to refrain from talking while the witness is talking. If we need to take a break, that's fine. Just let me know, Mr. McFarland. Yes, sir. I'm sorry, could you repeat what you were saying? Um, we're concerned with um, both Jackie and Patty's ability to stand up to Dakota in those moments. Um, as even workers um, have concerns about standing up to them in those moments and we're trained to do so. Um, so we feel that uh, it would be a higher safety concern to have them in charge, so to speak, or um, directing him does not take redirection very well. Um, it, it would be more of a trigger. You noted that um, while mom may not pose safety concerns to uh, the department personnel or anything like that, there are some parenting concerns. Have you been able to observe any parenting time between the parents and child? Yes, there have been so far two parenting times. And then there's also one scheduled for um, today after our court hearing. I um, witnessed one parenting time. Um, the foster care worker witnessed the other during um, the parenting time that I witnessed, Jackie was caring and towards her son. She would rock him in the corner, um, sing, sing to him. Um, but there is no base knowledge um, of 
changing baby's clothes, changing diapers. She, um, Dakota really takes over those tasks for her. Um, she does make statements. Um, an example is uh, when the baby was wet, she said the blue line on the diaper means that it's wet. So she, she understands pieces, but to actually put those pieces all together to parent um, is still a major concern at this time. And are there any safety concerns for the child even during parenting or because it's supervised? So is supervision sufficient to safeguard this child from the lack of parenting abilities these parents are demonstrating? Um, with Jackie, yes. Um, we do have concerns, obviously, for um, Dakota. Uh, primarily, he's indicated that he, he needs the marijuana to parent. Um, but we can't have him coming to parenting time under the influence. It's not appropriate. Um, but he, during the parenting time that I was at, he brought out his marijuana pen to show the supervisor. Um, this is what I use. This is what I do. Um, he went into great detail about uh, the use of gummies and how much he takes uh, throughout the day, what it does, uh, the use of alcohol to also uh, treat his mental health. Um, there, there are concerns that if we even started drug screening before, uh, the when redirected, again, he does not take redirection very well. He gets very angry and can get agitated. It's the safety and we don't know what's gonna happen when he's agitated. Has he been able to demonstrate an ability to appropriately care for the child without supervision there? Without supervision, no, we've, had, we've seen nothing without without supervision. Um, at one point, he was actually two points, he was um, changing the baby's diaper and stepped away while leaving the baby on a table. Um, he was redirected and told that that wasn't safe, um, that, that he needed to, to be with him the whole time. Uh, well, maybe 20 minutes later, um, he did it again. And when redirected, um, he said, I was just two feet away, he's fine. Um, that, those are major concerns that you were directed once even a few minutes later, you repeated the same process and leaving a baby on the table is a safety concern. At any point during his parenting time, were there other indications of his inability to care for the child, um, such as being unable to like self, um, self-regulate? Um, there was a great deal of emotional irregularity um, he did, he was able, um, one time he did become very agitated. He was asked if he'd like to take a walk. Um, and he, he declined to be able to take a walk. He did, um, sit. And after a few minutes, he, be, he became upset. He started to cry. Um, and then immediately we went kind of back into, um, hyper vocalization, uh, type of manic type behavior. So the emotions swing very quickly. During parenting time, is the content of conversations focused on the child or um, around creating a bond with the child? Um, with Jackie, it, it is much more focused on um, the child um, and learning, creating a bond, uh, things of that nature. Um, Dakota is very uh, sporadic in his conversations. Uh, they kind of go all over the place. We will be speaking about the baby and um, diaper changes or formula. And then a few minutes later, we're speaking about court and the hearing. And, and, and we come back around to the hospital and the things that happened at the hospital. It, it is very all over the place. Um, it's very difficult to follow. It, uh, during parenting time, if the child becomes dysregulated, what happens? Um, there were instances, in this specific parenting time that I was in, um, we were informed that the baby does not at this time uh, at placement take a binky, that it hasn't been needed, that he's been fairly calm. Um, Dakota wanted to use a binky. They hadn't been sanitized yet, so we were unable to use the um, binkies that he had brought. It's not that they were incorrect, anything like that. They just hadn't been sanitized yet. Um, and the, the baby was more agitated during that parenting time. 
he fussed quite a bit. Um, there were good moments where they were both singing to him, things like that. Um, but Dakota became fixated on the fact that he could not use the binky. Uh, and he wanted to feed him again, but it wasn't his feeding schedule. He did, had just eaten. Um, he stated that um, the, the baby would be using the binky to, to, to control his anger. What's a binky? A pacifier. Thank I'm you. sorry. Thank you. Yes, a pacifier. That he, the baby would be using that to control his own anger and so that he would not have temper tantrums. In your opinion, is um, Mr. Herman Duckworth appropriate with any of the service providers? So far, no. Um, is there anything else you'd like the court to know regarding potential placement with grandma um, while she's currently at the familial home? Um, while she's currently living um, with the parents, uh, we do continue to feel that it wouldn't be an appropriate placement at this time. However, we're still working through the process. We're still doing the 3130A. We're continuing um, the entire process. After the hearing last on the 21st, um, did you discover any information that might have been inconsistent with the grandmother's testimony? Um, yes, I was able to speak to Social Security. Um, we had really had that piece as to why um, Jackie received Social Security benefits. I was able to speak to them and discovered that uh, Jackie is actually considered um, an adult disabled child. And that is what she received social security benefits for. She has a diagnosis through social security of intellectual disability. Um, she's currently under review for that as well. Um, the time frame on that is up. Um, she, during the last review, which I believe was 2019, I believe is what I was told, um, Patty, Jackie's mom had provided information to the uh, SSI reviewer um, or, or evaluator. Uh, she had also provided uh, school documents showing the uh, special education or IEP that Jackie had at that time. Um, so she's not receiving benefits, death benefits from her father. She is actually receiving benefits under a disability for intellectual disability. Were you, did the Social Administration provide any of the information that grandma uh, Patty had provided during that 2019 review? Um, she stated that, Patty stated that um, Jackie is not good with money, doesn't understand the concept of different um, dollars and, and coins, things like that. Um, and she also provided the educational piece um, at that time. Uh, there was also an evaluation done at Jackie's IQ, all of this, um, Patty was participating in and was aware of. Um, and at that time, that is when she was granted the payee status. Does that information uh, cause the department to have concern about her, Patty, grandma, her ability to provide care for the infant? Yeah, it, it goes to that thought of, um, can we identify, um, understand, and report accurately? Um, if Patty didn't seem to understand why her daughter received Social Security, it's a concern then uh, for many other things moving forward. Um, does Patty understand how this process works? What the rules are specifically for this process? Can she accurately report concerns that she sees? Uh, we've seen the minimization of behaviors uh, by her in regards to um, the safety of other people around Dakota, Jackie's intellectual capabilities. Uh, we've seen those those things be misreported and it causes a concern. Thank you. Uh, with that, Your Honor, I have no further questions uh, from Ms. Harvey. Thank you.
Questions, Mr. McFarland? No, Your Honor. Mr. Brooks? No. Ms. Underwood? Uh, Ms. Harvey, at this time, what would be your recommendation with respect to parenting time for both parents? Um, I would really like to see visits um, be suspended until we can get a psychological evaluation. Uh, they're just ongoing safety concerns. We don't, we can't have a parent presenting um, under the influence for parenting time yet openly state that the only time people are safe is when he is under the influence. Um, there are just too many safety barriers, psychological factors that I feel need to be explored before we can continue with supervised parenting. Would Ms. Lomas be appropriate for supervised parenting time without Mr. Carmen Duckworth present? I think that that could be, um, I think that that would be a possibility. Thank you, I have no further questions. Uh, Ms. Harvey, was the option of asking Dakota to step out of the home explored? And um, if, if that's, um, well, I guess the other question that is folded into that question is, would this child be safe if placed with mother and grandmother without Dakota and all? Um, I would still have concerns as to whether they could um, actually one keep themselves safe from him if they had to redirect him and to keep the baby safe and not because they didn't want to but because they really truly are not capable of doing that um, it becomes a concern it just becomes a concern um, if he does enter the home are they able to when told no you can't pick him up right now he becomes agitated can they continue to stand up to him to have you know the capability of being firm with him that that is a major concern. Are there any instances that demonstrate to you that that would be or is um, already a consistent problem in the home? Um, yes, Mr. Duckworth, uh, Herman Duckworth, speaks for Jackie almost exclusively. Um, she does not often do things out of her own accord. Um, she does things after he tells her to. Um, there was one instance where there was a provider on the phone. Um, Jackie was attempting to speak to it, to whom it was that had called her. He took the phone and was yelling at the person. So you see the course of control um, in their relationship. Ms. Heilman also saw um, a bit of that in that she was having a great conversation with Patty alone. When um, Dakota came home, he was already agitated. Um, Grandma really shut down and really didn't want to answer specific questions. She felt very uncomfortable. Um, when he became agitated, it's, it's a bit of a, a slump, um, not the ability to stand up and say, no, you need to not do this. Um, she can be firm. However, I don't think she can be firm enough to keep safety, maintain safety. Do you know why Ms. Heilman wasn't able to complete her interview uh, with Patty? Um, yes. When we, the length of time, it was taking quite a, quite a bit of time. Um, the parents had been at parenting time. They came home early. Um, that Dakota coming home to that moment really did change the entire um, vibe of, of the situation. Um, Patty didn't really feel comfortable answering questions while he was there. Um, a lot of it just needed to be further explored. And so um, Jill set up a time separately again for just she and Patty to be alone. Um, so his, his presence really did hinder it, but it, it also is a long process. Um, there are quite a few things. And sometimes when you've already sat through it for two hours, we need to just continue to explore it on a different day. Do you know why Ms. Heilman's not able to be here today? She's actually off today. Okay. Um, has there been any information supplied about the family uh, from their residence of origin, if you will, like where Patty has come from? Yes. Um, I have requested records. They have confirmed that there are some records and they'll be sending them, that, but um, they take up to 10 business days. Uh, I was able myself just through a Google search to find that um, Patty's other daughter has had has a significant CPS history. So the family does have history. Um, there's a termination of three children um, and it does not appear that in that process, Patty was the placement for 
and he, there were six children originally removed. Three were um, given back to uh, their mother. Three were I'm put into adoption. How and Dickens am I supposed to parse this information that the witness got off a computer that I can't read? I can't see it. I don't know if it's true. I don't know if it's false. Uh, it, it's not hearsay, it's beyond hearsay. That's fair, Mr. Brooks. Um, and I think that we'll, I'm sure we'll, I know I'll be <coughs> asking follow-up questions at subsequent hearings as well, but I just want to really make sure that the department's done everything they can to, to find out what's happening with this family and to find out whether or not placement with grandmother could be an option. So I appreciate your objection. And I also look at the information, giving it the weight that um, it deserves, which uh, is obviously qualified by the source being Google. Uh, but I am also glad to hear, frankly, that the department is, is looking at what they can find out about the family, I suppose, in some respects. So you're welcome to cross-examine as well, obviously. I can also let you know what what led me, like where Google led me, um, because that is an important piece. Right. And actually, um, there was an appeal to the termination. So it was actually a court document that is in uh, a Juris website. So it is pretty accurate information. Would you be able to uh, provide a copy of that yeah. in the future? Sure, good. Thank you. All right. Uh, questions based on my questions, Ms. Thomas? No, Your Honor. Thank you. Mr. McFarland? Yes, I'm trying to understand the importance of a link of mother's sister <coughs> losing her parental rights. You haven't discovered anything in your documentation that says that maternal grandmother was an issue, correct? No, our, what, the, what the discovery led to was that she was not a placement option for those children. That, that's primarily why it was- but That has no significance us. because you have no idea why. It could be not correct. enough rooms, we're, we're, it yep, could be correct. distance. We're, yep, we're waiting for that information to come from Washington State, yes. Right. I, I did want to dig further into why, yes. Okay, now it appears as though you're concerned with father's parenting time being suspended as him being physically in the room with the child and inappropriate, correct? Correct. So another option would be for him to view the child on FaceTime by Zoom so the child can hear his voice, can still form a bond, and not be a risk of harm, physical harm to the child. That would be an alternative, wouldn't it? Yes, if the court felt that that was the alternative, that would, that would be fine. Nothing further. Mr. Brooks? Thank you. Ms. Underwood. No further questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your testimony. We return to your seat. All right. Uh, any other witnesses today, Ms. Thomas? No, Your Honor. Mr. McFarland? Oh, well, Your Honor, when you advised my client of his rights on the record, he also indicated he had the right to make a statement. He would like to make a statement at this time. Would you like him to go from here, Your Honor? I think it would be uh, best to have him come on and approach uh, our witness. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Raise your right hand, sir. Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth? So, off you got? Yes. There's a step here. Be careful. I have a whole lot to start this off. Start this off with the first. Hey, hang on. Hang on. We have to do this in a special order. Okay. okay. Uh, number one, you did have a copy of the petition and you remember the judge reading it to you, correct? Mm -hmm. Is that yes? Yes. Okay. And you also know that we have asked for a jury trial, correct? Mm -hmm. Is that yes? Yes. They're recording everything, so they need uh, to Okay, hear. so I need to say yes. Yes. I, exactly. Apologies. Okay, so a lot of what you might say is going to be for the trial, so we might not want to let everybody know ahead of time, but you have some important comments to make you think today, correct? Yep. And, and these are... Comments are going to be where you think the worker maybe misrepresented what she was saying. Correct? I would like to actually show off, if I can, what happens on my mental states. I can show it at any point in time and what happens when I get angry. 
Well, well why don't you tell us then? Because that's an so the original thing. The reason why I was originally diagnosed with homicidal and suicidal bipolar was because I, my dad has it. It is a genetic thing. Why do you think I was also trying to keep his fits down in case he does have any anger issues? I was pre-prepping even for my own mental health. Why I had been mentioning the pacifier to the people. I had also had a breakdown in front of the actual caseworker because of Patty. I have been attempting to get this car done for about two weeks now. Car? Car. The car that was actually court ordered by the thing have not truly had help. And every time that I do, I have to either fight with her to the point where I'm yelling and screaming throughout my house, which has been the last four days. You can even reference to my honey for that aspect. Just yesterday, I had to have a own talk about her, my own honey's medical expenses. Well, hang on. Hey, so when you were saying my honey, who are you referring honey to? Honey used my girlfriend over in the side that is Jackie Lomas. I always use the term as my honey Thank or you. mine. Okay. Patty has a problem with me stating my because I go around my house to stating mine because it's, it's how I understand what I can actually use. She doesn't understand that that is the case in point. I understand. Okay. So I have issues with that. And if you notice, this is what I was doing, <coughs> showing that I was caring. I was taking my time. I was even giving the aspects. The only thing that I couldn't stop is I have a pathological need to swear at sometimes. So the worse I get, the more I swear. I stated that to them. And the only word that I was using in the court was F. The F word. Okay. I don't appreciate know if I'm allowed to say that. Appreciate you not using yep, that. That's okay. reason. Or effing to repeat. Those were the only terminologies that I used in the actual visits. I have been repeatedly asked, but every time that I was also talking, it was also only about Patty. Let's get back to the issue of visits. Do you want to be? That was also the reason why I was so excited. To repeat, I had also stated I was going in there on mental weed. If they had noticed at the start of my visit, when I was not having any issues, I was actually, you know, being perfect, fine, cozy, doing everything that I needed. And why was that? It's because I had taken my marijuana. I was not feeling joint pain, which is what it was prescribed for. So you I have a prescription even, for marijuana? I was told by my doctor to self-medicate. That is why I've been doing it for the past five years. Would you be willing to sign a release so I Child can. Protective Services will contact your doctor and verify that? Would you okay? Yes, okay? I would be okay Great. with that. I actually had gotten, the only reason I'm even on SSI right now is because five years ago, I originally was trying to get my entire mental health checked because I wanted to make sure she was safe in my house. Jacqueline Lomas. Because I wasn't feeling comfortable with everybody micromanaging what I had to do. And even during those five years, I had Patty repeatedly come into my house and start cleaning my house without my say so. And at that point, it was, I had panic attacks at that point. So I had neglected my entire Patty day. being who? Patty Lomas that is sitting back in the court right now. Okay, that's your girlfriend's mother. mother. Okay, got it. Okay. Which I have been having these repeated same issues with her money and having to actually help her with her own money every single time. We had even attempted to change her own physical who, standing. Whose money are we talking about? Jacqueline's Lomas money for her own safety so that she could be her own payee. The only reason that I even became the payee is because Jackie felt more comfortable with me being the payee. You are a payee for? I am not a payee okay. anymore. She had taken the rights over. Patty Lomas, the mother, had taken the rights back okay. after not even a single week of me having it. Let me ask you on visitation. If the court determines that you can't personally be there with your child, would you like to be there by FaceTime or Zoom so you can see the child and talk to the child yes. so the child recognizes your voice? Yes. Also, the reason why I had stated to the court, can I show it, is because I only have to say a single word and I have a seizure right then and there. That is my safety mechanism. When I get too angry, it's not the action I'm going to cut someone. That is the thought that crosses my mind. But in doing so, my first action is to physically shut down my body so that I have the weed acts as a stimulant. 
I had even stated when I was using alcohol, the only time that I ever, and I stated this politely, ever used alcohol is when I cannot feel my legs to the point where moving. That is the only time it is to help numb, increase blood flow, and to also increase my oxygen intake. So I'm not hyperventilating, having anxiety or aggression. And normally it takes about one a day just to keep me tipsy. And that is just cozy and one, at tipsy. One what? One Smirnoff. You know the red, white, and blues? No. I'm not. Okay. Is that a bottle you're talking about? Yes. It's oh. a literal 16 ounce. Is that, is that, that, is that and vodka? And I would only have one of those if I was even. Yeah, I'm not. What is Smirnoff? Is that vodka? Okay. Smirnoff is normally a combination of a usual cocktail drink. It is usually involving a high fruit, fruity. It's like a seltzer. Yeah, it's like oh, a seltzer. Okay. So it's not straight. Vodka. It's not even straight vodka. Okay, I'm yeah. even taking minor doses for that. And I have even stated that to the everyone that I have. The doctor okay with that too? That is the only thing that I have not talked with. But I that to repeat, I was also told to self medicate Now you've heard at least it raised that maybe you might consider moving out of the house for the child to be with your girlfriend and her mother. Your thoughts? If I had to, the majority of my anger issues that have repeated for the tap last two weeks have only been regarding to Patty Lomas. The majority of it has been stating <coughs> that same thing repeatedly to the, so the The question is... Yes, I realize what the question is. I'm understanding the anger aspect, too. Okay, I think the court heard that. Yep. Of course, we're going to have our day in court. On yep, this is the reason why I wanted to double check everything. The first thing, the only thing that I can agree with was for on court record to actually agree with the majority of what this petition has stated, including my own mental health and the aspects that I have aspect, is that my house was not unlivable, quote unquote. Oh, hang, hang, hang on. We'll, we'll get to that when it, when it comes to the trial. Okay. Apologies. Oh, no, no problem. Have we covered those important decisions regarding parenting time? My issues right now is I would actually request as a court hearing to have Patty actually move out of my house. I need her out of my house so fast. Last night, it proved to me that I was not even... I had more anger issues because she was been here because a lot of my bills and stuff revolve around two checks, not just one. Some people I, might say that they're concerned for her physical health. With actually, the only reason that is the case is because she would not act. She continuously went even behind Jackie's back, called up a doctor on thing after we had been repeatedly asking her to only wait an hour when we had already called a doctor to get Jackie's prescriptions fixed. We had to go to the ER because Patty Lomas had panicked to the point of thinking she had cephalus, which did not have any case in point. So her, or syphilis, whatever you want to be equate. And then after that, we had gone to the doctor. Even the doctor was telling her she was fine in the hospital right over, didn't even give time for it, and had already pushed that aspect. I usually do the majority of my, honey, my girlfriend's pills or well, we're not on to those, those, those okay. things. We're just here about, I'd like to focus on the, the parenting time. Have we discussed everything that you want to? Yes, on for that? parenting time, yes. So if, if it is necessary for me to not be involved in those, as a case. Also, hold on, for parenting time, I had stated multiple times on the aspect of just light minor reminders for honey, because I know she forgets it. Times. She gets panicked and then has her issue, which is, she just overly nitpicks at certain aspects, just like I do. What triggers you? So I have three different things. One, if you are not, when I have already specifically asked you of a task, the only task that I have actually asked Patty to even come down here and has specifically stated to her not to come down here if she was sick, which when she had found out that the actual... Oh, know, we understand that. What's the second? You know, apologies, I... I had a whole bunch of things lined up, and this is just the first of the things. Very many. What's the second trigger? The second trigger, like I have stated, I if I actually stated, I actually will have it to you. I can't state it on record because I had an issue 
when I was younger with a past ex, why I have so many tendencies. <coughs> I've been lying for what's two the, years. What's the third then if you can't mention the second? So the third one, I honestly have issues with cleaning my house because my body does not work normally at certain times, which means that's why I'm taking the marijuana. Okay. Let me ask you this. If the court were to order you out of your house, I have no idea what the court's going to do. Okay? Yep. But if the court were to order you out, I would not have a place to stay. I would specifically ask for Patty to be moved out. But if the court ordered you out, would you be out? I would have to be out if that was the case. I just, I don't know what the court's going to do, so I'm just asking every scenario. Do you understand? Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay. And if you notice, this is without weed. This is why I'm showing this to the court. This is without any docile nature. So this is your worst case scenario. This is my saying. worst case scenario. This is why I came here specifically to show the court what was actually happening. Okay. Also, when that knife was even mentioned, I had the black back of the blade hidden like this so that I wouldn't actually hit my foot or to actually. Knife etiquette states that you hold the blade to the back of your wrist to make sure that anyone that is in any state or actual has issues has to hold it correctly this way. I had even stated it and showed it to her and had shown her the issue of if someone is in a threatening motion. I had even shown her the issue when a blade is actually raised out and held down to the side that is normally an action of aggression. Well, the way that I was holding it was an action that I didn't even want to get near you. There was a box behind her for the car seat, which is why I had grabbed a knife. I hadn't stated anything. I had just taken my weed and went, went over and was on my task and doing stuff around my house. So basically, you're not aggressive when you have your weed. When I have my weed, I am very docile to the point that it is a case. The only time that I am not docile, when is there a problem? Okay, gotcha. Well, I'll see if any other attorneys have questions for you, okay? Yes, please. Ms. Thomas. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Hammond Duckworth, when was the last time that you used marijuana? Uh, literally just yesterday. I specifically had taken a 200 milligram and a single hit yesterday to guarantee that I would be safe and happy and healthy for everything, including if I was having a panic attack. So I calmed down multiple times during the actual issue yesterday. Okay. And uh, what is your child's name? Silas Lomas, S-Y-E-L-U-S. Okay. okay. And um, do you think that you're appropriate during parenting time? Do you think that you pose a risk of harm to Honestly, him? Honestly, yes. I was actually explaining to an actual social worker what my issues that I have been dealing with and that is also including the car aspect that I've repeatedly kept having to say to Patty Lomas almost every single day, which has caused her not to feel safe in my house like she has recommended. And I have Mr. only asked Mr. Hammond, repeatedly. Duckworth, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to re-ask re my question. Do you feel that you are safe to your son during parenting time? Oh, yes. Actually, I was more safe than I, what I was realizing. The only two times I was actually going and... Your Honor, I, I'm just going to say my client has answered. She asked if we felt safe. Okay. He said yes. So Apologies. I, I don't know how much you Mr. want. Mr. McFarland, if he wants to continue answering the question, uh, I can appreciate your concern on his behalf, but um, if he wants to explain that, I think uh, as far as it relates to parenting time, it is, it's very relevant and I would like him to be able to do that. Thank you. So the first parenting time... The reason why I had come in so distraught for the second one was because the first one I had found out the infamil that they were serving her, him, and not even taking my response of saying that Similac was supposed to be given to the child. Specifically, I had brought an entire case of a 40 pack of bottles of Similac to my first hearing. That was to make sure that I had everything. I had even washed bottles specifically that were already stated for that. And I'm still used being having that used against me in court, which is another reason why I, I feel like I have to state this. And I realize I am overstepping my bounds and my attorney has already told me to stop. But I feel like I have to say this because if I don't, it's going to eat away at me for next week. To repeat, the majority of this petition, I could state that half of this is wrong including the even aspect of me actually going in multiple times to check my own girlfriend to get her health. 
which is why I said that I wanted to be last time here. Okay. The majority of this petition was wrong. Okay. Uh, Your Honor, I have no further questions. Thank you. <coughs> Mr. Brooks? Sir, are you having a panic attack right now? Because I've... So the other reason why I have these issues is I re-remember everything. That means every aspect, every even issue. I normally just start crying. And then I get worse and worse. And then I, I snap. Which at that time, it takes... The last time that me and my honey originally had an argument, it lasted over five hours. And that was me asking if she's okay or if she's a, if there's anything that I can do for her. Sometimes she doesn't even understand her own body, which is why we go through the health mechanisms that we normally do. You know what doctors do. Are you in experiencing zero from 10 pain? We go through that thing. And if she's experiencing any pain that is over the six limit, I normally call an ER visit to guarantee that everything is happy, healthy, and safe in my house. And that even includes if I feel if I'm being too aggressive. Sometimes that is even to the case of that point, if I'm being too aggressive, I will make sure that she is actually getting her mental health checked at the hospital and we will take a night at that time. Sir, my question was, Right now, at 10 minutes to 12 today, are you having a panic attack? So right now it would be equating to a panic attack. This is my minor first stage. My second stage is usually I need stuff done. It is no, no other option. Patty has pushed me to the point where I've had no fucking point in to use my second stage normally. And that has happened at least six times this week. And it has been over her own her own daughter's health. I literally had an argument yesterday about making a bed. And all it was moved was two inches. I have no further questions, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Underwood, any questions? I have no questions. Thank you, Judge. Any redirect, Mr. McFarland? No, thank you. Recross? No, Your Honor. Thank you for your testimony. May return. Thank you. Any other witnesses, Mr. McFarland? No, thank you. Watch your head, please. Mr. Brooks? I'm finding out right now. Do you want to get around the stand? No. Well, you just tell me if you, you showed me all that stuff, and I'm just wondering if you want to tell the court about that. You can do whatever you want. It's not me. Do not look at me. If you notice, that's also a care method that we use. Sorry. Sure. I, you don't say I'm sure. I'm not sure. Uh, no, we do not have anything to say. Any witnesses you'd like me to hear from Ms. Underwood? <coughs> no, Your Honor, thank you. Well, all right. More comments in closing, Ms. Thomas. Thank you, Your Honor. At this time, um, we would just ask the court to make the findings that reasonable if um, actually active efforts have been made for this family um, to continue to assist in the reunification process um, and to help the family, I guess, with placement to have a, the most family-like placement for this child. It does not seem that that is um, an appropriate placement. We are asking the court to continue uh, placement with the department um, and allowing the child to remain in the licensed foster care home. Based on the testimony you've heard today, there seems to be a clear concern about the safety and well-being of um, all of the adults in this matter, which would clearly imply a substantial and imminent risk of harm to the child. We are asking the court to suspend parenting time as it relates to father, pending further psychological um, evaluation to understand how he could possibly interact with his child in a safe manner. I think that his behavior also poses a substantial risk of harm to the um, service providers that are involved in assisting this family. And I believe that that is unreasonable to ask them to continue to place themselves at such risks where there have to um, be safety plans to the extent that they are um, implemented right now. We are asking the court to continue 
Um, and also as it relates to Mr. Uh, McFarland's in, um, insinuating that perhaps online or video call parenting time could happen. I would also like to point um, the court back to the testimony of, and even father's own testimony of the inappropriate language use, um, the scattered uh, dialogue and the inability to really focus on the child in and of himself. And for those reasons, we are just requesting a full out suspension of parenting time. Um, as it relates to mother, we would request continued um, supervised parenting time um, at, um, as policy requires. Um, and with that, we would ask the court to continue the authorization of the petition pending the trials. Thank you. Mr. McFarland. Your Honor, I don't recall there being any testimony that my client spoke inappropriately to the minor child, raised his voice to the minor child, threatened the minor child. So I don't know how we can extrapolate that by him doing a remote contact by Zoom, which no worker should be involved in, which could be immediately shut off from the other side, uh, why he, the child couldn't hear his voice. Uh, as it appears as though he's demonstrated appropriate uh, vocal conduct from the child. Uh, so uh, that's what we're asking and we're still requesting the jury trial. Mr. Brooks? I can see listening to this man testify, how the caseworkers could either A, confuse, or deliver, B, deliberately distort what they perceive as his threat. He knows he has issues mentally. How often are we in here and people don't even acknowledge they have them? It's every week and they don't know that there are issues. He knows. He does, maybe it's not the politically correct thing to do, but he knows how to mitigate those issues so that he can be more appropriate. Now, I don't, may, I don't know what this diagnosis said about him being homicidal or suicide. I haven't seen it. That's why I was- No, 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 don't help me. No, we have good sponsors. Thank you. But, he knows, he is aware, he wants to control it. He is controlling it. You don't approve of it, maybe the workers don't want to work, but it works. Self-medication in this case has an ameliorating effect on his behavior. Now with respect to mom, I don't hear anybody saying she can't go to visitation. I don't see any reason why he can't go. I mean, if push comes to shove, they can always terminate the, uh, the visitations. But I don't think he's expressed <laughs> it. I think he's been very candid with us. I, don't, I didn't hear him say he was ever feeling like he had threatening motivations towards a caseworker threatening motivations towards a supervisor for visitations, none of it. And he went on quite a bit of detail about his, his status and where he's at emotionally. No, I, I don't see it. I just see he's different. I think he knows he's different, but that doesn't mean he can't visit with his child. And I, I'm opposed to any kind of limitation short of this. I agree with the need for supervision. I agree with that. But that's as far as I'm willing to go. Other than that, I don't see what the issue is. If it gets worse, I mean, well, though, the DHS has got the ability instantaneously to terminate visitation and to ask this court to continue the termination. Have they said he harmed the child? No. Have they said he's a little neg is he negligent about that? The tabletop thing is a bad thing. He can't do it. Yep. Um, but he learns. He listens. No. He should be allowed. My clients should be allowed. Supervised visitation with their child. As for bad language in front of the kid, the child. Come on. 
How old is this child? A week old? Two weeks old? They were even stating it. Sorry. All right. That's just ludicrous. That child hasn't got a clue on earth what's being said. I don't know if even a child can hear well at the age he's at. Probably not. But no, he's too easy a target. But none of it points to him being a threat to anybody. I suspect if he was a threat, he is aware enough, he would know he's escalating. I can, and he'd go outside, he'd use, take some marijuana, and okay, nobody likes it too bad, but he's not threatening anybody, and he should be allowed to visit with his job. Thank you. Ms. Underwood. Sorry, that was more about Crosby. Your Honor, I am more in line with Ms. Thomas and her recommendations. And uh, after hearing testimony from Mr. Harmon Duckworth, I am absolutely concerned with the safety of the workers uh, and, the, and the caregivers. Um, he indicated and, and displayed that he did carry a knife around. And while his explanation may seem um, appropriate to him or to others, why in the world would you display how to carry a knife and what you would do with it if you're going to be threatening to a caseworker. Uh, that would be very concerning, and I would myself have felt very unsafe in that circumstance. Uh, as for his behavior at the visits, uh, I also agree that that's inappropriate and uh, his parenting time should be suspended. Uh, he testified that he has to be high or or tipsy, I think he said, in order to be calm, yet if you're high and tipsy, Yes, you're calm, but then no, you can't parent your child. So it's a vicious cycle. Um, I agree that a psychological evaluation needs to occur and hopefully we can uh, make some headway on appropriate treatment for Mr. Harmon Duckworth so that he can have parenting time with his child in the future. However, I I believe that the other attorneys with uh, accept for Ms. Thomas are minimizing the behaviors that have been testified to by Ms. Harvey and by Mr. Harmon Duckworth himself. Um, I disagree that he knows his limits. Um, clearly we're here for a reason uh, and he's even testified that he can't keep the home clean, which is one of the reasons why the petition was, was even filed. So, I believe that there is significant safety concerns, both for the minor child, as well as the care case workers, as well as uh, Miss Lomas and her mother. And so for those reasons, I believe that placement with the department is still appropriate for the minor child. I would recommend that all parenting time for dad be suspended pending further uh, investigation and further uh, psyche valves, and that parenting time for the mom be uh, supervised with, without Mr. Harmon Duckworth present. Thank you. All right, thank you. So the court finds that all interested parties were given notice for purposes of the continuation of today's preliminary hearing. I do uh, wanna confirm that I think that the reasons for the removal uh, continue to be, um, they continue to create a reasonable risk of, or an unreasonable risk of harm associated with allowing Sidelius to be in the care of either uh, parent at this time. Uh, we've heard Mr. Dakota Herman Duckworth confirm himself that um, he has uh, some pretty significant diagnoses and some very uh, some, some triggers that uh, put him on edge on a regular basis that he uh, self-medicates uh, with very high levels of marijuana in order to uh, try to control some of those uh, impulses that he has and even when he is um, self-medicated that he has some uh, trouble uh, controlling those impulses. That was demonstrated by um, his actions around Ms. Jill Harmon during uh, the time that she was at the home. And again, Dakota uh, himself confirmed that he did uh, bring a knife into the room where she was at, uh, demonstrated that uh, he was using it in a safe and knew how to use it in an unsafe way. Uh, none of that is appropriate or necessary during a visit. Uh, there's no reason at all that there should be a knife brought into the room. 
while well, CPS person is there uh, for any other reason other than uh, to intimidate that particular worker. Uh, he's admitted to us that he has triggers as um, when 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 he asks has to ask someone to do something more than one time. Um, that his mother-in-law has taken him to what he referred to as. I think level two over six times in the last week, including at one point over the fact that she had made a bed and moved it uh, several inches over. We have the indications that Jill Heilman was in the uh, process of interviewing the mother of uh, the grandmother and that the grandmother shut down and was unable to complete the interview because uh, when Dakota arrived back at the home, uh, she stopped talking. So there are a lot of indications that the home uh, where these two parents are residing is not safe. Um, and I would go as far as to say that uh, it may not be safe for the grandmother and the mother at this time. And I think Dakota Harmon Duckworth is doing the best he can under the circumstances with this diagnosis to mitigate these risks. Um, and I'm hoping that uh, voluntary or involuntarily, uh, he's able to access some additional services through the, through the department to help control some of those impulses and alleviate the risk of harm associated with his uh, diagnosis that he shared with us today. In the meantime, I will ask the department um, to look at those potential resources for him, uh, to look at a psychological evaluation for him. I know that um, there are some good resources over at uh, Adrian Psychiatric and Counseling, uh, and you have your own resources as well, but we need obviously someone who is capable of looking at Mr. Uh, Herman Duckworth's uh, psychology and uh, psychiatry needs and look at how we can help support him uh, to be safe around himself and the people he cares about. He's able to do that voluntarily prior to pretrial and trial, of course, and I will ask him to do that in order to uh, make sure that he's safe during parenting time. In the meantime, I will allow him to have the virtual parenting time. I think that's a good suggestion by Mr. McFarland, and we'll ask the department to do a family team meeting to arrange some time where he's able to do some virtual parenting time with this child, uh, virtual supervised parenting time pending pretrial and trial, and I'll look for an update on that time at pretrial. Uh, I will also allow Ms. Jacqueline Lomas to exercise supervised parenting time. Uh, that will have to be done at the department and arrangements made also during a, an FDM, and if that's going to be outside the department to ensure that uh, Mr. Dakota is able to uh, not be part of that particular uh, time. And uh, there will be obviously some need to plan around that in order to make sure that uh, he's able to be supported in curbing his impulses if he has frustrations around that point. So I won't be asking our service providers to do that in a vacuum. I'll ask you to try to arrange that for any time either at the department or in a public place so that you have the resources you need uh, to keep the situation uh, safe and civil for everyone. All right, so that's what's gonna be happening with parenting time moving forward. I'll ask the department to continue to investigate the maternal grandmother replacement uh, as they have indicated they will. Uh, to continue that uh, home investigation, to submit uh, the results of any uh, BIA inquiry, to uh, supply that AOP or any other leaf, uh, proof of legal parentage. That's uh, something we have to tie up uh, before we come back and proceed further as it relates to adjudication. Our final pretrial will be September 16th at 11 a.m. Jury instructions, voir dire questions, and jury verdict forms are due at or before that final pretrial. Witness and exhibit list should also be filed in exchange prior to or at that pretrial. Of course, it includes marking your potential exhibits and exchanging those between parties so that everyone can be prepared for jury trial, uh, which will be uh, conducted on October 11th, 2024, commencing at 8.30 in the morning. Your Honor, if yes. I might, I plan to be out on October 11th. And that Monday following, uh, so I'll be back to Tuesday following the 11th. Back All right. Um, would you be able to support Wednesday, October 16th? Uh, I have Wednesday or I have Friday, actually. The 18th. October, correct your honor? October 16th or October 18th? Either for me. Just double check to make sure I don't have anything in another. We can actually even go Monday, October 21st, if that works better for everybody. Fine by me. 16th is fine. 18th is fine. 21st, 
It's fine. Your Honor, because it's a jury trial, I think I'd rather have it on Monday in case we have to carry over another day. That may be more appropriate. Uh, we have a point on. Well, if we did the 16th, we could carry it over to the 17th. That's fine too. So that, that's just my concern. I don't want to break for a weekend. Let's do, let's go with Wednesday, October 16th, understanding that if we do need to ask the jury to rejoin us Thursday morning, uh, then obviously we'd be open for business. So for continuity, I appreciate that, Mr. McFarland. I agree uh, that we should be able to have some time where it still remains fresh for everyone. So let's schedule it for October 16th. Again, commencing at 8.30. I'll make changes on my calendar accordingly and look for those updates as articulated previously at our pre-trial. Judge, I'm sorry, when was the pre-trial again? September 16th at 11 a.m. Thank you. Uh, pre-trial one more time, September 16th at 11 a.m. Jury trial October 16th at 8 30. I've issued uh, my findings as it relates to uh, placement. I think that uh, the child is in the safest and least restrictive uh, circumstances pending further developments and the homework list that I've given the department. And unless there's any questions, that's all for today. Should my client wait out in the hall for the order for the times? Sure. Most professions have dealt with difficult clients. Probably all of us have in some way, shape, or form. Attorneys are no different. They have difficult clients. Some people just don't get along. Personalities don't mesh. In that case, you just walk away and you find something else that works for you. But what do you do when you try to walk away and that person won't let you? Oh. Can I proceed, Your Honor? Well, your client, um, Mr. El Markaby, you need to turn your video back on. We're going to take up your hearing as first. Okay, there you are. All right, we are on the record, and uh, Ms. Vladi, you may proceed. It's your motion. Okay, Your Honor, I am here today uh, to request permission to withdraw as counsel of record for Mr. Um, Emad um, Elmar Rugby, I have filed my motion to withdraw and I would like to briefly outline the reasons that necessitate this request. Um, Your Honor, there has been a significant breakdown in the attorney-client relationship and communication between myself and uh, Mr. Elmar Rugby, um, uh, including uh, the breach of trust uh, from Mr. Elmar Rugby. Excuse what? This breakdown is rooted in a series of communication issues that have severely impacted my ability to represent him effectively. Uh, these issues include, but are not limited to his consistent, hostile and confrontational communication, unreasonable demands and expectations, his shifting strategies and inconsistent goals, his refusal to cooperate, and uh, including threats to waive the attorney-client privilege. Um, I have submitted two exhibits, Exhibit A and Exhibit B, with numerous instances of his hostile, accusatory, aggressive, and demanding behavior and inappropriate comments that he persists on making. Um, I understand that he um, objects to my withdrawal, but I am not able to work with a client like this or tolerate uh, his insulting, aggressive behavior. Um, if you have, I'm, I'm happy to share exhibit B, or if you could confirm that you have access to it in the box. Well, I have access to what is in box, but do you okay. want to offer it into the record? Yes, I would like to offer it into the record. Okay, any objection to exhibit B? Yes, Your Honor, I object. What's the basis? It's a breach of the attorney-client privilege. Okay, Ms. Vladi, what's your response? Well, uh, this exhibit directly um, uh, relates to my, uh, my um, communication issues with Mr. El Maragbi, where he uh, prohibits me to uh, 
draft any documents or revise any documents or uh, have any communications with other parties. And he insists on setting an immediate hearing within 45 days, with a 45 days notice and accuses me of wasting his time and resources. Okay, that's the language he has used. He has used other similar language where he has accused me of drawing his drawing my resources. That's that's the quote. Um, so your okay. owner. Well, what's the hmm. response to the objection? It, it is indeed a communication between your client and you, is it not? It is yes, uh, the communication from client to me. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll sustain the objection. Is there anything else that the court needs to understand with reference to the motion itself, Ms. Vladi? Um, well, I have also um, submitted Exhibit A with um, examples, new, a list of examples uh, of uh, Mr. El Maragbi's hostile and accusatory language toward me and his inappropriate comments and aggressive behaviors. Uh, these uh, include uh, my safety concerns and numerous examples of his confront confrontational and unreasonable communication. These examples all show um, uh, his breach of trust in the attorney-client relationship. Uh, he is distrustful and uh, unreasonably hostile. Um, would you let me to introduce this exhibit? That's up to you. Uh, yes. Objection, Your Honor. Okay, what's the objection? The, uh, the exhibit B is also a breach of the attorney-client privileges. Ms. Vladi had the chance to submit the exhibit under seal to protect my interests and to avoid uh, inflicting prejudice on my case and on my person, my personal character. Okay, I'm going to sustain the objections because it does appear that there may be a summary or some snippets of what would be attorney-client privilege. So, Ms. Vladi, you can, I think you've already told me what the situation is, and I don't think I need, um, exhibits or documentation of it to understand the situation. So um, okay. I will turn it over to Mr. L. Markaby for um, a chance to explain your opposition to the motion. And let me go ahead and ask you to raise your right hand and be sworn. If you would swear or affirm that the testimony you will give in this cause will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I testify that my testimony will be the truth and nothing but the truth. Go ahead. Tell me why you are opposed to your attorney's request to withdraw. Yes, Your Honor. My, um, the, the allegations of uh, hostility, confrontation, disrespect, and confrontational interaction is a misrepresentation of my frustration due, my, due to my attorney's neg negligence to make case and unreasonable delay. I have multiple time requested updates about my, about my case, given the fact that uh, my case is ruled by Rule 169 of the Texas Rule of Civil Procedures and Rule 190.02 of Texas Rules of Civil Procedures, the expedited action plans, and the deadlines of the discovery uh, was missed. I have repeatedly, repeatedly re uh, uh, requested updates about my case. Uh, I requested information about the discussions that was uh, done with the other party and the other uh, counsel. However, my attorney did not give me a reasonable explanation to uh, my legal situation or about the method or the tactics being used uh, yeah, regarding that matter. I received uh, a notice for the remote hearing uh, on a very short notice. Yesterday around 4 p.m., I did not get a chance to uh, prepare for the hearing today, nor a chance to prepare my exhibits to adequately address the allegations and I'm requesting a, a full hearing 
uh, maybe on a separate hearing to uh, be able to address these allegations and provide my side and my exhibits uh, to ensure fair opportunity. Okay, well, Mr. El Markaby, um, the court's files show that the original notice of hearing was sent on July 25th and that you were listed on the certificate of service um, as well as the e-service certification. So you did not just find out about this hearing. It's been set for quite some time. Yes, Your Honor. Uh, the notice I received did not specify the location for the hearing. Um, I, I did not consent to a remote hearing, and I communicated uh, this with my uh, counsel. Uh, I was not ready for a remote hearing in terms of exhibits. I was uh, uh, willing to attend a hearing in, in person, uh, especially my attorney uh, refused to provide me legal services regarding my uh, objection. However, my attorney um, uh, engaged into a conflict of interest, prioritizing her own personal interest over mine, using my retainer funds to uh, draft the motion for withdrawal, for withdrawal and threatened me if I do not sign that motion, she would be uh, bailing me for this hearing as well. This is a conflict of interest. Because as I expect, my attorney is expected to protect my best interest during the withdrawal process. And my attorney refusal to provide legal service is a breach of that privilege. All right. Um, well, Ms. Lottie, I'm not sure I need anything else, but it is your motion. So mm -hmm. you may have a brief final word. And just a reminder that you only announced for 15 minutes for the series. Yes. Your Honor, I have made my best effort to represent Ms. Elma Rugby. Um, I have not made, I, I um, have not had any unreasonable delays. I've had communication with him consistently. He has been notified of uh, all um, communication with opposing party and of my availability. I just, um, um, started representing him in May, in mid-May, um, and there are no open deadlines currently uh, pending. Uh, prior to my withdrawal, Mr. Elmarakbi was representing himself. Uh, he has not uh, made any progress regarding discovery, and as I have quoted from his email, he's also uh, not allowing me to, uh, what he calls, waste his time and resources. Um, I have offered him uh, to consent to my withdrawal, given that he is constantly calling me names and uh, accusing me of prolonging... Objection, Your Honor. ...for monetary gain. Um, I am asking for a withdrawal from this case. Okay, understood. Mr. L. Markaby, um, you made an objection, but I didn't hear the legal basis for it. Yes, Your Honor. Um, Ms. Vladdy uh, stated that I called her names, and that was not true. And That's I would like not to a legal objection. Okay. All right. Um, based on what I have reviewed in the motion and um, what I have heard um, from both sides this morning, the motion to withdraw is granted. And Ms. Vladdy, please prepare an order to that effect, circulate it to your client to review and opposing counsel as far as form before submitting it to Ms. Seeger. Uh, I have already done that, Your Honor. I don't have it. So uploading it to Box is different okay. than emailing okay. it to Ms. Seeger. So okay. if you would please email yes, it to my staff. Okay, thank you. All right, y'all are excused from the courtroom. Thank you. Thank you. When you're in Kansas, you never know what to expect. It's almost like Florida, but with less water and more windmills. So today we are in Judge Crum's courtroom, and this is James Watts. He is one of the more prominent defense attorneys who many of you probably know from his sign on the wall that says, keep calm and carry. 
Today, he is acting as a standby counsel for a pro se defendant, also known as James Watts. We have one James Watts who firmly believes in the laws of Kansas and upholding them. We have one James Watts who believes those laws are satanic and so many other things, but I'll let him tell you. Let's go to court. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Your Honor. Yes, sir. Good afternoon. All right, Mr. Watts there at the jail. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. All right, let's go ahead and go on the record. This is in the District Court of Butler County, Kansas. Case is entitled State of Kansas versus James Brent Watts. Case number 22 CR 83. The state appears by Cheryl Pierce. Uh, defendant James Brent Watts appears in person pro se. Um, attorney James R. Watts appears as standby counsel. Uh, we're set today to take up um, a motion filed by uh, Defendant Watts, as well as a, an issue raised by um, Attorney Watts as to what his role is as standby counsel. And I thought it'd be appropriate to take that up on the record with um, Defendant Watts present so everybody's on the same page as to what Attorney Watts' role is as standby counsel. And I think I'll, I'll, I'll address that first. Um, in my vision of standby counsel, um, Attorney Watts would be not to provide legal advice or trial strategy, that sort of thing, but rather um, be there to explain uh, trial procedure, how things work, um, the inner workings of a trial from voir dire, opening statements, uh, jury instructions, opening arguments, closing arguments, uh, that sort of thing, procedural matters, um, ensuring that uh, Defendant Watts has a fair trial, that the trials run efficiently. Um, I don't expect that you'll participate in any examination of, of witnesses or, or address the jury in any manner. Uh, I just want it clear that you're um, helping with the, the legal type um, things that go on in a trial rather than strategy because defendant Watts has chosen to represent himself and wants to present his um, theory of defense himself. So um, that's in a nutshell kind of what I expect your role to be. Also, you might be able to provide him with some limited access uh, to the outside world for maybe providing some phone numbers or addresses for witnesses he might want to get in touch with. I don't expect you to be a a role of private investigator or, or anything like that, but as Mr. as defendant Watts is in custody, if you can help him with just some maybe providing some information you can get there handily, I think that would be appropriate. Um, also to advise him of um, certain rights he might have, such as his right to testify or his right to choose not to testify, those sorts of things. So Attorney Watts, does that kind of help clarify what uh, your role will be? Well, it does, Your Honor. And, and the reason I ask is, was it was not very clear, and that's not necessarily the fault of the court by any means, there's very little guidance out there in the case law or as to exactly what that representation means. It has always struck me that if you're not very careful, it can be a trap for an attorney um, to bring on 1507 or uh, some sort of a, a um, disciplinary problem that you're setting yourself up for that sort of problem. I don't want to be in that position. Um, I've told Mr. Watts, James B. Watts, that I'd be... I can assist in uh, obtaining subpoenas and documents if he helps. Um, we haven't really discussed strategy very much, to be perfectly honest. He's not really interested in hearing what I have to say in terms of strategy. Um, 
So I think that helps a lot, Your Honor, as to um, I've noticed some cases <clears throat> that have come up through the appellate system where a, a uh, standby or counsel has been essentially put into the position of taking over when a defendant in the middle of a trial turns to him and says, I've done all I can. Would you take over here? And I don't think that's a realistic position to be in for any attorney to have to step in in mid trial and take over a trial. And I'm hoping very much that's not the position I'd be expected to be in should that happen. Well, I, I've, I've seen some of those cases as well. And, and it, frankly, I don't I don't feel that that's um, appropriate for someone who's who's assisting the standby counsel. So that, those are um, what I had envisioned as, as your role. Uh, let me address Defendant Watts. Do you have any questions as to the role of, of Attorney Watts as standby counsel? Um, well, I've asked him for things and he hasn't gotten them, but uh, I've had bad experiences with attorneys. Attorneys in the Bible are the worst people you can bust. They're absolutely of Satan and the devil, devil and everything else. Attorneys and lawyers are the worst people there are. They're evil. I've been screwed by them up at Chase County. They've allowed people to lie and I had to do time in prison. So I'm not going to deal with that. They're going to be put to where they need to go. Hell. Uh, there's no, I don't know of any attorneys that, uh, that I can say have done good. So no, I'm not Mr. Watts, you're my you're parents, entitled to parents, represent yourself, and that's what my parents that's have committed perjury, saying because they're afraid that they're going to get in trouble for something for me having firearms. I hit them in their house. I've always had firearms. I always will. By the laws of the heavens, laws of the universe, there's no restrictions on anybody having firearms to fight evil with. So I'm not going to deal with that. I'm not going to abide by that law. That law is purely satanic. But anyway, uh, no, I, Mr. I'll Watts, this, we're I'll kind of veering this. away from the issue of Mr. Attorney Watts's role as standby counsel. So, Ms. Pierce, do you have any comment regarding the issue of Attorney Watts's role as standby counsel? No, I think that uh, the court and Mr. Watts um, have a handle on it. All right. The other um, issue I wanted to address today is a motion filed by Defendant Watts, which is titled Motion to End the No Contact Order Between Me and My Parents. So, uh, Defendant Watts, I'll allow you to argue your motion at this time. Well, my parents are guardians and they're also trustees of an estate. They handle my money and I need access to my money. I can't get my money and I need that polygraph. I want it for evidence. I can introduce it in court many different ways, whether it's taken that law enforcement use polygraphs for uh, to establish probable cause or to disallow uh, a case, uh, probable cause or not allow or not have probable cause, the showing of it. They can absolutely be, I can file them in it with filings, if nothing else. I want that polygraph taken. But anyway, uh, I've got other, I've got many filings. We're going to have to, I've got evidence. I've got to talk to arms list on my accounts there. And uh, I've got to also uh, call uh, the phone companies, contact them to see what records they have and what arms list has. I've got to get responses from them. The whole idea of a preliminary hearing is to tie down evidence in that because their absolute perjury attaches in a preliminary hearing. Uh, there don't need to be uh, uh, any lies or perjury like that from my parents going on on the firearms not being mine or me shoving them down. I'm not going to deal with it. Now, you've got a situation because the deputies told my parents that they were going to get in trouble if I had firearms, evidently. I'll have to find out exactly what all was said. They haven't wanted to tell me or even county attorneys talking to them about me having firearms. I believe every felon needs to have firearms. 
The felons aren't the evil or wicked people. It's all positions of power and authority in society and government and the wealthy that are the real evil or wicked people. The ones that are in the prisons and jails are some that have been possessed by some devils, demons, and unclean spirits at the commands of the real evil and wicked ones. To try to fool everybody, the evil people are in jails and prisons. They uh, are. Mr. Mr. Watts, you're kind of veering away from the uh, motion that you filed was to allow contact between you and your parents. Do you have any more? Yes, I do. I've like got bank say? records I've got to get show my access to cash on hand. I've got phones out there I've got to get a hold of. I got a phone at the Butler County Jail I've got to get a hold of that they seized out at Leon. I need chargers to go with them, but I'm going to have to go through them and pull out different messages that I haven't deleted yet on me purchasing firearms and ammunition. And that's information you believe your parents will be able to provide you? They have the access to the phones down there. Uh, also, the county attorney, I've requested paperwork listing all of the firearms and ammunition was seen that was seized. I need to know that because I'm going to question every bit of that at the preliminary hearing. I need a full list of everything that was seized of my property. And it is my property. All right, Ms. Pierce, your response to the request for Mr. Watts to have um, the no contact order lifted with his parents? Judge, quite honestly, I thought that had been lifted months ago. Um, there was a um, time that he was in the hospital that we actually did a order lifting that. Um, that was a few months ago. Also, um, my contact with um, the county jail around that time um, as I recall, was that that no contact order was lifted. If the jail is still operating under a assumption that it is still in place and they need some kind of written order to the same that it is not, I will be more than happy to do that. Um, I have no problem with him having any contact with his with his parents, um, again, I would request that uh, all of their statements are recorded, so I don't have an issue with that. So, um, again, I I thought that it was been lifted. That issue had been addressed a long time ago. Okay. Do you do you recall when that may have occurred? <clears throat> well. When he went to the hospital, the hospital required an uh, a order, um, and that was ooh. That was way oh. back. Um, Well, Ms. Pierce, if you're not objecting to it, then uh, I don't think it uh, matters at this point. I guess my question is to the jail, and maybe I don't know if the person that's there with Mr. Uh, Watts can answer that question or not, whether or not they are still operating under the uh, thought that there was a no contact order. Um, but again, I don't. I don't know why they would be because I've I've spoken to Mr. Reynolds about it. So I don't know if that's I, I don't know if Mr. Watts has attempted to make some kind of contact with his parents and he's being told he can't. I don't know if I, I don't know exactly what the circumstances are that the reason that Mr. Watts continues to believe that there's no contact order in place. All right. Well, I don't, I don't believe the phone's going through. I don't believe the phone allows them to answer. Uh, it needs to be checked on. But uh, I need to make sure I have access to money. For different, well, there's, for the, the court call. will lift the no contact order. If the order hasn't been lifted previously, that will allow you to have contact with your parents. If you need to 
communicate with them by mail. If you're not able to get in touch with them by phone, you're certainly allowed to do that, Mr. Watts. Okay. Is there any way we can have the phone check to make sure it would connect if they will answer it? Well, that's not something that's uh, something the court does. They can't. You can't order Reynolds to uh, check the phone and make sure it'll, it'll connect. Uh, no. I've got to, see. I've got to talk to them about access to those fo other phones out there, cell phones, and then the jail's got one. But uh, I need to have access to them and charger so I can go through the text messages and uh, possible phone numbers on those too. Okay. Well, there's the, no contact order is, is lifted, so you can communicate with your with your parents. So. Uh, Ms. Pierce, would you be able to produce just a brief order? So we've got some, I didn't see anything um, that was part of the court file, just so that's part of the court record. I will do so, Judge. Okay, now we've already got the preliminary hearing. We've already set that. That's going to be October the 1st at 9 o'clock. That's an in-person hearing here at the There's no way out. Your Honor, there's no way I'll have my evidence by that time. Okay, well, we, we've got it set. So if if you're going to be seeking a continuance, you can raise that at the appropriate time. But for now, I'm this case has been pending for a long time. We need to get it moving. Uh, we've had this date, the preliminary hearing date set since August the 12th. So... All right, I believe that addresses the two issues the court wanted to, to take up today. Uh, Ms. Pierce, anything further? No, Your Honor. Yeah. There's other filings that are in there. One is to reschedule the October 1st date and a motion, and then also, uh, oh, the list of the firearms and ammunition that I'll be addressing in court that they say were their property. I need those lists provided to me. And uh, I need to have that polygraph, too, taken. I don't know why we haven't got situated on that. Well, Mr. Watts, if, if you want to pay to have a polygraph done, you can do that. It may not even be admissible. You'd have to file a motion to... I can still <laughs> have that use it in other court proceedings. Well, I can, if you want to do that, that's got to be at your own expense. The court doesn't provide funds for you to do that. Yeah, but I don't have access to getting in touch with anybody to get that done. Okay, well, I don't have or, any other motions uh, that have been filed recently, Mr. Watts. Have you received anything, Ms. Pierce? The last one um, I have is the motion to end the no contact order, which was filed August 23. I haven't seen any other motions that have been filed since then judge uh according to what i have in my file um on september the third there was a motion that i this is filed by mr watts the defendant motion that i be given list of all my firearms and my ammunition sent, seized for me and then there's also a uh, another one that is um, and that was done on September the 3rd at 11.47 a.m. And then there was another one that was filed September 3rd at 11.47 a.m. Motion to reschedule the October 1st date of the preliminary hearing so I can get all my evidence collected. Um, and then, of course, the motion to end the no contact order, which was filed on Octo August the 23rd. I think those are the ones that um that i have that are the most recent filings judge right. angela do you can you try to pull those up please i can't agree all right i'm going to take a brief recess and i'm going to look these over i i'd rather just take them up now judge please, judge please i just address those yeah judge i i want to 
clarify with the court that um, Mr. Reynolds, who's uh, watching this, indicated that the no contact order was lifted, that Mr. Watson and his parents have been speaking periodically on the phone. Mr. Reynolds checked the phones and the phone is not blocked, was blocked, unblocked months ago. So Mr. J.B. Watts' defendant has had access to his parents' phone uh, for months. So, I told the cell phone. Um, I will be more than happy to do an order lifting that no contact order as of today, but it looks like it's already been done prior. Okay. okay. Right. I'm going to. I have not had unlimited access. There's been uh, one or two times I talked on the cell phone just a little bit, and I was supposed to talk again, and it didn't go through. All right. Well, I'm going to take a brief recess and review these other pending motions. Thank you, Your Honor. Hey, can you hear me, James? Yes. What? Uh, now, hang on. Keep in mind, everything that's said here right now is open to the Internet and the public and everything else. This is not. Yeah, I, I, was, I was just wanting to know. James, uh, you, Mr. Watt, James, did you hear me? This is not private. OK, you understand that? I just want to know about what has been set up on the polygraph test. Uh, the best polygraph, the polygraph examiner that most people use around here is an Augusta. I mean, I've had a chance to talk to Augusta. Um, I frankly have no idea what he costs. Well, I, I have money that's been on there. I haven't been using much money that has I, I been on my account. So there's James, plenty of money out there. James, with What's very, happening? very, James, polygraphs, and we touched on this before, polygraphs are not generally admissible in court. I can use them in other ways for filings and stuff like that to get them on the record uh, uh, as in paperwork for filings and this and that. If I can't get it introduced in court, I'm questionable why it can't be introduced in a uh, when I've got people lying against me. Uh, because polygraphs are not reliable. They are not. How come, how come <laughs> law enforcement uses them at times to establish whether there's probable cause or not? Because law enforcement uses them as an investigative and interrogation technique, not as truth telling, because they don't do that. All right. Um, I've... Ms. Pierce, are you still on? Yes, sir. All right, we'll go back on the record. Same appearances as before. I now have before me a motion that I be given lists of all my firearms and ammunition seized from me and a motion to reschedule the October 1 date of preliminary hearing. I want to address the motion uh, regarding the firearm list at this time, Mr. Watts, I'll give you an opportunity to um, argue your motion. Go ahead. Well, uh, uh, since I'm going to be, my parents are saying that evidently I took my own firearms and ammunition, I want to be able to question them on that, have abs know absolutely all the ammunition, everything that was in there by the brands, types and brands and stuff, and a list of all the firearms and everything. Uh, I should be entitled to that under discovery. I never was provided it. What response, Ms. Pierce? Um, judge, typically that all that information is part of the KSO, KRO. Um, um, I imagine that it is summarized or it is a part of that as well. Um, I don't know whether he got copy full copies of discovery or not. I'm not familiar with exactly what it is that defense counsel provides to a self uh, rep uh, an individual who is representing themselves. Um, so I don't know that he did or he didn't get copies of all of that, but that information should be a part of that arrest document. Um, but then again, at the same time, I do not have a problem whatsoever providing him with a list. 
All right. Um, yeah, typically I would assume that the seized property is included in the list that's usually provided in discovery. So it sounds like the a list does exist. Um, I don't know what, what you've been provided, uh, Mr. Watts. I have not been provided that. It's been absent. Everything that was seized from anywhere, I have no record of anything. I know other stuff was seized, uh, phones and different things, probably a computer at the house down there and different things. Uh, I don't have a list of anything that was seized anywhere. No list whatsoever. All right. Um, Attorney Watts, is, is that something that you could perhaps assist him in getting a copy of the list of seized firearms and ammunition? Your Honor, we provided, I provided to Mr. Watts the copies of the discovery uh, documents provided to me by the state with some redaction. And frankly, given that the victims here are his parents, who obviously has intimate familiarity with. Uh, not very many redactions. That was provided some months ago. Um, the charge here, and I'm kind of, the charge here is a burglary and robbery where the items that were taken were firearms. Those items taken are listed by the alleged victims. They're listed in the police report as uh, a number of 679, 10, 12, looks like 12 firearms seized. It doesn't specify the particular firearms, or not, I shouldn't say seized, stolen. Um, as to whether or not there is a list of firearms seized by law enforcement, I can double check and see if I can see that. Um, I'll see if there is such a list. Okay. Well, we don't need to to go have everybody go through everything now, but um, to the extent that this list exists, I would ask that Mr. Um, if there were firearms seized and if there's a list of those, that that be provided to Defendant Watts. Yeah, they were seized down at Leon when I had that Leon on me and in the truck, and then there was also the firearms out the house. And they're accusing me of stealing my own firearms. So I need a list of those because there will be questions on those. And I also will uh, contact, try to go through arms list and get all the contact with people and my phones. If, if the lists exist from law enforcement, then I'll, I'll order that those be provided. If, in well, fact, so they do if I don't list. have access to a list, they shouldn't be allowed to say I stole it if I have no way to know what they're saying I stole. Yeah. I need to know the types of ammunition and how many rounds and stuff like that so I know where the purchase was made. All right. Now we'll take up the motion to reschedule the October 1st preliminary hearing date. Um, you've already made some comment. To that regard, Mr. Watts, but go ahead if you have anything additional you'd like to say. Well, I just, I'm going to have to have time to contact people and get all this stuff lined up. And I've got to write, I may have to write several letters to arms list and uh, net 10 phones and stuff like that to get, try to locate information. And I'll have to probably have some way to send money for copies. So it, it's going to be fairly time consuming. I've also got my bank records that need to be dug out from my parents over the guardianship, uh, they're saying they, I did tell her I needed those on that cell phone call that was real quick that I did get through uh, to them, but I haven't been able to check up on that or, or talk to them anymore on their phone. But anyway, uh, I need... Uh, access to my bank records to show purchases and uh, she don't know how long it'll take her to dig those out and i need those to evidence in court everything i can evidence in court i need to get questioned and evidence so there won't be any perjury i've had 
perjury to happen and put me in prison up there at Chase County. And it's not going to happen again. I don't know why there isn't uh, liability for perjury in all proceedings. All right, Ms. Pierce, state's response to continuance request. Judge, um, we have, this is a 2022 case. Um, the first appearance on this um, came in on um, 4-18-22. So we are well past two years. Now, in the interim or during that time, there's been a competency evaluation. There's been a couple of care and treatments, those kinds of things. So that has delayed the whole process as well. Um, I, I don't, I understand the, um, the idea that, you know, he has things that he wishes to um, have in his possession for his, uh, to, to present his defense. I think that the court and Mr. Uh, defense counsel, Mr. Watts, just did talk about um, being able to assist Mr. Uh, defendant Watts in obtaining uh, some subpoenas and documents and stuff of that nature. So I think that that can be done relatively shortly. Um, I don't have any necessarily um concern the majority of the um witnesses in this case for the most part um they are the defendant's parents um we've not had a uh, preliminary hearing and of any sort they are elderly um you always take a, a chance of something of their age when we deal with people of their age of unfortunate things occurring. Um, and I don't want to, in balancing his, um, the defendant, Mr. Watts, need for an ability to accurately present his defense against this whole idea of continuing to delay this, um, I would just suggest to the court that if the court is going to grant the continuance that the court would do it and um, make sure that we're not too awfully far out and that there is an order that um, it not be continued again unless there is um, um, extreme circumstances and that um, um, any delay that is caused by this particular request for continuance um, to be um, against the defendant. All right, thank you. Ms. And I know that we're not. I know that we're not at a speedy trial situation, and that we haven't had the preliminary hearing, or that we haven't done an arraignment. So I know that that doesn't necessarily apply. However, I want it documented that he is the one that asked for, the defendant is the one that asked for the continuance. All right. Thank you, Ms. Pierce. Um, going back through the docket notes, way back on September 20th of 2022, almost two years ago, we were set for evidentiary preliminary hearing. Uh, all the state's witnesses appeared on that date. Defendant Watts refused to make himself available uh, for the preliminary hearing. So then it ended up having to be moved, and then uh, there were competency exams and, and so forth. This case needs to go to preliminary hearing. Um, Mr. Watts, you've had two years to be getting all of this stuff together. And I'm not going to continue a date that we've had set now for several months for preliminary hearing at this time. If you wish to raise um, another request to continue the hearing um, when we come back on October 1st, you're welcome to do that. 
but I'm not going to reschedule it for now. This case needs to um, move forward. We've had too many delays. Okay, Your Honor, right. you should know that before uh, why I postponed it before, I didn't have the evidence then. I had requested evidence from attorney uh, James R. Watts as far as information from arms list, uh, the phones, uh, the list of firearms, ammunition, and stuff. I had requested stuff like that before and didn't get any response to it. I should have an opportunity to try to destroy probable cause in a proceeding that perjury will be liable. Okay, you'll have that opportunity I, I, October the 1st. What's that? You'll have that opportunity October the 1st. Okay, my parents are lying and I, I'm... Uh, need proceedings to get that under control. All right. Well, we'll we'll. And uh, I also back I also need to get new glasses. I need to have an eye exam. I filed a motion that might not have gotten to the court yet, but I need to get new glasses, an eye test, and new glasses for court. Okay. I, I haven't seen seen that particular motion, but we'll take it up in due course. So. All right, Ms. Pierce, anything further? No, Your Honor. Mr. Watts, anything further? No, sir. Well, I just want to make sure that uh, I'm going to go ahead and try to get letters off the arms list of Net 10 phones and start tracking down the, the evidence there. And uh, I still want that polygraph taken. I'll be using it for any and everything I can. But... Uh, I need to make sure that, that stuff's in the process. Even if it don't isn't introduced at the preliminary hearing, I still want it. Okay, well, Court that, filings and you. use if of you trial. To obtain that, you have that right. So, all right. If there's nothing further, we'll be in recess. Thank you, everyone. Hey, everyone. So this is Patty. Patty in Kansas, she doesn't like people on her lawn or in her driveway or anywhere else. So she grabs her shotgun, just fires a warning shot. No big deal, it's just a warning shot. No harm, no foul, right? Oh, oops. That one hit something. Yeah. Let's go to court. This is in the District Court of Butler County, Kansas, case entitled State of Kansas versus Patricia Arlene Coop. It's case number 2023-CR116. Um, Ms. Coop appears in the office of her attorney, James Watts. Amber Norris appears on behalf of the state of Kansas. This matter comes before the court at this time for evidentiary preliminary hearing. Is your client still desiring to have an evidentiary hearing in this case, Mr. Watts? Yes, sir. Uh, the state may proceed with their first witness. Your Honor, the state calls uh, Vance Morse. Great, right, Vance Morris would come on with audio and video, please. Vance Morris, you could join our, the meeting fully. Okay, if you remove your hat, sir. Raise your right hand. You do solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give in the matter now in hearing shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help you God. I'm not hearing you, Mr. Morris. You have to take, you have to unmute yourself. Yes, sir. All right. You can go ahead and put your hand down and the prosecutor may ask uh, questions at this point. Your Honor would ask witnesses be sequestered, please. So if we could put all of the other subpoenaed witnesses in a waiting room. OK, 
Okay, I don't know who Takers is. Okay, there we go. You may proceed, Ms. Norris. Please state your name for the record. Vance Stephen Morris. And Mr. Morris, um, I know this has been been a minute, uh, but did you have contact with law enforcement um, around May 16th of 2021 uh, by Leon, Kansas? Uh, yes, ma'am. And can you explain the uh, circumstances of that contact? Um, well, my, my niece, uh, Nora, um, called me. She was pregnant, et cetera, a boyfriend was beating her up or, you know, pushing her down or whatever. And, uh, she was going to start walking to, to Leon, which, uh, her boyfriend lived with his mother about, uh, maybe two miles, uh, east of Leon. And, uh, she said she's going to start walking that way. And I went to pick her up and I picked her up about a quarter, quarter mile from there. And, um, she said that her boyfriend had her uh, house keys and wouldn't give them back. So I turned around and uh, pulled in their driveway and, uh, you know, mom and she come out and said, can I help you? And I was like, I was like, uh, yeah, well, I said, I need to talk to her boyfriend and, uh, cause he had her, uh, keys and, um, she just said, that's not going to happen. And, uh, you know, then she, she come back out and was like recording us with her phone, you know, telling us to leave. And I was like, we need our keys. And then, uh, you know, they like flipped us off, and walked back up to the house and I heard a gunshot and so I sat there for a minute and I was like, all right, well, well, Nora called 911 and then, you know, we started driving back towards Lee and right for his gravel falls and uh, Johnny Jones met us there, the Leon, he was the Leon chief of police at the time. And, uh, that's when, you know, my truck started overheating. And then I noticed that there's a bullet hole in my radiator. So that's pretty much what happened. Okay. And, um, you said this was, um, two miles outside of Leon, um, that location uh, in Butler County. Uh, yes, ma'am. And um, can you see more than just me, or can you see multiple boxes? I can just see you right now. Okay. And can you slide to the right or the left and see other boxes? Uh, yes, ma'am. Okay. In any of those boxes, do you see the person um, that had the gun? on this may around may 16th 2021 uh now all i see is james watts and uh judge david ricky i i see a lady sitting in the background but i can't see her face i just see her hair and like her arm behind uh james watts okay so the person that tell me who the person was that had the gun well um I'm not actually sure if it was uh, Thad or his his mom. Like I said, they went back up to the house, and I couldn't really see him. And then I just heard the gunshot, and then you know, I started dri driving back towards Leon. My truck started overheating when I got the gravel pile, and, and uh, that's when you know I seen the bullet hole through my radiator. And prior to this incident, had your uh, vehicle been had any bullet holes or been had any trouble running? Uh, no, ma'am. And how far did you make it? I think you said that you ended up meeting law enforcement somewhere. Um, I guess just go ahead and say that part again, if you would. I met him just, uh, there's a, a gravel pile, just uh, like maybe a quarter mile, just outside of Leon, just east of Leon, like probably about a mile, maybe a half mile. 
So I probably made about a mile and a half. Okay. And did you hear more than one gunshot? I just heard one gunshot. And uh, about how far again were you from the uh, from the house when this happened? Um. Well, I was at the edge of their drive, or I was just pulled into their driveway, just barely in their driveway. And uh, I mean, the house sets off back a little ways, not real far, but I was just far enough in their driveway that I was actually out of the the highway. Or the, the road. Okay. Next question, Ms. Norris. And um, did you ever get out of the truck when you were there at the property? Um, no, ma'am, I did not. And about how long do you think you were there? Total. Maybe between you know, maybe five, maybe ten minutes at the most. I would say less than ten minutes. And did you exchange any other words with uh, Miss Coop? I mean, not too much. Just that, yeah, you know, I need to talk to her son, and that he had Nora's house keys, and I just wanted him to give them back to her and, and did you actually see um Ted or Thad Coop? Uh yes ma'am. When I pulled in the driveway they both come out and but she Thad kind of stood back and she come out and did all, you know all the talking and then at the time when you were uh I guess having the conversation as, as it were, um, did you see keys or, I mean, were they either one of, uh, you know, Thad or, um, the defendant Trish Coop holding anything? Uh, no, ma'am. When they walked off and, uh, you know, we heard them go into the house. Objection, Your Honor. It's not responsive. There's no question before the witness. Yeah, Mr. Morris, you'll just have to wait for another question, okay? Okay, okay. And, Mr. Morris, so uh, the conversation, I guess, ends. And uh, where do you, Thad, and the defendant go? They walk up and uh, to the house, and there's there's some trees kind of around the house so you can't actually see like their front door, but you know, I heard them go in the house and come back out. And then that's when I heard the gunshot and, but I couldn't see who actually had the gun. Okay. So you can hear the door open, open and close and open and close. So basically twice. Yeah. But there are trees in the way. Yeah, you don't have a real good view of the door, the front door. And you said that um, that uh, Thad did not speak much. And it basically it was it was Patricia and the defendant doing all the talking. Uh yes, ma'am. And uh did she make any uh threatening statements or 
Uh, I think you said something about them flipping you off. Yeah. Um, I don't remember if she made any threatening statements other than that, you know, we need to, you know, leave and she was pretty animated. I remember that. And what do you mean by that? Just loud and um, you know, kind of just not very nice. Okay. And do you mean that by like like bad language or gestures, body language? All the above. Okay. Okay. And the only reason, well, I'll wait for another question. Is there something else that you wanted to add about the, I guess, her uh, demeanor? No, that's it. Had you been out to this property before? Had you met the defendant before? Um, I've met the boyfriend. I mean, I've seen him quite a bit, but that's the first time I ever encountered his uh, mother. And had you been to that house before, that, that um, property there? Uh... No, ma'am. Any further questions for this witness? Um, no, Your Honor, I, I don't believe so. Thank you, uh, Mr. Morse. Um, Mr. Watts may have some follow-up for you, okay? Okay, thank you. Do you have questions for Mr. Morse, Mr. Watts? I do, Your Honor, thank you. Um, you educated, you wanted to pick up Nora Townsley. She is your niece? Yes, sir. Okay. Now, what is her condition at the time? I mean, physical condition. She's pre very pregnant, correct? Uh, yes, sir. Okay. Visibly pregnant? Uh, yes, sir. And to your knowledge, uh, the father of that child is Thad, who's there at the house. Is that right? Uh, yes, sir. Okay. So presumably... Patricia would be grandma. Or going to be. Uh, yeah. Yes, sir. Okay. Now, I want to be clear. As you are there, you indicated basically you pulled into the driveway but did not pull all the way up to the house. Is that correct? Yes, sir. That's and correct. I say that because you indicated basically you picked her up walking down the road and then took her back to pick up her keys. Yes, sir. Okay. If I may, your sir, and your honor, could I see if I can figure out how to do this? Every time I try to do this, I have to figure out how. How do I share screen? There's a way to do this, and I've done it before. Now i got to figure out how to do it again. Chat participants video apps. I don't know what that is. What's the nature of the intended a, shared screen? There's a photograph, Your Honor, uh, taken by law enforcement of the scene. Notes, whiteboard. I have done this before. Why is it not doing it? From where you're sitting, uh, there at the entrance to the driveway, can you see the house? Uh, yes, sir. It's looking through a, a number of trees that go up the driveway. Is that right? Uh, yes, sir. Okay. Here we go. 
There it is. May I, I think I found it, Your Honor. May I share the screen? You may. Okay. Sir, do you see a photograph of the front of a driveway? Do you see that? Uh, yes, sir. Okay. Does that appear to be the front of the driveway in question? Uh, yes, sir. Okay. Now, as I look at it, and so the record can kind of see what we're seeing or, or describe what we're seeing, there is a gravel driveway that butts up to a, a pavement road, correct? Yes, sir. And as you go down that gravel driveway, there is a white, either steel or wooden post fence on both sides of the driveway, correct? Uh, yes, sir. Okay. And... Oh, maybe a little, not quite halfway down, there's a couple of cars parked. One of them has a trunk open, correct? Yes, sir. Okay. I'm assuming that at the time you were there, those cars were not parked. Would that be right? Uh, yes, sir. That'd be correct. Okay. Now, from where I'm looking here on this photograph, as it looks like the, the photo taker is standing basically in the roadway. Would that be fair? Uh, yes, sir. Okay. The house is not visible at all from that location, is it? Well, the house is just to the the on the left side, and you can see that the house. And you know, if the, the picture was bigger, but you just like you can't see the front door or anything, but you can see that there is a house there. Okay. So the house would be off to the left of that photograph. Yes, sir. Okay. Fair enough. Your car is parked approximately where? Just, I'm not, I'm on this side of where the the fence posts are. Like, I'm just barely out of the street. Okay. So, um, okay, so you're just barely out of the street, roughly where that looks like a mud puddle or, or water puddle is there. Would that be about right? Yes, sir. Okay. Um. And I'm looking at where the trees are. Would the house be visible from that location? Uh, yes. I mean, yes, you can see the house. Okay. It's still off to the left. Yes, sir. Okay. Now, you indicated that you pulled in Ms. Uh, Coop came out. There was some conversation. It wasn't, as you put it, very nice. Um, and then she left, correct? Correct. You heard a door open and close perhaps a couple of times, correct? Yes, sir. And then you heard a gunshot. Yes, sir. Okay. One shot, more than one. I just heard one, and okay. I just thought, I just thought they was just shooting in the air, you know, maybe just scare us, and then okay, start driving yeah. back. And you heard a gunshot, correct? Yes, sir. Did you hear an impact? I don't really remember hearing the impact because I didn't, I didn't know that she actually hit my truck until it started overheating you know, driving back to town. And the reason I ask that, and I will tell you, honestly, my car has never been shot, but I have a strong feeling that's something I would remember. Fair? That's fair. But, I mean, I know they shot my radiator. I mean. Well, I'm, I'm not asking what you know, sir. I'm asking what you heard. Okay? You did not hear an impact. You did not feel an impact. Okay. I don't remember. You don't know which that. one of the two, if either one, fired that round, do you? No, sir. Okay. Now, just so I'm clear, at the time the vehicle must have been struck. Your front end is roughly where that that uh, puddle is. Yes, sir. 
Fair? Okay. I think that's all I have. Thank you. All right. No problem. Can we release Mr. Morris from the meeting at this time? Ms. Norris? Um, Your Honor, I don't know that I have an objection to that. If we can get Mr. Watts to unshare. Oh, yes. Yeah. Please do I, so, Mr. Morris. Do that. Um, stop share. Do you have additional witnesses, okay. Ms. Norris? Uh, Your Honor, um, yes. I would call Detective uh, Akers. Okay. Mr. Morris, would you go ahead and mute yourself, please? Uh, yes, sir. If I can figure out how. Okay. Mr. Akers, if you'd go ahead and raise your right hand, please. You do solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give in the matter now in hearing shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help you God. Yes, I do. May question the witness. Please state your name and occupation for the record. Thomas Akers. I am a detective with the Butler County Sheriff's Office. And how long have you been in law enforcement? She makes 13. And uh, did you work the... Um, a uh, case regarding Patricia uh, Koof back in May of 2021. Yes, I did. And I didn't hear the response. Mr. Akers, what was your response to the question? Yes, I did. Okay. And Tom, make sure you're sticking close to your mic. You're kind of cutting out a little bit. Um. And uh, what was your involvement in uh, this case out by Leon? I was the on-duty, on-call detective. Uh, anytime that we have incidences of this severity or this involvement, um, it's our policy to have a detective that responds to the scene to make sure that it's properly investigated. Okay. And uh, what was your understanding of the situation and what did you do with that information? I was originally called by Sergeant McMurphy, uh, who explained that they were investigating uh, originally the report of a disturbance uh, between uh, Thad Coop and Anora Townsley at this address. During their investigation, they had statements that there had been uh, shots fired uh, from an unknown direction, and they had discovered damage to uh, Vance Morris's truck who they were currently out with outside of Leon. Uh, from my understanding, uh, the incident involved a physical disturbance between Thad Coop and Nora Townsley, where uh, Mr. Vance Morris, an uncle to Nora, Nora Townsley, then picked her up, came back to the house to collect property, and another disturbance occurs. Uh, at this point, Vance and Nora are parked inside the driveway inside uh, Mr. Morris's truck, when they begin hearing gunfire, this is when Mr. Uh, Morris believes that his vehicle was struck by gunfire. So as my understanding is that we had kind of two incidences going on at first, a, a domestic and then secondly, a shooting. Okay, and did you follow up on the shooting? Yes, I did. And what did you discover regarding um, the shooting and uh, you know where it happened? that sort of thing. Sure. As soon as I was called, I responded to the scene. At this point, uh, Ms. Townsley uh, and Mr. Coop had been removed from the scene. My understanding, Ms. Townsley went to the hospital and uh, Mr. Coop was being held at the Butler County Sheriff's Office uh, pending, pending this investigation. When I got on scene, the first thing I recall is a large trail of kind of an oily substance that I understood was radiator fluid or it looked similar to it based on my own experience that was in the driveway. Um, of course, 
I'm saying that I responded directly to the residence where this occurred. Um, while I was there at the residence, I was able to document the, the conditions surrounding outside of it. Um, uh, Miss Patricia Coop was there on the front porch um, and had been spoken to by Deputy Weber. Deputy Weber explained to me that he had preliminarily questioned Your Honor, hearsay. Deputy Weber present. Your Honor, he is not, but I don't know that it's uh I don't know what he's going to say about what Deputy Weber, but it's uh Detective Akers um as the individual that collects uh and completes the affidavit. I'm not sure what uh, he's going to say about Deputy Weber other than he spoke to Ms. Coop. I'd ask that we have a little bit of leeway at this point. All right. Uh, repeat your question. Let's narrow down the focus of what your question is and what it's calling for. Uh, your Honor, I was, I was asking Dep or Detective Akers um, what he did and he was describing basically the scene when he arrived and uh, that he found the defendant sitting on the front porch. She had previously been spoken to by uh, Deputy Weber, and I think that's where we were at. So uh, I guess, Detective Weber, you continue to describe the scene and and what you continue to do once you arrived. As far as the scene itself, it wasn't, uh, there wasn't too much chaos or things that I had experienced in some of the other shootings. Uh, that being said, uh, I did take a closer look at the radiator fluid or the substance that I believe to be a radiator fluid and found uh, metallic fragments amongst the radiator fluid. Um, that was kind of an indicator to me, typically radiator fluid that's just deposited, maybe, or even oil or even some kind of mechanical substance. It doesn't typically have metallic fragments inside of it. Uh, based on this, I was led to suspect that it originated from the vehicle. Uh, I had not seen the vehicle, however, it had been explained to me uh, in that there was a very distinct uh, damage or a point of damage to the vehicle, which the metallic fragments indicated to me that it more than likely was originated from the radiator and or the front grill or even the object that struck the vehicle itself. Uh, further to that point, I was able to contact Butler County 911 dispatch and obtain uh, 911 audio recordings uh, through the calls that took place. And in those calls, you can hear the distinct report of pops going off in the background, immediately followed by uh, a voice identified as Miss Townsley uh, indicating that they're shooting at us. So based on the objects that I had found on the scene in the driveway, the radiator fluid that was in a trail, very similar to Mr. Morris's statement. I was led to believe that there was a shooting that did take place and due to the orientation of the vehicle being parked in the driveway facing the residence, that if it were to be a, have been struck, the, the round would have originated from the area in front of the vehicle, which was the front of the house. Now, um... Did you uh, speak to the defendant, Ms. Coop? Yes, I did. And where did you speak to her? And uh, do you see her on the screen today? Yes, I see her on the screen today. She's seated next to Mr. Watts. And give a brief description of her physical appearance. She's wearing glasses, appears. It's a little difficult to see, but she has uh, kind of brown hair that's down to the point of her glasses and Looks like a floral color top. You're going to ask that the record reflect that the officers identified the defendant. Patricia. The record so reflects. Thank you. And uh, did you speak with her um, regarding this incident? Yes, I did. And what did she tell you, uh, if anything, that would uh, help you figure out what, what happened? Tom? Yeah. Okay. You started talking, but we weren't able to hear you. I could see your lips moving, but um, try, try that again. 
based on information I had been given, Mrs. Coop had denied <clears throat> that gunfire had taken place. After I had been able to inspect the scene and found evidence that was kind of contradictory to that, or at least that gunfire had happened, I asked her if she had recalled hearing any sounds of gunfire. She told me that she hadn't. I re-explained the evidence that I had found, indicating that there was clear evidence that someone had been shooting. Mrs. Coop explained to me that she recalled hearing gunshots, but she believed that they were off in the distance, as in not from the property. Okay, and what did you do with that information? Based on that, I asked if she would be willing to uh, talk to me about any kind of firearms that were stored at the property or any other, uh, basically to expand the search and try to hone down of where the gunfire originated from. She agreed. She kind of explained to me that uh, there was a few firearms that had been at the property, not all to her knowledge. Uh, some of those firearms were owned by the owner of the residence. Um, among those of firearms, she specifically identified a 22 caliber Heritage Rough Rider pistol. Um, I understood, based on my knowledge and experience, that a 22 Heritage Rough Rider is a revolver, um, and it's a smaller caliber, which was inconsistent with the damage that we had. Nonetheless, I still wanted to have a chance to look at the firearm. So I asked her if she would show us that firearm which she consented. And did you find the firearm that you believed to be responsible for the damage to the radiator? Yes, I did, but not in this particular sense. So uh, maybe fast forward to how you found it and where you found it. After exhausting a, a consent search and not finding a firearm that was consistent with it uh, and having information to believe that one had been there based on witness statements that were explained to me. We obtained a, a warrant to search the residence based on the fact of the evidence we had discovered and statements we had gotten from Mr. Morris and Ms. Townsley. Uh, in the execution of the search warrant, which I was not a part of initially, a uh, nine millimeter handgun was discovered along with the 22 caliber heritage uh, pistol in a bedroom drawer or in a bedside table drawer in a room that had been identified as Patricia Coots. Okay. So did you seize the, it was the nine millimeter then I guess consistent with the damage to the radiator? The nine millimeter was consistent diameter to the damage to the radiator, yes. Okay. And so did you seize the nine millimeter from Miss Coop's bedroom? Yes, we did. And uh, did you find any casings or talk to anybody about access to that gun? I did not have a chance to interview Mrs. Coop on that day. Uh, I did find out information later on from uh, Thad Coop in another interview. And uh, did you find casings um, outside the residence uh, that would indicate that nine millimeter had been fired? Yes, I did. Um, we were actually on. He's, yeah. His volume's faded off again. Sorry, Your Honor. On May 21st, we actually were trying to make contact with Mrs. Coop. And we had been unavailable to do so because we're obviously trying to speak with her about this investigation. Uh, while knocking on the front door, we actually came across two nine millimeter shell casings that were on the front of the porch located on the ground, which was indicative of a nine millimeter having been fired in addition to one having been recovered from the house. So uh, we ended up writing another search warrant for the residents coming back and collecting those two shell casings. And did you then at any time speak with Miss Coop regarding the uh, firearm that you, the nine millimeter that you seized and also the shell casings and their location? Yes, we did. Uh, on a later date, Sergeant Albert and I both met with Patricia Coop at her residence at her request. Uh, 
having advised her of her Miranda rights, she continued to waive them. In that interview, she admitted that she did have a, or she was the owner or possessor of a nine millimeter handgun, the same one that was seized in the search warrant, the original search warrant, and that she did have it in possession during the disturbance. She further admitted that she had uh, at least orientated the firearm at one point. And to my knowledge, she even admitted that at one point she did fire the firearm. Uh, of course, she also explained that the shell casings couldn't necessarily be identified as coming from this incident because there had been target shooting that had come on the front of the porch uh, in the past or was common, common of the family. Uh, but she did indicate that she had the nine millimeter that was seized and photographed in her hand. And she admits that she did point it north from the residence. Originally, she uh, had lifted her arm up and pointed to the general exact location of where Mr. Morris's truck was before reorientating her arm toward a tree row away from where Mr. Morris's truck was at and indicated that she had fired a ramp. Okay. And uh, did you understand Mr. Morris and Miss Townsley to be in the same vehicle? Yes, I did. When this happened? That is correct. Um, uh, thank you, Detective Bakers. Uh, nothing further, Your Honor, but I'm sure Mr. Watts will have some follow-up for you. Mr. Watts, do you have any questions for this witness? I do, Your Honor. Thank you. Uh, Detective, how you doing? Audio keeps up. Okay. There you go. Yeah, your, your audio is kind of glitchy. Um, you examined the radiator, correct? Yes, I did. Okay. I assume the radiator's found a hell of a hole in it. That is correct. Okay. Um, I get the impression from your testimony you do not believe that a 22 caused that hole. That is correct. Are you telling me that a 22 is incapable of causing the, a hole in a radiator? No, that's not what I'm saying. Okay. Is that related to the size of the hole, or what is that related to? That's related to the diameter of the hole. Okay. And I say that because, as we both know, 9 millimeters is significantly larger than a 22. Correct. Okay. Now... Was a round recovered from the radiator? I don't exactly recall. I didn't handle the initial processing of the radiator. And I'll tell you what, I'm sure you already know. A nine millimeter striking radiator is probably going to go straight through. Would you agree? Yeah. And if it's coming from the front, it's then going to strike something inside the engine compartment. Would that be fair? That's correct. Okay. Did you notice any other uh, impacts inside the engine compartment? Yeah, and unfortunately, I didn't take part in the recovery of the radiator. Okay. Um, now... Again, you've been on the scene, correct? I have not. May I share the photograph from earlier? You may. Okay. okay. Detective, I'm showing you a photograph that's been provided by the state. Do you recognize that? I do. Over a little bit. There we go. And what is that? That is the driveway to the residence of the property in question off of 80th Street. Okay. And in the foreground appears to be paved road. That would be the 80th Street. Is that right? That's correct. And then 
on up the driveway. There's some cars there. I'm guessing those are actually law enforcement cars. The two cars parked on the right is myself and Detective Ryan's vehicles. Yep. Okay. Now, here's what I'm trying to figure out. Um, we've heard testimony that Mr. Um, Morse had taken his vehicle basically up to that mud puddle or that puddle you see there on the driveway, this side of the fence. You see that? Yes, I see it. Okay. Now, I've not been on this location. From where you're, from where that's at, is it is the house visible and where would it be? The house is partially visible and it's located to the south and east of where that first mud puddle is at. Okay. So if I'm looking down the driveway, it would be to the left. Would it be behind the trees or somewhere further off to the left? It would be behind the trees to the okay. left. Okay. Now, I can't tell from here, that row of trees, is that like uh, a one row of evergreens? Is there something behind it? Is that thick trees, or is that just kind of one or two trees standing in the way? And I uh, adjusted my audio. Hopefully, that's a lot better. That uh, does help, yes. That is a single row of, like, I forget how many, but several uh, cedar trees. Not so much in the thickness of, like, uh, density with branches however they're they're pretty spawned out okay so if you're standing okay i i think i see where you follow i see i follow where you're where you're looking here okay now you indicated that ms coop actually invited you out to the residents ask you to come out the residence for additional statement correct that is correct and in that additional statement she indicated that she had um fired around yes okay uh did she indicate that was a round in the air and the ground where did she indicate the round went if i can remember exactly she was not a hundred percent as far as the direction or orientation of the round. She was, however, certain that she tried to not shoot at uh, Mr. Morris and Miss Townsley. She did indicate that the, at least at one point, the round was fired off into the air. Can I have one moment, Your Honor? You may. Oh, that's not what I wanted to do. Yeah, I called my name, Lord. Detective, as part of your investigation, uh, would you look into any 911 calls that came from this residence on or about the date of the incident, which I understand would have been the 16th of May of 2021? Yes, I did. Okay. And there were multiple calls from that incident that day. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. 
Are all those calls recorded? They are. Okay. I assume, given this case is still open, those calls are all still recorded. Yes, they are. Okay. Have you listened to them? Yes, I have. Okay. Does one of those calls involve Ms. Coop asking a question of dispatch? I don't exactly remember a question. I do remember she was quite upset that Mr. Morris and uh, Ms. Townsley were on the property and not not leaving or otherwise quite distressed at their presence. Mm -hmm. Did she ask anything from dispatch about a warning shot? She did, but I couldn't quote it. Okay. You remember the answer she was given? Can I refer to my notes? Please. And Your Honor, at this juncture, do we still need the share screen? Okay. Yeah, I forget that it's up there. I apologize, Mr. Watts. It's been a while since I've heard that phone call. I don't remember exactly what dispatch told her. Okay, fair enough. Uh, is it possible for those recordings to be forwarded to the county attorney's office and further forwarded to our office? They are. Okay, appreciate that, sir. I have nothing else. Thank you. Very well. Does the state have any further evidence to present at this hearing? No, Your Honor. Thank you. Does the defense intend to present evidence at this hearing, Mr. Watts? Not at this hearing, Your Honor. Thank you. The question before the court is not to determine whether the evidence presented establishes proof beyond a reasonable doubt or even clear and convincing evidence, but rather probable cause. That being the standard, the court finds that the state has shown probable cause that the felony crime of criminal discharge of a firearm has been committed and that Patricia Arlene Coop committed it. The defendant is bound over for trial on that charge of the information. I believe there's also an existing misdemeanor charge still pending. That ruling being made, we'll proceed to arraignment at this time. Does your client desire the charging document to be read to her, Mr. Watts? Uh, your Honor, we have a copy of the information before us. So we waive that formal reading. And are not guilty plea at this time. Ask the case be set for appropriate pretrial and jury trial settings. Jury trial setting is January 7, 2025, 9 o'clock a.m., unless announced as a start time later. Court will establish a pretrial conference the week before, December the 31st, at 11 o'clock a.m., Mr. Watts? Well, Judge, uh, I may well be out of the country uh, on December 31. We're not sure exactly what day we're coming back, but it's going to be very close to that. Okay, rather than to set up a conflict, Mr. Watts, we'll go into 2025 for the pretrial. Uh, Mandy, can you suggest an appropriate date? Probably the Friday before would be best. That'd be January 3rd. January 3, Mr. Watts? Yes, sir. January 3 at 11? Yes, sir. And that will be by Zoom. Ms. Coop, I'm going to order you to be, either be at the Judicial Center or in Mr. Watts' office for the pretrial conference, just like you were today. That works well. That will be done by Zoom. Jury trial, obviously, all stages will be in person.
those dates established? Is there anything else we need to address from the state's perspective? I don't believe so, Your Honor. That's uh, January 7 through 9, right? Correct. Um, no, Your Honor, no, no further requests. Mr. Watts, anything further at this time? Nothing else this time, Your Honor. Thank you. And I trust you've been able to see and hear everything adequately today, Ms. Coop? Yes. Very well. Then if there's nothing further, the Patricia Arlene Coop matter will currently be in recess, and this meeting may be ended for all at this time. This is in the District Court of Butler County, Kansas, case entitled in the matter of the marriage of Jessica Ferguson and Timothy Ferguson, case number 2024, DM 13. The petitioner, Jessica, appears with her attorney, Karen Patterson. Respondent, Timothy, appears with his attorney, Susie Locke. This matter comes before the court at this time for a status hearing. Mr. Patterson, what is your current assessment of this case? Your Honor, as the court stated, this is a status conference. I would tell the court that our request to the court today would be that we use this as a case management conference to set dates and deadlines. We are wanting to get this case finalized as soon as possible. This is a pretty low asset case so that there's not a lot of asset and debt issues from our point of view. From our point of view also, I don't believe that formal discovery is needed so that uh, unless requested, I'm not sure we need a discovery deadline of any kind that uh, it would just be ready to set for pretrial conference if need be, if it can't be settled. Um, I know that the answer that was filed had certain requests in it, and I think those need to be addressed here today. One of those requests in the answer was that uh, there was a request for um, or a denial that uh, the parties um, were incompatible, a denial that uh, um, there's ir irreconcilable differences and a request for marital therapy. Um, I would tell a court, my client is wanting to exercise her right, statutory right to a divorce, is not wanting to, um, entertain marital therapy is just asking to have the case set to finalize and move forward. So that's where I see the case at today. We just need to set dates to finalize it or um, move towards settlement. All right, Ms. Locke. Um, Your Honor, I don't disagree with Mr. Patterson's position. Unfortunately, my client has not seen or had contact with the minor child in this case since January. Um, there is a pending criminal action with a no contact order in municipal court that will hopefully be resolved on July 10th. Um, and depending on that outcome, we're hopeful that parenting time can start. Uh, obviously he misses his child, but he is a witness in that case and there is a no contact order. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, so we haven't filed any motions to modify um, the temporary order because that would be the basis of our motion. And we know that that no contact order is competing. I'm hopeful that when that case is resolved, Mr. Patterson and I can maybe agree to some sort of modification to the temporary order pending a final resolution in this case. All right. Uh, anything else regarding Mr. Patterson's view of the case? Um, Your Honor, since filing our answer, my client is also in agreement that uh, the differences are irreconcilable and we are ready to proceed to divorce as well. All right, what needs to happen between now and pre-trial conference, Mr. Patterson? Your Honor, um, I, I, I'm aware that there, there is a trial set next week in the Municipal Court of El Dorado concerning the criminal charges that are pending. The um, name, the victim in that case is, in fact, the minor child. Um, so that does kind of uh, affect um, going forward what our position will be concerning um, parenting time, which initially um, we're going to be requesting supervised parenting time. 
um, even though I'm not sure what's going to happen next um, on July 10 at 1.30, the date the trial is set. Um, but uh, we do have all the police reports. We do have um, the uh, audio video of any interviews. We are um, prepared to present that if need be at a motion to modify temporary order if we can't come to some agreements um, later on. But uh, uh, as far as uh, our request for moving forward, Judge, again, um, there's no not a lot of assets here, so we don't think discovery is needed. We just need a pretrial conference date. We'll present a proposed um, divorce decree and settlement to the respondent before that date to see if we can get it settled, but otherwise we just ask to move forward. What is the charge pending in municipal court? Domestic violence pattern. I'm sorry. Go ahead. There was an alleged domestic violence incident. All right. Thank you. Council, would a, an August setting be appropriate? Yes, Your Honor. Yes, Your Honor. All right. I'll try to find an appropriate date. Uh, Monday, August 26th at 11 o'clock in the morning. It is a Monday docket. Of course, Mr. Patterson. All right. <laughs> Set you up for a conflict. A uh, Wednesday, well, no, that's not going to work either. That's so what we may be looking at going on over to September if we can't use a Monday. Monday afternoons are pretty open, Judge. All right, let me let me go back and look and see if there's some, some afternoon settings. Monday, August the 5th in the afternoon. I'm wide open that afternoon. Ms. Locke? Well, Susan, you're muted if you're trying to talk to me. Sorry about that. Um, I'm on Judge Murphy's docket that afternoon. It's a docket call, so I don't always know when my case will be taken up. Okay, would it be, would you be confident that you'd be able to be uh, present for a Zoom meeting at four? If it's at four? Yes. My here, his dog, it starts at 2.30. Oh, I see. Okay. This is in the District Court of Butler County, Kansas, case entitled in the matter of the marriage of Jessica Ferguson and Timothy Ferguson. Case number 2024-DM13, the petitioner, Jessica, appears with her attorney, Darren Patterson. The respondent appears with his attorney, Susan Locke. This matter comes before the court at this time for a hearing on a motion to modify the ex parte temporary parenting plan in the case. Uh, Ms. Locke, I trust you are still pursuing this motion? Yes, Your Honor. Mr. Patterson, is there opposition to it? Yes, Your Honor. Ms. Locke, you may proceed further in regards to your motion. Provide whatever additional argument you believe is pertinent. Thank you, Judge. Um, in March, this case, essentially a, a temporary order was filed, um, and it was an ex parte temporary order. Typically, my client would have responded much quicker once he was served the order, uh, but there was an ongoing criminal case where he had a no contact order. That case was fully resolved in July, and the no contact order lifted, which resulted in us filing the motion to modify uh, the ex parte temporary order. 
My client has not had any contact, physical contact with his son since January 12th of 2024 as a result of an alleged domestic violence incident, which was later reduced to a disorderly conduct um, for which my client is dealing with in the municipal court system. Um, noteworthy is some history on that incident. So in January, on January 12th, um, there was some parental discipline concerns. Uh, the minor child said some inappropriate things to dad. Dad threatened to take away his gaming system. Uh, mom and dad disagreed about the appropriateness of that punishment. And ultimately, dad decided to leave the marital residence. It wasn't until February 2nd uh, that he found out when he was arrested that mom had called the police and mom had reported that domestic violence had occurred when dad left the marital residence. Uh, the son was interviewed four days after the alleged domestic violence incident and made reports uh, to the Sunlight Children's Home, uh, which make accusations against dad. However, dad was never, never discussed those with anyone and again was not arrested until February 2nd, a, a pretty significant time after this alleged incident occurred. Um, so dad has this no contact order, follows it, does not contact his child, does not contact mom, um, and then gets the case fully resolved in July. Since that time, uh, in July, when the domestic case was fully, or not domestic case, but the criminal case was fully resolved, he has had daily, uh, to, for the most part, daily communication with his child via text message or phone calls. Um, this includes nightly, like, how was your day? Have a good night. I'll talk to you tomorrow. Uh, pretty benign communication, um, allowing the child to try to make that contact uh, with dad and just get on a good firm footing with him. Obviously he wants significant parenting time. Uh, the child appears to want that too, although dad is trying to redirect any conversations from the child that uh, attempt to say, can I live with you? Uh, can I have more time with you? Why am I not seeing you? Um, dad appreciates and knows that those are conversations that should occur between the parents or be decided by the court uh, and is trying to just redirect conversations with his child when he brings those topics up. So it's our position that um, dad should have ample parenting time, but there's nothing that is preventing him from having that time. The current order is an order for sole custody. Uh, it also attempts to say that visitation can only occur at a visitation center, uh, which my client cannot afford to go through uh, VEP and go to Wichita. Um, and also, we're not sure that that's necessary for the child. And as school starts, that scheduling becomes very difficult. The other option that mom put in her temporary order for visitation is for her parents to be the supervisors. Well, that leads to a whole additional host of issues. Um, my client states that he has never really seen eye to eye with his spouse's parents. Um, and so to put the child in a position where his grandparents are there, who he knows have animosity with his dad, is just not conducive to a good visit. Um, and regardless of that, we don't believe that dad needs to have supervised visits of any kind, um, that there has never been concerns about the father-child relationship that any sort of issues in the marriage were between mom and dad. Um, and those are, are non-factor because they've been living separate and apart for eight months now. Um, dad lives in the marital home. There's concerns in the temporary order and statements that he's not in stable housing. He lives in the marital home where the child lived his whole life until mom moved him into a new residence. Uh, so he is in a stable house. He's in a house that the child's familiar with. He's in a house that the child grew up in uh, that has access to the same school, same friends uh, that the child's familiar with. So today we are asking the court to lift uh, the very restrictive temporary order uh, to make an award of joint legal custody allow more open communication between father and son and grant ample visitation. Our proposal is for a shared um, visitation schedule, whether that's uh, 5225, which is what we suggested, or a week on, week off. Um, we think that that 
is more conducive to a successful outcome here. I don't think any other aspects of the divorce are really going to be contested. It's truly just about parenting time. Ms. Locke, who was the alleged victim in the municipal court domestic violence case? My client understood that mom was the alleged victim. I think that Mr. Patterson understands that the child was the alleged victim, um, but it's not clear to me from the incident report uh, who the, the police believed was the victim, although both mom and son were interviewed. And I suppose uh, the state of the municipal court complaint doesn't give any direction in that regard. No, it just says that there's a no contact order between uh, father and son and mom, but he can't contact any of them. Very well, Ms. Luck, I think I understand your position. Mr. Patterson, I wish to understand yours and, and that of your client. Thank you, Judge. Judge, I guess uh, I would start by saying that uh, there's a different version to the events that brought the sole custody order, temporary order into effect. I am going to um, tell the court what we would proffer, basically, if the case went to an actual evidentiary hearing, because we do have the police reports, we do have witness statements, we do have video. Um, we have those and we can set an evidentiary hearing and present it. But as a proffer, I would tell the court that it is correct that he was not arrested immediately when these things occurred, although the police were called immediately. That's because he, he ran, he left the scene and he was nowhere to be found. Um, so he was arrested on February 3rd, 2024, when there was a um, alert of where he might be. Police went there, did find him there, placed him under arrest. And at the time he was placed under arrest, there were drugs found on him, two high tides, THC vape carts um, with the 92.6% THC KBI lab report was completed and positive for that um, drug. That's one of the issues my client has had is that he is a known and active drug user of illegal drugs. And by allowing the unsupervised visits that uh, he does this uh, all the time, she's concerned about her son being exposed to it. So there is proof of the drug use. Um, on the date of the occurrence in January, I would tell a court that uh, um, my client made a written statement. The child was actually taken to Sunlight Advocacy Center and there's a video statement of his, but the summary report indicates that the child saw his mother being taken to the ground by the father. And then he, the child went over to try and rescue his mother. And the child stated then that he became the center of the attack. And here's why. Um, in the reports, it does state that there was an argument going on um, and that at some point my client was pulling out her phone to call the police. The respondent then basically I don't know, attacked her to get the phone away. They struggled. That's when the uh, son got involved. My client yelled at her son to take his phone out, call the police. That's when he turned on the son and took his phone. The son started to run to the neighbors. The respondent said, stop. We don't want anybody else involved here. And then he left. 911 was called, however, and they did have this report with the interview at Sunlight Advocacy Center. There is evidence and facts that uh, back up what my client has uh, um, suggested happened. We're aware that the municipal court has these charges. They've taken care of the charges. In fact, I have the disposition sheet here. Disposition sheet does show that there were originally three charges, intimidation of a witness, um, unlawful restraint, and domestic violence battery, and then also possession of marijuana, possession of paraphernalia in a different case number, that as a result of plea negotiations, the drug charges were dismissed completely, that the intimidation of a witness was dismissed, that the unlawful restraint and the domestic violence battery were both amended to disorderly conduct. 
there are fines and costs and um, a jail sentence that is suspended. He was placed on a one-year reporting probation with um, probation officer Ryan Smith. What I guess I'm shocked about that is that there are no special conditions of anything to do with drug and alcohol assessments, nothing to do with drug and alcohol treatment, nothing to do with batters intervention assessment, nothing to do with anger management. Those are all blank on the dispo sheet. So um, my client did not agree with the plea negotiation when they asked her, um, but uh, that of course is the prerogative of the prosecutor. So these are the things that happened and the son was right in the middle of it and subject to it. My client states that the police have been called over the period of their relationship. In, it's in the teens because of uh, the uh, um, violence, the, the, the such like that. And she tells me the son has commented how peaceful it is without the father around, no arguing, no hitting, no, nothing. So I think that says a lot. My client is concerned about unsupervised visits unless he gets at least either a mental health assessment, anger management, a BIP assessment, because this is not something that is isolated. It is an ongoing issue. My client's also concerned about the drug use without a, a hair follicle test um, to show that. And if it's positive, a drug and alcohol assessment, um, she's certain it's gonna be positive. When it comes to safety issues, that's safety issues, but there's still other issues that are concerning to her, and that's the residence that he currently lives in. She lived there too, but she also was the one who was trying to help the mice infestation situation by cleaning up the feces that were in cabinets, by cleaning up the feces that were in the bathrooms, by trying to get the mice. Um, but, it, but she said as she got closer to the time that she moved, the infestation got worse and it's just an unhealthy place because of the infestation. Um, she doesn't know if that's changed or not, um, but if it's the way it was when she left, she does not think it's a healthy situation. It is a two bedroom house that uh, um, it's her understanding the respondent took on a roommate she is not aware of the full name of the roommate to know what his circumstances are, if there's some kind of background that should be done on this new roommate. So there's unknown question about the, the roommate, but further having a roommate then, where, were, will, where will her son sleep? That's uh, getting to be a question for her too, um, if there's to be an overnight. So, um, that is concern about the house and uh, the living situation. But all of this is in the temporary order that uh, is currently before the court. Judge, I would also tell the court what's in the temporary order is a child support amount. My client, since uh, moving out, has taken full responsibility financially for the child. She has received nothing. She has uh, been working towards trying to get school clothes, supplies together, but has received no child support. There's approximately $2,915 in arrears currently, but she is forced to make ends meet on her income only for this child. So um, it has been a struggle for her. Judge, I can tell the court what she would agree to here today based upon the history, based upon what uh, I've just uh, went through with the court, is she would not object to changing the soul to joint so that they can both have information and know what's going on. But the parenting time is her main issue and that she believes it should continue to be supervised until he does some things that Frankly, the municipal court maybe should have done. And uh, that's order either, again, a mental health assessment, a BIP assessment, or at least anger management, um, that uh, there be hair follicle and follow-up drug and alcohol, and that he be drug-free. But if there is going to, and, and before I go on to the next, there was a suggestion at one point of a different supervisor by the uh, respondent through her through counsel, and that was Steve Waite. 
Um, that I don't know if that's still their proposal, but we would have opposition to that if that's still a proposal and would want to be heard on that. Judge, if the court elects unsupervised, we would just ask no overnights at this point that the house needs to be inspected. We need to know who the roommate is. We need to do some background checks. My client's also worried about his friends because they um, basically partake in the same activities that the respondent does. The allegation in the motion is that my client won't allow phone calls, um, but she doesn't interfere with that. She's fine with the phone calls. She would say that he is very sporadic and not all the time. In fact, uh, when I met with her, um, getting ready for this hearing yesterday, she told me it's been at least been a week since uh, there's been any phone calls. So she's not interfering with phone calls. She's fine with that so they can have contact. She's not um, opposed to if there is a need for exchanges to be a quick trip, a public place. So there is a no contact order in the current temporary order. Um, we would ask the court to amend the temporary order to allow contact, phone, text, email to discuss child related matters, but needs to be peaceful and in person contact only for purposes of exchanges and matters concerning the child. So those are her concerns. Those are our positions on it, Judge. Very well, Mr. Patterson. Ms. Locke, I've got a number of points I need you to address here. First of all, why hasn't your client paid child support like he was ordered to do? Your Honor, financially speaking, that is very difficult for him um, to make the current ordered amount. And uh, I'll be honest, he needs to start paying something, but that is a challenge. So, so he hasn't paid anything in child support? I didn't know where to. He, he has not, um, but we will have a more robust discussion about that after this hearing. Although it is, I can't qu quote a direct case, but child support payments are not supposed to affect parenting time. And we're before well, I understand that, Ms. Locke. I'm just saying that if he doesn't start paying the child support that he's been ordered to pay, then he and I are going to have a robust discussion. Understood, okay. Your Honor. And it it is a temporary child support order. And so those any arrearage, any future payments would be taken up at the final hearing. And he understands that he will have an obligation to support his child. And he is prepared to do so. But the current amount is not something that is feasible for him. All right. Well, that issue is not narrowly before the court today. So let's move on to the next issue, this roommate situation. Your Honor, my client does not have a roommate. Uh, the house is suitable to live in. Uh, okay, uh, go back Go back to the roommate. We're just yeah. focusing on that. Why, why would the mother think he has a roommate? Is there somebody that stays over there on a regular basis? I do. There are. He has had people that have come and stayed in the house, but there's no one that lives in the house with him. Yeah, uh, and it is no one that would be any sort of harm to the minor child. It appears that mom wants to pick every part of my client's life apart. However, he has to afford to live in the house that they lived in previously on his income alone. And he's he does not have a roommate. Okay. Just find it interesting that he can put up other people and uh, support them at least overnight, but he can't pay any child support for his child. Mm -hmm. But all right, let's, he, but he you're saying that, that no one is a regular inhabitant of that house. Is that correct? Correct. He would like that. Okay. For, he would like for that to be his minor child. All right. So he does have bedroom space for his son, correct? Yes. Okay. Drug use, address that. Your Honor, my client is on reporting probation with Ryan Smith, who is a very serious uh, corrections officer and takes that very seriously. So to insinuate that he is actively using marijuana would be inconsistent with his probation. And he reports to Mr. Smith regularly and is subject to random drug testing. Uh, there is prior history uh, and he won't deny that but he's actively not using any sort of substance. 
and that it would be consistent with his requirements to not go to jail. Right. Even though I'm creeped out about this discussion, what about the mice infestation allegation here? We lived behind a field, like my house is the, right by the school. Yes, their house, back, track, and their, track. their house backs up to Blackmore Elementary, um, and they have had tr pest control trouble in the past, but he tells me that it's not an active issue at the moment. And it would be noteworthy that mom resided in this home for the child's whole life, until she unilaterally decided to leave and take almost all of the possessions out of the home. So it was not a big enough deal during the marriage for her to want to leave, but now suddenly that dad wants parenting time, it is an issue that needs to come before the court. All right. Um, since it appears that it's conceded that this has been an ongoing issue, what is he doing about mice infestation issues currently, if anything? What, what everyone would do, which would be just traps, bait, those types of things to make sure that your home doesn't have any rodents. Are there other animals in the house? Two dogs. There are two dogs that also reside in the house. Hmm. One's a son's dogs. Maybe you need a cat. All right. Very well. Uh, Mr. Patterson, I, I wanted to give you an opportunity, since I had asked perhaps about some matters that she hadn't spoken of before. Uh, anything else from your perspective? Just as to the drug issue, Your Honor, my client would offer to prepay a hair follicle and a UA um, so that he could go to uh, Assured Occupational Solutions and get that done today, and we can know for sure. It's my understanding, having talked to uh, Assured Occupational Solutions, is that the hair follicle will reach back approximately 90 to 100 days so that the arrest was in February uh, for that. If he's not been using, he should be clean all the way around so that uh, she would agree to prepay, prepay that, but have the court consider repayment if he's positive later. Well, other than that, Judge, um, we understood, we heard their arguments. We still hold to what our requests are to the court. Your Honor, may I respond to Mr. Patterson? Brief. Finding. Prior to this incident in January, my client was a regular fixture in his child's life. Since January, he has had virtually no contact with him, which is not healthy for a teenage boy to not have contact with his dad, who he had a very positive relationship with. Mr. Patterson is putting per, uh, is asking the court to put parameters on my client that are similar to a child in need of care case, despite the 11 years. Um, so we would ask the court to make reasonable parameters uh, but also strongly consider the idea of regular and consistent unsupervised visitation. Very well, Ms. Locke. Um, Mr. Ferguson, the only reason we're here and the only reason you have restricted uh, parenting time with your son right now apparently is due to your, let's call it for what it was, which led to the municipal court case. Obviously, this was an extraordinary situation when this case was filed because there was an intervention from another court that placed restraining orders on you, which interfered on what this court would have otherwise ordered or necessitated as part of reasonable temporary orders in the case. Uh, the municipal court case is now resolved, apparently, Mr. Ferguson, uh, very favorably to you. Uh, you have disorderly essentially looks at at this point and I think at least consistent with what's in the best interest of this young man reinstitution of a relationship a more normalized relationship between father and son uh, Mr. Ferguson it's not good for your son in 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 my opinion to be totally separated from you nor should you have to just settle for whatever small breadcrumbs your wife is willing to throw you 
So I, I want to work toward re separated from him for a period of time. Uh, are you free this evening, Mr. Ferguson? All right, I'm going to want this boy delivered to the McDonald's restaurant in El Dorado uh, at 6 o'clock tonight for you to spend a one-hour time with him at McDonald's. Okay. Now, patronize the restaurant and buy him dinner. Okay. okay? I don't I don't want you to just use their facility for free. I want you to, to use the right. restaurant. I understand. For one hour, I want you to visit with him. Mother can be in the restaurant. She's on her own. I want her at least 15 feet away. Because I want you to have an exchange with your son where she's not interfering in any way. I have no doubt that you can have a reasonable and peaceful conversation with your son and maybe talk over a few little things about getting back together or whatever's going on in his life to make him comfortable with being in your presence again. Uh, obviously, the request for shared custody is going way too far, way too fast. We have to crawl before we can learn to walk. So I think what's going to happen is that I'm going to institute the phase-in plan in paragraph nine of the motion in this case. And I'm going to try to normalize things. I'm not going to require supervision. I find the whole supervised visitation thing to be untenable for any number of reasons. And based on what I've heard, you had a bad incident and it involved his mother. You two apparently don't get along very well. But what we're trying to do is look at the relationship between you and your son, and you have to make it work. Now, I don't expect that you let him get by with whatever behaviors he thinks he can get away with. He has to have discipline, but it has to be reasonable in its scope. You understand that, Mr. Ferguson? And you have to make Look. At, at this juncture, if you had a positive test for THC, I don't know what that would tell me, except that you're still continuing to use marijuana or its products. I don't think that that makes you a better parent. It certainly may make you a worse one. I would implore you to stop it and stop it completely. And I, I will say this. I don't want this young man exposed to this in any way, shape or form. It's harmful to him and harmful. I don't want you under the influence in any way anytime you're around him. Not to mention the fact that this use is illegal. And you're on probation. And I don't know why you'd want to take that chance to go to jail or lose rights to your son. So that's got to stop. Um, I want you to stay on top of this mice infestation thing. And if it takes outside intervention... From an extermination company, that's what you need to do. Okay? And you need to pay your child support as you've been ordered to do, at least to the best of your ability. And I can't believe that the best of your ability is zero. So after this McDonald's visit tonight, what well, I think the uh, parenting plan proposes Wednesday evening. So there will be a little break before next Wednesday before you exercise parenting time unsupervised with and interactive as they can be. And I'm, I'm going to also order the every other weekend unsupervised visitation. We need to see how this is gonna work, Mr. Ferguson. But I think that after two shorter visits, maybe it's time for you to start seeing your son on weekends. But I want a clean house. And obviously, you know what my opinions are regarding the mice issue. So. Uh, you've got to make sure that the place is cleaned up and ready for him each and every time. Uh, if he wants to call his mom during your your weekend visits, he should have the right to do so. Things are going with him. And a daily check-in visit, either initiated by your son or by her, seems in entirely proper to me. So you need to make sure that that's facilitated. I understand the request for testing, but again, I think my opinion is the, the, the presence of THC in the system that may be three to four months old doesn't necessarily tell in relatively short parenting time periods. Just as long as you're not smoking or under the influence when you're with him. And I do hope that you are getting regular UAs from your probation officer. I think he would be very interested in any 
violative behavior as would this court. All right. As far as exchanges is concerned, what, what is coming? to be peaceful and non-harassing as Mr. Uh, Patterson alluded to. Um, your All your communications between the two parents just need to be regarding your son. Anything else should go through your attorneys. Any other discussions you have about the case, which I hope someday gets toward a, a final resolution. This case is four and a half months old. So I hope the attorneys are at least working together on all of the other issues of this matter. And we are going to have a pretrial conference in this case on resolution of issues at that time. Your Honor, our order or our motion proposes that the parties would meet at Quick Trip in El Dorado. It's a public place. It's frequented by law enforcement officers, and we feel like it would be a safe and comfortable spot to exchange. That Any is opposition to that, Mr. Patterson? No opposition, Your Honor. All right. Very well. I find that to be appropriate. You might want to consider. All right. Mr. Ferguson, you've been restricted for a considerable period of time. The court has lifted many of those restrictions. You need to make it work, though between you and your son. I think he's going to look forward to spending time with you. I suspect he's missed you and missed you a lot. So I hope that you can identify the activities that you and he can do. ...with you as good as they can be. This has been tough on him, without a doubt. And the mother is just trying to look out for his interests. All right, Ms. Locke, is there any other aspect of the motion which you believe the court has not yet adequately addressed? No, Your Honor. And just for clarification, tonight will be... Correct. Uh, my only request would be at the pretrial conference, if Mr. Patterson and I don't have an announcement that the court would hear a report on how visitation would, is going and consider additional visitation at that time. The court will definitely want the report regarding how parenting time is going. Take under advisement whether this court would be inclined to expand any visitation rights after just three weeks. Is there anything else regarding clarification of the court's current orders that you need? Judge, I will prepare an order directly after this hearing, so I just want to make sure I do have it all correct. Um, I do have the this evening at uh, 6 p.m. McDonald's for one hour, um, but I wasn't trying to not listen to the court. I missed the other visitation, so I want to make sure I have that correct. What, what I was is going that? to put the responsibility. Ms. Locke, did you want him to do the order? I also appreciate his volunteerism. I'm sure Mr. Patterson and I can work together to make sure the order reflects. But if, if you need any further clarification from me. I, I did judge the, the after tonight, what was the next visitation the court was ordering? Next Wednesday. And that would be from what time to what time? Well, it's, it's set forth specifically in paragraph nine of the motion. Okay. That's And we're just talking about paragraph um, phase one at this point. I'm implementing implementing phase one, paragraph 9A of Ms. Locke's motion. And I will um, put that in there, Judge. And I just wanted to also follow up um, as to the provision of note current and the current. Peaceful 
by text and otherwise, and then in person for purposes of the child? Yes. Okay. And then uh, um, the court did in its recitation of uh, the general situation of the case stated that uh, discipline needs to be reasonable, that uh, there should be no legal drugs by either party and mice infestation should be um, managed. Or that the court did uh, make those orders also. Yes. I believe that's all I have, Judge. All right. Again, I'm sure Ms. Locke greatly appreciates you drafting an order promptly and getting it to her for her review. The sooner we get this order on file counsel, the better. And I do hope that the parties can communicate in a very reasonable way on anything that affects their son and his welfare. It's something you're going to have to do from for a long period of time. So I hope that you can start. Parents. So good luck in that regard. Again, we'll conduct further proceedings 4 o'clock p.m. on August the 26th. If there's nothing further, then the Ferguson matter will currently be in recess, and this meeting may be ended. This is in the District Court of Butler County, Kansas, case entitled, In the Matter of the Marriage of Jessica Ferguson and Timothy Ferguson, case number 2024-DM13. Uh, Darren Patterson appears. Uh, on behalf of the petitioner and with the petitioner, Jessica Ferguson, uh, Susan Locke appears as counsel for Timothy, who joins his attorney in her office. This matter comes before the court at this time for further proceedings. Mr. Patterson, where, where, where are we in this case and where do we need to go? Judge, there have been some recent discussions. I think I would defer to counsel to kind of... Uh, let us all know kind of whether we're closer or not. Sure, Judge, I think we have an agreement on a parenting schedule. Um, that would be the permanent parenting plan in the case. I think the only issue that we have a hiccup on is um, some marital property, uh, one piece of marital property in particular. Um, I'm hoping that Mr. Patterson and I can work that out and hopefully we can resolve this fully by agreement. All right, how much time will be necessary to finalize these negotiations and settlement? Judge, I would tell the court, based upon that statement by counsel, um, of course, this one piece of uh, property that's being discussed by counsel is a four-wheeler. It no longer exists. It's been sold. Um, and uh, so, um, but if we're going to get into that, then it gets into many other vehicles that we're going to allege the respondent has or disposed of, and we're going to get into a, a bigger mess at that point. So I'm hoping we don't have to get there. I'm hoping we can move on with our original settlement that was discussed and let those things lie and move on. But if not, then I probably do need to do some discovery real quick and, and get that out immediately. Um, we're talking several motor vehicles that we allege that uh, he had, and now they're missing. They've been moved. So something uh, fishy going on, but uh, I'm going to have to at least do some due diligence into those vehicles. Ms. Locke, any reply? Uh, yes, Your Honor. The, our concern is with a four-wheeler. Obviously, my contact, my client had a no-contact order with the petitioner when she first filed the petition. When he returned to the marital home, when he was finally able to do so, it was virtually empty and devoid of all marital assets, including a four-wheeler that he had built with his son. So the only thing that we're requesting is to know when and how the four-wheeler was sold and what the proceeds went to. Uh, Mr. Patterson has told me that the four-wheeler was sold, but we're just asking for some proof of the sale. A Facebook marketplace screenshot would suffice um, just so we know when and where it was sold. Uh, beyond that, we don't really have any other contentions. Obviously, we will if this we go into full-blown litigation, um, but just proof of the sale of the four-wheeler would be sufficient for our purposes. Why would that be a problem, Mr. Patterson? It's not, Judge. In fact, I have emailed Ms. Locke with that information. Um, my client, uh, and I'm going to 
Look at my emails real quick. My client sold it February 17, 2024 on Facebook Marketplace. I'm, I've never done Facebook Market, so I had to ask her how that works. And basically, she puts an ad on Facebook. She got a response. She made the sale. Then she deleted the ad because you don't want to continue to get people to call you, contact you. It's gone. She doesn't have that ability to print out a Facebook ad at this point. But... She did take that money. Um, part of it was used to pay a water bill, which she has the receipt for. It was the party's water bill from where they live that she had to get um, paid. And she said it was around uh, $200 total over se- that was several months worth. And then also the rest of it was deposited into my client's mother's account because my client didn't have checks. And we can get that canceled check or deposit probably. And then uh, a check was written out to Steve Waite, who was their landlord, and we can get that canceled check, um, which accounts for all she sold it for. So we can provide that. But beyond that, Judge, I'm not sure why that is going to be an impediment to getting this case settled. Well, if that documentation is readily available, it should be provided to the opposing party upon their request. Sure. So hopefully you can do that, you know, here in due course, Mr. Patterson, a little yeah. bit of work. And then maybe uh, Ms. Lock and her client would then be satisfied that uh, the, the uh, sales proceeds went to a uh, legitimate purpose. Yes, Judge, we'll, we'll provide those. All right. I don't perceive that we need to set a uh, hearing too far down the line before we can perhaps review this case for uh, perhaps the final time and have a final hearing. So I'm going to go ahead and set a date in September, if I have one. Monday mornings don't work well for Mr. Patterson. He is a big contract responsibility on that day. I'm sure my assistant will straighten me out if she's uh, booked anything here at this time. Friday, September the 27th. Almost exactly a month from where we are. Judge, I apologize. Um, I am in Florida with my son for an engagement party. All right, that's fine, Mr. Patterson. I hope you enjoy yourself. Sure you will. Uh, Again, Mandy, do we have Tuesday, October 1 at 3? I trust you'll be back, Mr. Patterson. Yes, sure. Okay. October Judge, 1 to 3 work for you, Ms. Locke? I am on the sync docket at 3. Okay. Um, I'm available earlier in the afternoon if the court is. Can't do earlier in the afternoon. Um, perhaps yeah. 1130 that morning, Tuesday, October 1 at 1130. I, I can do that. Also on the sync docket. Okay. All right. Hate setting this too far out, but I start running into jury trial settings, both civil and criminal. Um, the judicial conference. So, when is the judicial conference, Judge? Judicial conference council is October 10 and 11. Thank you. Closed for a holiday on the 14th. Uh, Tuesday, October 15, now uh, at 4 o'clock. I'm open. I am not available, but we will have another attorney in our office at that time, and I will have him cover the hearing so that it doesn't have to get bumped out so far. But hopefully Mr. Patterson and I are in agreement and 
he's the only one taking testimony of his client. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate that accommodation, uh, Ms. Locke. I'll set uh, further hearings in this Ferguson matter for Tuesday, October 15, 4 o'clock p.m. Again by Zoom. And I, uh, again, encourage parties to exchange information and further confer to try to reach a total resolution of all issues in the case. And we'll look at the case again Tuesday, October 15, 4 o'clock. That will be a Zoom proceeding. Thank you, Judge. Patterson, anything further at this time? No, Your Honor. No, Your Honor. Locked, anything further? Okay. Then uh, the Ferguson matter will currently be in recess, and this meeting may be ended for all this time. Have a good afternoon, folks. Thank you. They say the only things in life that are guaranteed are death and taxes. I think they should add messy child support hearings to that as well. They never go smoothly. In the matter of the marriage of Thayer, 19 DM 197, announce appearances. Jennifer Harper appears on behalf of DCF. All right, you are Clayton Thayer? Yes. Okay. Mr. Thayer, I can't tell. Do you have a hat? Is that a hat or a... No, sorry, it's a headband. All right, yeah, we're... I understand. Sorry. I apologize. That's, okay. That's fine. Um, it's... It happens frequently, and uh, yeah. but this is actually a court of law, so we do have some. We still have to follow some dress codes. So anyway, yeah, I, I apologize. Your apologies accepted. All right, we are uh, uh, on for a contempt citation. The court reviewed the order filed back, um, I think, on March eighth, um, which was the original contempt order where the defendant agreed he was in contempt and certain promises were made to purge himself. So where are we at, Ms. Harper? Well, Your Honor, since that time, we've continued to work with Mr. Thayer, including, as you see, there's a motion for modification in there. Correct. However, payments have still not been coming in. The last payment that was made was on April 2nd of this year. Okay. So at this point, we are requesting that an attorney be appointed for him. Okay. Ms. Sherry, let's talk about that request. you know what that means? Yes. Well, I what think you, so. Tell me what you think it means. I uh, just, are they going to represent me? I, I'm guessing, or I, I don't, don't know. know. I guess I don't okay. know what it means. All right. Here's what she's, the reason um, Ms. Harper is asking that you be appointed counsel is she's going to ask that you be placed in jail. Um. Failure to abide, you 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 can't be put in jail in the United States for being in debt, but you can be put in jail for failing to comply with a court order. Yeah. You have a court order for child support. You are not in compliance. You've admitted that. You have failed to live up to the promises you made at the last hearing to purge yourself of that contempt. So now she feels her only remedy is to ask that you be placed in jail. The court is very hesitant to do that, but the court has done it in the past. Uh, but an attorney would get, give you a chance to be represented, to advocate and argue why you should not be placed in jail for failing to abide by the court order. Here's the practical effect of it. You have to pay for the lawyer. The, the, the county, unfortunately, and this is the bizarre thing in Kansas, uh, the taxpayers have to pay for your lawyer, and they deserve to be reimbursed because this isn't their problem. Well, directly their problem. However, it's the only uh, avenue we have. So I will order you to pay those legal fees. So not only are you still going to owe all the back child support, you're going to owe the child support that's due and coming payable in the future, but now we're going to add an attorney fee to it. Uh, and you need to understand that that, I'm not saying that's what I'll do, put you in jail, but that's the remedy that Ms. Harper is going to seek. Okay. okay? I understand. You do. Okay. So, um, Unless you can come up with something right now that says, oh, judge, now I'm taking this serious and I'm going to make a large payment and continue to make payments. I'm I'm going to when we conclude this hearing, going to reach out and try to find a lawyer to represent you and appoint an attorney at your expense. Okay. Um, so, 
Sorry. So, you know, sorry, I, I, I'm sure you're sincere, but sorry just doesn't cut it right now. Oh, no, I, I meant I thought I was interrupting you. Oh, oh, no, no, that's all right. Uh, so what do you want to do? Uh, I want to pay and I want to get caught up and everything. It's I I can make every excuse in the world, but there's been a lot of things going on, especially the past two months. And I know I haven't been good about it, but the past two months have been just really bad. My dad had a massive heart attack about two months ago, and he died about a week and a half ago. And I've been trying to take care of family matters and my mom and my dad's business, and he did not have health insurance or life insurance. So I'm trying to figure out all that. And I haven't had, I haven't been able to work because I've been in Kansas City. I've been in Hayes. I just haven't had an opportunity to breathe that doesn't give an excuse for all the other times i understand that but I, i'm not willingly trying not to pay it i hope you understand that there's just certain things that's happened and i can tell you uh i was engaged to a, a woman i was with her for about four years and she had three kids, and then we had one of our own. And her ex-husband never paid child support, and this is not this is not an excuse for me. But they live with me, and I had all their expenses to deal with, too. And like I said, I know that's not an excuse for me, but that was just what I was dealing with. And that's not an issue anymore because they're no longer here or living with me, so I don't have to pay for any of their stuff or feel obliged to pay for any of their stuff. I just, I guess I'm just going to ask if you could just give me a chance to prove that I can pay it a, a month or whatever you deem fit. And just, I mean, if we can do that and I can prove to you that I'm going to pay it and I'm going to be sincere about it. I just want a chance, and I know I've give, gotten a lot of chances, but I'm just asking for one more, please. Well, Ms. Thayer, um, uh, life is full of those kinds of events and circumstances, all right? The fact, you know, I'm going to be, it's going to sound sarcastic, but here's, here's the reality. You were supporting some other person's children while your yeah. two children went without support. That is not something that the court's going to condone. I think by my looking at this, You've got roughly your children are 15 and 12, somewhere in that range. Yeah. And, um, you know, they haven't had any support for a long period of time. So uh, now I hope to, I hope to, I, I hope to win the lottery tonight, but I don't really have a realistic expectation that that's going to happen. And I sure I'm not going to plan my finances over around that. So give me a plan. Give me something concrete. You, you, you promised to pay, I think, $200 a month. Was that right, Ms. Harper? 200 200 every two weeks, I believe. But since it got modified, I, I'm supposed to pay $450 a month and I think $150 in back for the back child support. Well, back in, uh, in March... On March 8th, he was ordered to pay $100 a week. Is that right, Ms. Harper? I believe so, Your Honor. Give me one second. And, and then let me look and see if that was modified. It, and there was an order modifying child support and $450 a month. He was ordered to pay at that time, and that was in July. Uh, and would that have been just for current and nothing towards arrears? That is just his current payment, yes. Okay. Um, and that was based upon Mr. Thayer making roughly, I'm not even sure if that's close, somewhere around minimum wage, uh, not very much money, 26000 a year. Um, so, and then... We continued the hearing back in... Uh, I signed the order in August, but 
we continued about a month ago to give him a chance to purge himself and he's not making payment. So, Mr. Thayer, I hope to do this. I hope to prove it. I got to have something more than hope. What, what, what is your, what, what, what do you usually work in? What's your employment generally? Well, I, are you asking? I, I'm self-employed, which I worked for part-time for my dad. And since he's Good gone, luck. construction work, painting, oh. that, that kind of stuff. But uh, I mean, I got back to work last week and. Who are you, you know, working? I, I'm working for myself. Okay. It's my understanding that the construction industry, they're they're looking for skilled labor and they're paying substantial. I, I understand. Successful ind independently. Why don't you go get a job? Well, I understand that, but my mom is relying on me because she is running the construction company now and I have to be the one that holds it because she has no other avenue. Okay. And how is your mom going to do that if you're sitting in jail? That's why I'm asking for a chance, sir. That's not a chance, Mr. Thayer. I understand it. But that is not a plan. I got to have, you You can't just say, I'm going to pay this and not pay it, and then come back and say, oh, gee, I had these circumstances. Please give me another chance. You got to give us, Ms. Harper, particularly in the court, something more concrete to rely on. Because you've been making promises now for... I mean, since March, and you haven't fulfilled them. You haven't made a I, payment since April. That's I understand, by August. Well, so, how am I supposed to, what What am I supposed to do to give you concrete evidence? I mean, I don't, what, what do you want me to do? Well, uh, I want you to give me something that I can, if you went to a bank, you think they'd say, okay, here, let me give you some money on, on, a, on a promise of hope. Okay, so what am I supposed to do? Payments coming in, what's your budget, what's your... I mean, you got to show us something. I mean, that's what you would do if you went to a bank. You would sit down and you would show them, here's here's current con uh, contracts I've got. Here's the payment schedule. Here's my expenses. Here's my net. Here's what I can apply. That's what you do in business. That's what we're talking okay. about. Well, if you want to know about my business, I can tell you about my business. Is, is that what you want me? Or? I want, and, and out of that, we'd have to determine what you can pay and when you can pay it. Not, I hope to get this taken care of. You see the difference? Not entirely. I, well, I mean, maybe that's why you shouldn't be self-employed because that's what I'm getting at. You, you have to understand, Mr. Thayer, I'm not here to argue with him. I'm saying this is a business thing. You have got to perform. If you fail to perform, you owe a debt. A debt, yeah. the only debt you owe that could put you in jail. You have to come forward with a concrete plan with documentation to back it up so that me acting as a banker or loan officer could sit down and say, yes, this is a secure, this is a secure payment plan for a loan and obligation that the person has. Okay. That's the so, way the world works. Okay. So can I give you a budget plan or uh, a business plan and submit okay. it into you? Um. I'm going to ask. I mean, obviously, Ms. don't have I'm it. Gonna, at I'm going to ask Miss Harper, um, based on our conversation, whether she still wants to appoint a lawyer or if she wants to give you the opportunity to come in with a concrete plan that you're going to present to her to satisfy her that you're going to make payments in the future, not only to satisfy your current support obligation, which is most important, but also to start paying towards the arrearage, Miss Harper. Because otherwise, we're just going to have a hearing 30 days from now. You're going to say, gee, Judge, I hope to get this done. Gee, Judge. I, and and she's going to say, put him in jail. So I put you in jail. I mean, you're not making payments anyway, so we don't lose anything, um, quite frankly. Right. So, uh, And you can say, well, yeah, but then I can't work. But what difference does it make to us? You're not making payments anyway. Yeah, well, I don't. I don't. I, 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 what am I supposed to say? I can't argue with you. I know because I'm 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 the judge, but also because you know I'm right. I mean, you know that that's what you got to do. So, Miss Harper, what do you want to do? Do you want to give it thirty days for him to provide to you a concrete, reliable plan to make these payments, or do you want to just schedule thirty days out, run up an attorney fee, and ask to put him in jail? You tell me. 
you have every right to do that. I'm, I'm, I just don't know. I, I'm, this is, you know, from doing this, you do this full time. This is always the court's dilemma. Put him in jail, but in jail, all he costs the taxpayers 35 to 50 bucks a day to feed him and keep him over there. Um, and we, and you know, and yes, it, it puts a scare in him, but we don't get any money out of it. Your Honor, I've spoken with Mr. Thayer multiple, well, multiple times. And the basic conversation you had today is a conversation we basically have every time where I warn him not paying could result in going to jail. He makes promises to pay. Yeah. He says, I have things lined up so that I can pay. And then when we come back, it's, well, there are circumstances that changed. When asked about employment, he stated, well, he has to be self-employed because, you know, he has to support or help his mother. But that means that he's not helping and supporting his children who he has an actual obligation to support. Correct. This has been going on so long. I think we do need to go ahead and have an attorney appointed because I do fear that we'll come back in 30 days and it'll be the same song and dance. Well, I agree with you, but what I'm going to do is this. Mr. Thayer, I couldn't be any more clear on what you need to do. You call Miss Miss Harper and you say, boy, I sure hope to get it done in this next month, but boy, I've had some other circumstances. I had a bill come in or I had this or I had that. Everybody's got it. Okay. I got to plan a budget with my wife. I got five kids. Okay. Uh, and I'm still supporting some of them, even though they're adults, because they're still in school. And I have to set a budget out and I have to make my payments. Okay. I got loans. I got a service every month. All right. So you're going to do what a majority of the people in this country do. And that is you are going to put together a concrete plan and you are going to present it to Ms. Harper and say, Sandy, go ahead and find us a new court date about 30 days out. And you're going to, and Ms. Harper, I'm going to ask if after he furnishes it to you and you ask him questions that you forward to me what the plan is. And we're going to sit down 30 days from now, Mr. Thayer, and I'm going to tell you as your banker, whether it's satisfactory or I'm going to call the note due. You understand? Then you're not going to be able to support your mom. You're not going to be able to support your kids. And you're going to meet a whole bunch of people over in the jail. You're not going to like to associate with, but that's eventually what the result's going to be. But I'll appoint you a lawyer 30 days from now. We're just kicking the can down the road. Then you're going to have a legal bill. You're going to have to add to that uh, list of obligations. And we're going to have a final hearing. So we're going to stretch it out. We're going to buy you a little time. You better make productive use of it. So 30 days, within the next 30 days, before the next hearing, you must provide a concrete plan. And this is going to include, these are the jobs I currently have. This is the payment schedule on these jobs. And I know if you're doing construction, you got to pay for materials. And you may even have to pay for some subcontracts. I don't know. You're going to set all that out for Ms. Harper so you can look at it and say, okay, he's got a payment due on such and such a date, and he's going to sign this much of the payment to his current child support, as well as potentially some of the back. I think the current's more important than the arrears. We can work on that over time. But if she comes to me and says what she said today, judge, it's just the same song and dance. I'll appoint a lawyer at the next hearing. We'll set another hearing 30 days out, and you can start planning to pack your toothbrush and, and items because you you know where you're going to be checking into. You understand? I, I can't. Be, I can't be any clearer. So we're going to let you buy some time. You can either make productive use of it or uh, know the consequences could be severe. So you've got to provide it to Ms. Harper to her satisfaction. She will send it to me. And I may disagree with her a little bit, but I want to, you know, or she may say, I think it's good. And I'm going to say, no, I don't think it's fine tuned enough. I want something concrete. And that means specific facts. I want to know who the contract is you're working for. I want to know what the payment is. I want to know when the payment is due. I want to know future contracts you have on the horizon. I want to know when those are going to pay out. I want to know what the net is to you. I want to, you know, and yes, and guess who's going to come first? Your child support. Then comes your mom. Okay. Understood? I understand. I okay. understand. All right. So we'll give you a little time, but now we're all have a clear understanding of where we're going. So uh, I appreciate it. I appreciate it very much. Okay. Um, what about September 30th at nine, Jennifer? Uh, it's all that's only 20, 24 days. What's the next? What do we have? We have anything in October? 
Um, I, I could do the 16th, like at 930. Well, no, I can't. No, 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 let's not. Hold on. Hold on. What about the 7th? Like at 1.30, that's actually criminal motion day, but we could squeeze this in because there's something that's available. Yeah. yeah, I don't, yeah. How would that work, Ms. Harper? October 7th at 1.30? Uh-huh. Yes, I'm available. Okay, Perfect. let's do that. Mr. Thayer, you've now got 31 days to put this together. Uh, in fact, don't present it that day to Ms. Harper. So I'm going to order no. you to have a concrete plan to her. Let's talk about that, Ms. Harper. I want to set up some, I ask you to put this in a journal entry. Um, what do you need, two weeks to um, to review this and maybe contact Mr. Thayer about any questions you have? Would that be sufficient? Yes, or, Your Honor, should be. Okay. You're going to have your plan to her by the 23rd of September. Okay. That's a that's now, a month. Am I supposed to come in and do it personally or over email or how whatever Ms. Harper, whatever Ms. Harper says? It would be best to do that during email, Your Honor. Okay. Not in the actual office all that often. Right. You're gonna email her. You got an I I want to know, you're gonna have to list like these are these are my average monthly expenses that are dedicated that are, you know, you also have to be able to pay your you your lights and your uh and, and a grocery bill. I understand that because you got to eat to continue to work. Reasonable expenses are fine, but you got to set it all out. And there's an affidavit that we use, it's called domestic relations affidavit. Um, well, probably want to get one that's the full full one so you could. I want to look at if you're going to claim all these expenses, I want to know what they are. Yeah. You know, uh, in other words, and I, I throw this out. In other words, if your expenses are I need to buy cigarettes and and snowballs at serves, no, 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 no. Okay. That um this, you know, if I gotta buy bread and, and water and milk, then that's fine. But uh you gotta set that out. Miss Harper, can you have an email address, uh, Mr. Thayer? Yeah, she's got emailed before. Okay, so email yeah. before. So you're going to email stuff to her, and you're going to have a concrete plan to her with documentation to back it up, just like you're dealing with a banker by the 23rd of September. That way, she can get in touch with you with any questions, and we will all meet again on October 7th at 1:30. All right. And that's the drop dead date. Yep. Very good, Miss Harper. If you'll uh, prepare a short journal entry from today. And I will wish you good luck with Mr. Thayer. And Mr. Thayer, I'm going to wish you good luck, too. I want this thing to work out. I really do. I'm not in here to start nitpicking and finding a way to put you in jail. I want you out working, making money, and making payments. But I, I can't rely. I'm not going to hold off doing uh, the sanctions on a promise of hope. Yeah, I understand. Okay, very good. All right. Ms. Harper, anything else for today? No, Your Honor. All right. Mr. Thayer? Good luck, yep. uh, Harper. Good luck, and I'll see everybody on October seventh. All right. I see uh, Victoria Dort is here. Can you hear me, ma'am? I know you're muted right now, but I can. Okay. Oops, I can All right, Mister Roll, Christopher Roll. Can you hear me, sir? You're muted as well, but I just want to make sure you can hear. There we go. There we go. Okay. I can hear you now. Yeah. Okay. All right. And Mr. Johnson, obviously you're here from DHHS. Um, and I'm not saying he needs to be here. Is Mr. Sommerfeld here? No, he's not here today. Okay. And that's fine. We can go ahead with this. Um, could you raise your right hand, please? Do you solemnly swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give in this matter will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so I hope you got it. I do. All right. Um, what I'm going to indicate to Ms. Dort and Mr. Roll, I'm going to have Mr. Johnson just start with a little bit before he goes into the bulk of things. Um, I'll have some questions for you. 
But Mr. Johnson, you uh, work for Department of Health and Human Services here in Otsego County, is that correct? That's correct. And you, your agency filed a petition with this court um, concerning Genevieve? Correct. Genevieve Amelia Roll, all right. And how old is Genevieve? Yep. Uh, she is two years old. All right. Um, there's other children as well. Well, let me ask you this. What are you seeking at this point? I'll, we'll go through the petition in a minute, but what are you ultimately asking? We're all, we are we are requesting that we remove Genevieve Roll from the care of Victoria Dort and Christopher Roll. Okay. Are, and I note in the petition there are other children. Are they in that household as well? They are not. They are with their biological fathers. They have full custody through front of the court. All right. And Ms. Dort and Mr. Roll are the mother and father of uh, Genevieve? Gwen, yep. Okay. All right. All right. Um, so I'm going to have these questions for you, um, Ms. Dort and Mr. Roll, but, and this is what's called an inquiry hearing. This is a child protective proceedings. It is not a criminal procedure. You do have certain rights I'm going to go through. You both have the same rights. You have the right to an attorney. One will be appointed for you. It will be a separate attorney, one for Ms. Dort, one for Mr. Roll. Um, there will also be an attorney appointed to represent Genevieve um, in this matter. This is simply an inquiry hearing, and uh, Mr. Johnson is asking for a removal portion of it. And we won't go too far in this hearing because there isn't an attorney here to represent you, but I do have to address the removal portion first. Um, so, Ms. Dort, have you received a copy of the petition that Department of Health and Human Services has filed? Yes. All right. Have you read it? Yes. If you wanted me to, I would read it to you now. If you say, no, I've read it and I've understand it, that's fine. I believe I understand okay. the majority. Right. And if I do have be... questions, I can reach out and ask. And your attorney, and you're, you know, basically the reason I'd be reading it is to make sure you understand it, not necessarily whether you agree with it or not. That's not what this hearing is about, but and just that you understand it. Some questions you'll have, I couldn't answer because I can't give legal advice, but you'd be able to talk to your attorney on. Okay. All right. Um, Mr. Roll, um, you would agree you are the father of Genevieve? Yes. All right. Um, do you have a copy of the petition? I do. Have you read it? I have, and I understand it. You want me to read it to you or not? No, no, I understand. Okay, all right. And once again, you can discuss if you have specific questions, you can discuss those with your attorney. We'll be telling you when the next hearing date on this is at near the end of the hearing. But Mr. Johnson, could you indicate to the court why you are seeking removal and what um, efforts have been made by um, the agency or otherwise to prevent the removal of Genevieve? Yep. <clears throat> so the department filed a petition for removal, removing Genevieve from Victoria and Christopher yesterday um, due to reoccurring alcohol use and domestic violence. Um, so we first got involved with Victoria and Chris in December of 2023. Um, that was the first complaint regarding the alcohol use and domestic violence in front of the children. Um, that was opened as a CPS ongoing case. Um, ongoing services were provided. Um, and then in, I believe it was April of 2024, we received another complaint, another CPS investigation regarding Victoria and Christopher regarding the same alcohol use and domestic violence. Um, in that case, Christopher was arrested for domestic violence. Um, we had an ongoing case. I believe we closed early August. I think it was August 15th. Um, and then as of yesterday, we received a new CPS complaint regarding alcohol use and domestic violence in front of the children between Victoria and Christopher. Um, so yesterday we filed a petition removing um, Genevieve from the care of Victoria and Christopher um, due to the domestic violence and then um, their substance use with alcohol use. All right, and where is Genevieve now? Uh, she's placed at a local foster home. Okay, 
All right. And, you know, beyond the ongoing investigation of the police involvement uh, that there's been in this, have there been any other services that have been provided to either or both parents? Yes. Um, Victoria participated in an inpatient rehab facility. I think it's New Hope. Um, she also worked with Catholic Human Services for outpatient substance use. Um, she attended AA services. Um, she worked with the Women's Resource Center. Um, and Christopher worked with Second Chance um, individual and group sessions for counseling. All right. Um, I'm not familiar with Second Chance. Is that an alcohol or substance abuse? rehabilitation place uh i believe it, it it covers group sessions and individual counseling i think it covers a little bit of everything okay but it does deal with substance abuse and alcohol at least yep. part of it is that okay all right all right well um ms dort and mr roll this is what's called a removal hearing it is not the inquiry hearing or is it it's a part of the inquiry hearing, but it, I can't complete the inquiry hearing until your attorney is here. I have hearings on these things fairly quickly. I'm going to ask Ms. Huff, who's the juvenile registrar, can we have a hearing on this Tuesday? All right. Okay. There will be a hearing scheduled on this on September 17th. We will talk about parenting time between Genevieve and you in a minute. Um, and I'll hear what Mr. Johnson is proposing. But I've been asked uh, for the removal, and I'm not here to say whether or not the alcohol use and domestic violence occurred or didn't occur. That's not the time for this. Um, but as to the removal, Ms. Dort, is there anything you wanted to say at this point? Um, no, I agree. I do agree with the removal, and I appreciate it. CPS because right. they're there for a reason, <laughs> you know. For sure. So okay. All right, that's fine. And I don't want you to go into the details, but the fact that you agree, uh, you know, I, I appreciate hearing that. Mr. Roll, do you have any statements you wanted to make at this point? No, I understand why. I agree with it, but I understand why. Okay. All right. Uh, the the court does find it would be contrary to Genevieve's welfare to remain in the home and will order um, the removal. I do find that is outlined by Mr. Johnson as to both parents there have been reasonable efforts to prevent the removal, including ongoing um, CPS cases, uh, law enforcement involvement, Catholic Human Services, um, inpatient treatment, AA, Women's Resource Center, and uh, Second Chance, another rehabilitation place. Um, so the court will order that. Mr. Johnson, um, as to parenting time between now and the 17th, uh, which we're looking at about two and a half weeks, I can address parenting time again on the 17th if necessary. But what is your proposal between now and then? So I will be in touch with both Victoria and Christopher. Uh, we'll schedule parenting time within the next seven days. All right. Um, do you believe, Mr. Johnson, do you believe that they could? have that parenting time together or should it be one for Ms. Dort and another? For it, will, it would have to be separate due to the, the domestic violence. Sure. All right. Okay. Um, and so I'm going to order that, um, that that take place. I will review it again on the 17th and you can talk to Mr. Johnson between now and then. You could also talk to your attorneys. Usually we're able to come up with an agreement, but if not, you know, I can make a decision. If um, you think it should be more, they should think it should be less. Uh, but so you understand, though, that it would be separate, Ms. Dort. Your time would be your time with Genevieve. Mr. Roll, your time would be your time um, yes. with Genevieve. Okay. I have their attorneys yeah. assigned if they want their information. Okay. Um, we know who your attorneys will be. And if you have that, uh, they're not going to know anything about the case because they would not have received it yet. We'll give you their name and telephone number if you each have a pen and paper ready. And remember, it'll be separate numbers or separate attorneys. Yes. So go ahead. Uh, Christopher's is going to be Larry Brown. All right. Mr. Roll, yours is Larry Brown, and his telephone number is 517 398 3188. 3188. 
Three one eight eight are the last four digits. Thank you. All right, and David Delaney would be your attorney, Ms. Dort. And actually, I don't have nine eight nine seven three one seven three one fifteen oh eight. All right, thank you. All right, so if you both have those, once again, they're not going to know anything about the case yet at this point, but we'll be sending out paperwork and you can still call them um, and leave a message and we'll see where we are. Um, I want to once again stress that this is not a criminal case. It is a child protective proceedings. Uh, also yep. that the HHS is not seeking termination of parental rights. They're seeking reunification. Are the two of you still acting as a couple or not? And it doesn't matter to me. I'm just we have here. been. Um, we have been. And if you're not, if you're not sure, yeah, I'm not going to put you on the spot. Let me do. We can talk about that later. But it, that would really have to deal with reunification at that point. So. But the okay. whole idea is if there is a problem to get assistance in resolving the problem, once again, it's a child protective proceeding. It's not okay. a criminal case. Okay. All right. And I've discussed your rights with you. You do have an additional right that attaches with the removal order that I am signing today. You have the right to appeal um, this, even this order today. And if you wish to appeal it, you could. Um, the if you could contact the probate or the juvenile registrar would get you the information on that. If you could not afford an attorney for the appeal, one would be appointed for you. If you could not afford transcripts or other documents, copies of those would be provided to you free of charge. I'm just advising you of that. I'm not saying you should or shouldn't do that. You can also discuss that with your attorneys if you wanted to. Ms. Dort, do you have any questions? I do not. Mr. Roll, do you have any questions? I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, my hear. only question is, is, can you hear me? Go ahead. Yeah, I can hear you now. Okay. okay. The only issue, uh, I believe Larry Brown represented Victoria in the first domestic violence. I don't know if that'll make a difference here. Was, were you charged with domestic violence, Ms. Dort? No. She was not. You, were you charged with domestic violence, Mr. Roll? Yes, I. Okay, and was Mr. Was Mr. Brown your attorney? No, it was Gary Gilo. I I I thought Victoria had told me that Larry well, Brown. She would not have had. She would not have had an attorney in that. Has Mr. Brown, to your knowledge, Ms. Dort, ever represented you on anything? Um, when I had an OWI last June or two Junes okay. ago. Right. Well, just to be on the safe side, I don't anticipate any problem, but I'm just going to right. change the two attorneys because they don't have any knowledge of this case whatsoever. Mr. Delaney will represent um, you, Ms. Dort, and Mr. I'm sorry, Mr. Delaney. Okay, would represent Mr. Delaney will represent Christopher Roll. Yeah, okay. Larry Brown. Will yours will be um Mr. Roll, yours will be Mr. Delaney. Um Ms. Dort, yours will be Mr. Brown. Do you guys probably need those numbers again? Yes, please. <laughs> All right. Yes, and please. so ma'am, Larry Brown's number is 517-398-3188. All right, thank you. And if you could give Mr. Roll, Mr. Delaney's number. Okay, Mr. Roll, Mr. De David Delaney's number is 989-731-1508. Okay, well, thank you, Mr. Johnson. Anything else? No, at this time. Okay, thank you very much. We'll see folks on the 17th. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Um, do you have, hold on one more second. Do we have do you have addresses for them? Um, no, for her I do. For him, I do. Okay, um, sir. What is your address that we should use for mailing purposes?
Welcome back. All right. Okay. Um, there we go. All right. We are here in the matter of Scroggins versus Pearl, case number 17-011110DS. Uh, I have Ms. Scroggins available. Mr. Pearl did not show up. This matter was set for a hearing at 930. It's now 948. Um, Ma'am, I've read your motion. Yes, it's kind of all kind of all over the place. You got a lot of concerns. And yes, you've, atta yes. you've attached some pictures that validate those concerns, but I have no idea what you're asking for. <laughs> um, so I was told I know no one can really make no one do anything, but I, I need a lot. I need help um, with Mr. Pearl. I, I just would like for him to be able to do 50% of his parenting. Um, like I'm, I'm there for my son all the time, but it's so, so hard. I got a special needs son. He requires a right. lot of attention, attention and everything. And, I can't have Mr. Pearl um, jumping in and out. It's either he come 50-50 with me and or just leave us alone because every time I allow him to jump in and out, it's, it's a setback to my kid, and it's a setback right. for me. It's like a dictation thing that he's trying to do. Uh, and well, at, at, at this point in time, you have total control of parenting time. You can not let him yeah. have it or you can let him have it. It's by your discretion. He has zero parenting time, according to the court orders. Yes, sir. He does that. That had been, I, that, I, that had been entered since 2017. Mm -hmm. So for seven years, he's had zero. All parenting time is at your discretion. So if you don't feel mm -hmm. it's in the best interest of your child, you can just not do it. But I see. I I don't want because uh, my son is like, uh, but mom, he's my dad, okay. and I'm oh, oh, okay. Do you want me to send this to the front of the court for a parenting time? Yes, sir. Okay, that I can do. I can't make him a good father, though. I know. That's the only unfortunate part about it. Um, so, but, so, like, once the friend of the court get it, does that mean he will have to stand up to it, or it's just, like, it's just I something that was put I in can't, him? That's, I can't make him do it. Right. That's why he said that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Which is why I leave, you know, right now, it's at your discretion. If I send it to the front of the court, there is going to be court ordered time. If he doesn't use it, then I will take it away and we'll be back back to at your discretion. Well, um, okay. Right now you have so control. Is there, is there any way that I can um that I can get it to where he could just leave us alone? Is it, Again, is there any way I can it, it's it? at your discretion, which means if you tell him no, I'm not giving you any, then it's gonna force him to file a, a motion to see if he wants parenting time. Okay. And he's gonna to have to show the court why that's imperative. And he's going to have to tell, and I'll be able to tell him, look, dude, you asked for parenting time. I will grant it specifically, but you better utilize it and be a parent mm -hmm. on that time. Yes, sir. I don't think he's going to do it because that's why he stated uh, the court and people can't make him do this, can't make no. him do that. But, but you can also yeah. tell him then there's no parenting time. Okay, so this is my, my problem. Now, if I don't do this part, I can be like, okay, I got All full right. custody. Would you, would you, yeah, do you want me to suspend it until further order? Yeah, but if you, you, you put it, enough, you put some things in here that were very concerning about his treatment of the child. So yes, I can't, yes. with what your allegations are in your petition, I can suspend his parenting time. I don't like to do that because, again, you have total control. It's right. reasonable as you agree. So in other words, if yes. I suspend it, then you don't have a choice to say your kid wants to see his dad. So, you know, you don't have the choice to say, I'll, I'll, you know, it's Christmas gone over because I'm suspending it. Right now you have that ability. You can tell him no, you can tell him yes. You have control okay. of this, not him. All right. But, but that's the thing. Like, I want him to be able to take the city, I, but see, I, if he's not going to do it. Then it's just a waste of my time too. But I would well, like for him not to be. Able and, and, and obviously, fifty-fifty is too much for him to handle, because yeah. he doesn't want to. And when he right, does, right, right. there is some concerning activity that he engaged in that may be detrimental to the child. Right. So I really just wanted to just leave us alone. Like I don't want to be able to call me at any time of okay. the night and say again. I you, want to you've, talk to you, you've you've put enough in here and said that I can suspend his parenting time if that is your request. You just yes, made no re you, you just made no request. You gave me all this stuff and you didn't tell me what you really wanted. <laughs> Possibly from talking to you because you don't really know what you want. Right, right, right. I'm just trying to get it to where if he can't I, I I'd ability, like him to have parenting time, but I I also want the child to be safe and it doesn't look like he's been safe with his father. He's been yes. injured. 
Yes, sir. All right. I can suspend it and we'll see what happens. All right. Oh, okay. All right. All right. Well, thank you and have a good weekend. Thank you. You too. Take care. Okay. Hearing cause number DF 24042265 Grissom and Fletcher. With the parties in the Grissom and Fletcher matter, please unmute yourselves, turn your cameras on, and raise your right hands. Do each of you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give in this cause will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Ms. Fletcher? Uh, yes, I do. Mr. Grissom? Yes. All right, you may both lower your hands, and Ms. Peoples, you may proceed. Thank you, Judge. We're on an order and suit affecting the parent-child relationship. Judge, parties agree to all issues except for the visitation schedule. If I could read the terms of the agreed order and then, then take testimony, Judge. You may. Thank you, Judge. It's one child before the court. Elijah Grissom, I'd offer the acknowledgement of paternity. As States Exhibit A. States Exhibit A is admitted. Thank you, Judge. Parties are in agreement to be appointed as joint managing conservators of the child with the mother having the right to maintain the residence in Dallas or any surrounding counties. Parties are in agreement as far as the child support and medical support that health insurance would be provided by the father, Mr. Grissom, through his employment. Parties agree that dental insurance would also be provided by the father through his employment. Parties are in agreement to child support of $731 a month beginning October 1st, 2024. Parties are in agreement to a retroactive child support judgment from December 15th, 2023 until today, September 5th, 2024 in the amount of $6,914. Mr. Grissom is to pay that at $100 a month beginning October 1st, 2024. Court costs would be as billed to Mr. Grissom. There is a request for a non-disclosure for the mother, Ms. Fletcher, and that is the extent of the order, Judge. You may call um, your oh, person. and I'm sorry, parties do agree to meet at the Woody Smokehouse um, at 1021 Center in Centerville, Texas, for the exchanges. Okay. And that's the extent of the order. Okay. You may call if your I, first witness. Thank you, Judge. I'll call the mother, Miss Fletcher. Can you state your full name? Darren Fletcher. And Miss Fletcher, did you hear all the terms of the order that were stated to the court? Yes. And did you understand all of those terms that were stated? Yes. Are you in agreement with the stated terms and believe they're in the best interest of your child? Yes. Right. As far as um, the visitation schedule for Elijah, you're wanting some form of um, supervised visits in the beginning. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. Okay. And so you're wanting that Mr. Grissom would have three months of supervised visits? That's correct. Why are you asking for the visits to be supervised? Well, one, because Elijah is unfamiliar with um, Michael. So I would be concerned about um, the Elijah being okay during those times. And it is a considerable way from home. So I want to have direct access to Elijah. Okay. How old is your son? He's nine months this week. Okay. okay. And Miss, you said Mr. Grissom. He, where does Mr. Grissom live? I'll let him answer. Well, no, I'm asking you. Hold on, Miss Fletcher. So he doesn't live near you. You said it's a considerable way away from you. Yes. So we're meeting halfway between Dallas and Houston. Okay. So Mr. Grissom lives in Houston, to your knowledge. Yes. Okay. And so you're wanting. Who do you want to supervise these visits for the first three months? I would be there. Okay, and you're wanting to visit, the visits would occur at Mr. Grissom's home in Houston or at your home? The visits are at the Centerville, that's Woody Smokehouse. Okay, so the visits would be at 
this restaurant in Centerville. Yes. Okay. And then after the three months of supervised visits, you're requesting 15 months of unsupervised visits. Right. But in the same area in Centerville. So these would not be overnight visits yet. Correct. That's correct. Okay. And then after that, you're okay with a standard visitation schedule until your child is three years old. That's correct. Or no, no. When he is three years old, he can start standard visitation. That's okay. going to be, yeah. Okay. Which would be once a month and you're requesting the first Saturday of the month for his standard visits. That's correct. Okay. Is there any other reasons that you want the court to know as far as the request for the the modified visitation schedule? No, that's all. Okay. And then as far as your address being in the court order today, you have safety concerns with it being listed in the order? I do. Has there been family violence in the past two years between you and Mr. Grissom? No. Do you have another case in our office where safety would be at issue? No, I but I am concerned because he has in the past shown up without notice with the police officer trying to demand to enter into my home. And I do not want that to be available to him, my address to be available to him for that reason. Okay. Does he currently know where you live? No. All right. I'll pass the witness, Judge. You may call your next witness. I'll call the father. Mr. Grissom, can you state your full name? Michael Grissom. And did you hear all the terms of the order that were stated to the court? Yes. Did you understand all of those terms? Yes. And are you in agreement with the stated terms and believe they're in the best interest of your child? Yes. And as far as the, the visitation schedule, you do agree to the first three months being supervised at that Woody Smokehouse in Centerville? Correct. Okay, but you don't agree after that with having to do 15 months unsupervised at that same location, right? Correct. Okay, and you're wanting to just do three months supervised and then go to standard visits? Correct. Okay, can you tell the court why? Um, I feel like, one, um, it's been enough time that I haven't seen them already. Um, I think um, the, the first three months of the visit should be uh, more than enough time for me to get adjusted with him um, and then to be able to build that relationship that I want to have with my son. Okay. And you're agreeable to continue to meet at least for the first three months at that Woody Smokehouse in Centerville for the visits? Um, yes, I am willing to meet at the Centerville to pick up even if uh, we go to the standard or not. Oh, okay. Okay. And then as far as the non disclosure, um, are you in agreement with Ms. Fletcher's request to not have her address listed in the court order? Um, that really doesn't concern me as much. Okay. I'll pass the witness, Judge. Ms. Fletcher, why was he trying to enter your house with the police? He was trying to assert that there was things he left in my apartment. And it was just, I was never contacted. If I was contacted about that matter, I would have been willing to give him those things. But at the time, I was still caring for my son. So it was an ambush. And it would have been nice to have been approached amicably about that concern. Okay. okay. Um, so I will accept the agreement of the party so far as there is an agreement. I will... Uh, order visitation supervised for the first three months. I will order three more months of uh, unsupervised visitation. I'm not sure where that would take place. How many hours is the visitation for the three months, Miss Peoples? So just part, well, they didn't have, they just said that it would occur supervised. But they didn't have any time. They didn't specify a time for it. Okay. Well, we for the next, the time. excuse me. We we agreed on the time, but y'all just didn't put it in the order. Correct. I think I, she may have changed it. There was some edits being made, but we originally agreed from twelve to five p.m. Okay, so twelve to five p.m. is good. Supervised 
Is there someone else who can supervise other than you, Ms. Fletcher? I'm not sure. Does the court appoint anybody to supervise visits? No, ma'am. So who else would be available? Meaning like... I don't know. Maybe if there's someone in your family that he knows and he gets along with, somebody in his family that you both know and feel comfortable with. I personally don't know anybody who would be available for those times. If, if if it has to be supervised by somebody else, it would have to be a different time period. Okay. Being so less hours on that day. We'll say supervised by Ms. Fletcher or any adult that the parties agreed to. Then for three more months, it can be at Woody's from 12 to 5 with no um, need for supervision. And then after that, it'll go to standard. Okay. I have a question about the standard. Mm -hmm. Would it would it still be in Centerville? No, the standard will be at his place of residence or any place that he chooses. He gets visitation one week in a month. And it could be in Dallas. It could be in Houston. It could be in Centerville that it... You know, if y'all meet in Centerville and he wants to stay in Centerville with the child, that's fine. But it'll be at a place of his choosing. So my question would be, would, would I be notified of his whereabouts with Elijah? Uh, that is the courteous thing to do. Yes. If, if you you are entitled to have his address and his phone number so that you will know where your child is. Okay. Okay. And um, yeah, okay, that's all. And Mr. Grissom, I mean, oh no, also Ms. Fletcher, I'm not uh, authorizing a non-disclosure. Non-disclosure is denied. Is there anything else, Ms. Peoples? Nothing for the judge. Any other questions of the parties? No, ma'am. Okay. So now that I've made my ruling, if you don't like it, if you don't agree with it, or you think it's not fair, you have three days to file an appeal, 30 days to file a motion for new trial. This case is out of the 256th District Court in Dallas County. That would be Judge Sandra Streeter. If you, um, she might have a different opinion from me. So now do you understand the, that also? I understand. Okay. All right. Any other questions? No, ma'am. No. All right. Then thank you both for appearing here today and you're both free to go. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Judge, Mr. Talley is ready to approach. What number, Mr. statutory duties under federal and state law. So um, I don't know, you want me to just give me the, give them the gist of it, Ms. Lipford? Sure. Um, so we learned that the, uh, that Mr. McKenzie as the payer of support is currently receiving SSI benefits. Um, and that is not something that we can use to, uh, as, as income to calculate support. And it is also not something that we can use to garnish um, to pay child support arrearages. So our hands are kind of tied in terms of those two issues. And we're requesting at this time that the case be administratively closed and that support be set at zero until the time that Mr. McKenzie um, receives income in addition to the SSI income um, or any sort of assets with which he could pay support on his arrears. Yeah, basically, uh, according to the motion, there's about $1,000 in arrearages still left. What'll happen is that's put it in an administrative account and we cannot collect on it as long as he is taking SSI. But if he ever wins the lottery, they automatically notify us and we grab it. <laughs> I, I, okay. have had that, I, I have had that happen, but Mr. McKenzie, you have to play the lottery to win the lottery. Just one of those things. Yes, sir. <laughs> Yeah, I made my I I, my wife and I were talking about retirement last week, and I made her play. So, uh, <laughs> but in any event, any questions, uh, Miss Skydema? You're the plaintiff. Any questions, ma'am? Nope, I'm totally happy with it. No problem. And uh, Mr. McKenzie, any questions, sir? No, sir. I am happy as well. 
I'm glad that's unusual. I don't get to make people happy. That's not my job. But thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, in any event, thank you. take care to both of you. Like I said, this is in compliance with federal and state law. We can't collect on SSI. So, all righty. Motion granted, Ms. Lipford. Thank you, Your Honor. Have a great thank afternoon, you. everybody. Yes, I'm sorry. That's okay. Can you raise your right hand, ma'am? Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry. I'm sick. So bear with me. Okay. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give in this cause will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, ma'am. All right. You may lower your hand, and Mr. Talley, you may proceed. Thank you, Judge. We're hearing a super modification of support order. I first ask the court to take judicial notice of the return of service on file for the non custodial parent which was filed on June 24th, 2024. So noted. Thank you, Judge. Because he has been served, his answer time has run and no answer has been filed. The state would like to proceed with the default. You may. I'll call the mother. Ma'am, would you please state your full name? And are you asking that the court order you to apply for or maintain the child on a government medical assistance program? Yes. And are you asking that Mr. Edwards be ordered to pay support based on information available to the state regarding his wages? Yes. Are you asking that he be ordered to pay cash medical support of $109 per month beginning October 1st? Yes. And are you asking that he be ordered to pay guideline child support in the amount of $351 per month beginning October 1st? Yes. Are you asking that the court order Mr. to pay the court costs for this proceeding? Yes. And in your previous order, there was a finding of non-disclosure as it pertains to your address and other identifying information, correct? Yes. And what was the reason that you requested that uh, non-disclosure uh, finding? It's personal. Can you tell the court? Um, was it due to violence personal. on the part of Mr. Edwards? Yes, and other stuff. Okay. Um, what was the nature of the violence that occurred? It's personal. Ma'am, I can't determine if the family violence uh, should stay on and if you should be uh, granted a non-disclosure unless you can tell me, give me some evidence to what happened. Just saying it's personal is not enough. I mean, um, if, if everybody else is in here, they can hear my personal business. Do you want your address to be withheld from the order, ma'am? Yes. Okay, then you need to give the judge a reason why. <clears throat> That's what I'm saying. It's a court full of people out here. I don't want people to know my personal if, business. If we were in the courthouse, it would be a court full of people also. <clears throat> and I will ask the step to the to the front to tell you to your to tell you so nobody else can hear my personal business. Okay, ma'am, I understand your that you don't want everybody to know your personal business. Um, was there physical violence between you and Mr. Edwards? It wasn't physical, but it's other stuff. I don't I don't know more word, more words to put it in. Was it uh, emotional violence or uh some kind of trauma? I was right. I was right, yes, I was right. Okay. Ma'am, that was physical violence. All you had to do was say it was physical violence. Okay, well it's physical violence. Okay. Okay, Mr. Talley. I'll pass the witness, Judge. Nothing further. All right, then I will grant the default order, order mom to maintain government health insurance, order cash medical support of $109 per month, order child support at $351 per month, order court call says bill. All start dates will be October 1st, 2024. The non-disclosure will continue. Um, he doesn't have any relationship with the child at all? No, he's not. He don't need to be aware of my child. Excuse me, I can't hear you, ma'am. No, ma'am, he doesn't need to be around my child. 
Okay, I just was asking, it, it, did the uh, prior order uh, give him any rights? No. Okay. I, All I right. can confirm, Judge, the um, prior order named the mother sole managing conservatorship and ordered no visitation. Okay, that's fine. Uh, we were not trying to force you to say anything. I just needed something. So you could have told me it was physical violence. You could have told me some... Uh, Criminal charges were um, were the result of it, and that would have been fine. I understand you're not wanting to um, talk about the incident, and I apologize for us not communicating that with you well, okay? Yes, ma'am. All right. Do you have any questions, ma'am? No, ma'am. All right. Then thank you for appearing here today, and you're free to go. Okay. Hey everyone, how about we head to Texas today where we have a new judge and a dad who decided to move to Hawaii to start a new life with his girlfriend and he hasn't filed taxes in three years and he has no idea how he's going to get his W-2s from his employers back in the States. I mean, that's like on the other side of the world now. Oh my gosh, what's he gonna do? Let's go to court. After announcing yourself, sir. Yes, Your Honor, this is Maz Asif uh, for the state of Texas. Um, we're here today on the state's suit for modification of support order and motion to confirm support arrearage. Uh, before we get started into terms, I wanna discuss the matter of arrears. Uh, the state has submitted to this court the financial activity report for this case. Um, and the state- Did you position- send it by uh, email? Yes, Your Honor. Okay, I'm not there yet, but if I need to uh, review it, I will take judicial notice that you sent me the pay record if you want me to review it. You might have to screen share it as the quickest way. Um, Otherwise, I have to stop and open my email and go look at it myself. Uh, Yes, Your Honor. Go ahead. So the state will be asking for a judgment. The state is requesting a judgment on arrears as of August 31st, 2024 of $7,298.71 to be repaid at a rate of $91 a month with payments to begin on October 1st, 2024. Uh, Mr. Akko it, uh, is not in agreement. He feels um, he should not have to pay this, uh, this amount. Um, Ms. Garcia has issues with the judgment date. She wants a judgment date um, as of September 1st. Okay, um, now with respect to the- now, medical- why, why would that matter at all? Do you have any idea, Mr. Rossi? I'm not, I'm not sure, Your Honor. Uh, um excuse me <laughs> um okay Ms. garcia uh you don't get to dictate what we do here as far as dates and what have you you don't lose one single penny whether i do it august 31st or september 1st september 1st has a new accrual amount which is yeah it might be due if it's due on the first but it's not considered delinquent till the 30th or 31st and at the end of the month, the interest accrues. So we go to August 31st. They put it on their computer. You haven't lost a penny because September 1st, they'll put the new amounts and it keeps rolling. The computer keeps track of all of that uh, and with interest at the end of every month if there's arrears. So I, I, I'm not sure why we're going to have a fight about that, but I just want you to be aware of what the situation is before I cut you off on that because it doesn't matter what you want and it, you don't lose a penny. So, uh, Ms. Asif, Ms., Mr. Asif, go ahead and finish your opening. Uh, yes, Your Honor. So with respect to the medical support issue, um, Ms. Gar- both Ms. Garcia and Mr. Akko would like the child to be on their uh, health and dental insurance. Ms. Garcia is requesting um, that the child be on her dental insurance and then Mr. Akko be ordered to pay cash medical support of $792.08. As well okay, as what? cash medical support of how much? Uh, $792.08, Your Honor. Is that anywhere near the 9% cap or above it? Um, or? The states understand. Mr. Akko's, uh, Mr. Akko's position is his gross monthly resources are $3,648 before tax. Um, based off of that, uh, the 9%. Uh, the max we, if, if that is true, the max we'd be able to charge for cash medical support would be three hundred and twenty-eight dollars and thirty-two cents. So there's a dispute about his income, according to. Uh, yes, Your Honor, there, there is a dispute. And is there going to be any real evidence on that, or is it just going to be that he said she said? Um, I believe Mr. Akko has a pay stub that he he's submitting to the court. 
And what does Ms. Garcia have? Uh, I'm not, I'm not sure, Your Honor. Are you prepared to show any evidence of whatever you think he earns, ma'am? Or is it just- Am I prepared to show? I, I know absolutely nothing about what he makes, but what I do know okay. is that he has 30 years in a field where he is more than capable of making what he was previously making, if not more. Okay, okay. So for him to go and take a job that's less paying than what he was previously making, how is that fair? Okay, so you're going to be alleging that he's underemployed because somewhere along the line there is proof that he made more? Is that what you're saying? Honestly, I, I have every reason to believe that he was working two jobs last time we were actually in court. This isn't going to be no 45-minute case, people. Um and uh, Mr. Ocko, if I do agree yes. with you, if I tell, if Ms. Garcia prevails and you have the right of appeal, will you be appealing my decision to a higher court, the district court level? Yep. Ms. Garcia, if I don't rule you or way and Mr. Ocko prevails, will you be appealing to a higher court to the district court? Well, I'm not giving in because I'm the one that has been doing everything that a parent should be doing. Okay. Then that's your right and that's your obligation and advocacy, but... It seems to me it'd be a waste of my time today to give you 45 minutes, cut you short, and you don't get to tell all of it. And then you lose. One of you is going to lose. And then you're going to appeal me anyway. Um, I'm not sure I want to hear it. Mr. Asif, is there any reason I shouldn't refer it to district court? Because these folks, I believe, if they've been here several times, it's not over with whatever I decide to do today, it looks like. So um, they're adequate advocates for themselves. I don't see why uh, they can't sure. just get to the district court level and let somebody up there. Uh, yeah, Your Honor, the state has no position on that. Um, we, we, we're we not in favor, nor do we object to uh, a referral to the district court. You know, I usually don't send pro se's over there, but if this is that, that contested and that, um, what's the word? Um, well, Your Honor, uh, if I may, perhaps we could get some temporary orders prior to the referral we don't even have temporary orders yet uh we, we do have, have temporary, temporary orders, in orders place, in uh, place. but perhaps we can amend the terms uh to reflect the current situation before uh referring upwards. well i would consider that if we can squeeze it in in the next 40 minutes okay but for a final i would refer it uh, i'm not hearing this dispute with the, the right of appeal where y'all are going to go somewhere else anyway. So I'll let you go there and have one bite at the apple for the final order. Okay. Proceed on whatever issues I need to decide on the temporary orders, Mr. Asif. Um, Your Honor, there's also some complications here. Um, it's my understanding that Mr. Akko lives in Hawaii. Uh, he won't be able to remotely appear in district court in Hayes County. So uh, that might be somewhat problematic if uh, we refer to district court. Also, I'm not convinced that the issues are sufficiently complex. That um, We have some dispute over income, but um, uh, we can subpoena Mr. Akko's uh, pay stubs and W-2 forms and you know get to the bottom of that issue. Um, I'm thinking a reset with, reset with a priority hearing would be more appropriate. I would agree with you at this late hour. Um, did you all get that? So on that so level, you all... Let me start with you, Mr. Rocco. Did you get that? that uh, yes, but on that level, if I'm making a certain amount that I'm making with my new employer, am I still responsible to pay that $915 a month, which I don't make as much as I did at Whole Foods? Well, that's the question. The problem is, is that if you have a history of prior employment at a higher level, why should it go down if uh, the argument would be you're underemployed? So I'd have to hear not, that. It has only gone down by six dollars per hour. It hasn't gone down drastically. I make twenty two fifteen an hour, and at Whole Foods I make twenty nine dollars an hour. So it's only went down six seven dollars. It hasn't gone down drastically on my pay. Well, I haven't done the math, so I don't know how much seven dollars, roughly uh, seven fifteen despair difference, would result in child support because it adds up forty hours a week for four point three weeks per month. So I don't know, sir. So Ms. Garcia, and, are you and, saying one or the other is the right number or is those are both totally off because he does something else that you think he should be doing at this time? Whenever he has, whenever he has a trade in a certain career or we were together for 22 years. 
And he was doing that even before we met each other. He's been doing it ever since we've been divorced. So you're looking at about 30 years in, in this field. There's to be no reason why he cannot continue doing what he's doing, making what he was making. So what at level are you talking about? How much an hour? Or what's the, the math? I don't know what he, I honestly, I don't know what he was making. Well, I'll, I'll show what, you what, all hold on. What order are we trying to modify, Mr. Osif, uh, the relevant time period from the last order to now and the changed circumstances? Yes, Your Honor. So the temporary order, um, so there's a temporary order in, in place in this case. Um, let me just draw the exact dates for you. So we have a temporary order on this modification action that's titled um, uh, from that was signed by this court on February 1st, 2024. My apologies, February 12th, 2024. Uh, it's called the temporary order in suit for modification of support order and to confirm support of rearage. Well, that's OK, but that's still part of this lawsuit, which we're trying to modify what order the final uh, order prior to yes, that temporary order? So the order prior is the divorce decree. The order prior to that is the divorce divorce decree that was um, the agreed final degree of divorce. Uh, I'm reading it now. It states uh, that the court held uh, this case on June 18th, 2021. So that's the one we're trying to modify the divorce of 2021. And uh, they don't have findings about income in that one. Um, I'm reading it right now, Your Honor. I assume it's a Hayes County divorce, or no? Uh, yes, this was this was in Hayes County. Okay. May I say something? You may as well. What, ma'am? Whenever the last time that we were seen in your court, you guys had came up with a monthly amount of nine hundred and fifteen dollars. And then the medical portion, you were stating that if he was to pay my, like, what, if I was to continue to keep them on my insurance, it was close to $500 that he would have been paying. Because you guys was not going to allow him to make that full payment for the medical and dental it's expense. Not us. It's the family code that sets the parameters, ma'am. So we try to apply the law because that's our jobs. The state has a position and may or may not agree with it. You have a position. I may or may not agree with it. But uh, there is a cap on on how much is considered reasonable because you can go get the Cadillac of insurance and ask for $1,000 a month. But if the uh, income is not there to support it as far as his income and the 9% gross, of his income, that that's what I'm required to follow. So just so you're aware of that. So what were you trying to, what was your point of the temporary order? What was pretty much set with the last court order, the the was, the temporary order, I'm yeah. asking that that stays in place. 915 in child support and 500 in medical support? Is that what you yes. just, is that the case in that temporary order, Mr. Rusi? Uh, yeah, uh, those are the terms of the temporary order. That's oh, and so it's Mr. Ako that wants something, some relief, whether it's temporary or final. And is he, he the does. one that's missing the documentation that you said we still need? Any, you don't have W-2s or prior income from uh, since the divorce? Uh, not from his current employer, Your Honor. Not from his what? Not from his uh, current employer, Your Honor. We don't have anything with respect to that. Well, it seems to me she's I, arguing I just... that he's an ob he's underemployed so all the income since the divorce is oh. necessary to to determine if he had a higher income and then is underemployed or not but you wouldn't and also your honor we're, we're in would, mr Rossi, in if you wouldn't have the w-2s or or tax returns um from what what year was it 2021 mid 2021 forward i'm reviewing our, our records your honor i don't believe we have um Oh, I see we have some pay stubs from 2023. But you don't have, is there a reason there's no tax returns been brought by Mr. Rocco? Uh, I'm not, oh, here we go. Okay, Your Honor, I, I, I see a W-2. Okay, I see a W-2 for the year of 2023 for Mr. Rocco. 2022 and 2020. So I have the W-2 for 2023 as well as the, um, as well as a pay stub from uh, dated August 25th, 
But we you don't have a W two tax return for twenty twenty two. Uh, not for twenty twenty two, Your Honor. Okay. Okay. What do you want to say, Mr. Rocco, before I rudely interrupted you? So the pay. No, I'm sorry, Your Honor. The pay from California and Texas is different than the pay here in Hawaii. So the pay for a meat cutter, I was making good money because I was my job title was a meat manager. And if there's no opportunity for a meat manager and the pay is different from California and Texas to Hawaii, the pay is a lot lower here in Hawaii. And there's not that much openings and opportunity for me to be a meat manager, considering there's like a million people on an island. So for me to go get um, a meat cutter job, the pay is, is a, it's not going to be the same as the mainland. And what I was making in the mainland in Texas and, and California was our wages as a meat manager, not the meat cutter. And honestly, what I'm paying, what I'm making now, twenty two fifteen, is about the average as a meat cutter. And why? Meat cutter here only find out. Why did you move to Hawaii? Hawaii? What was required that you had to leave the mainland to go back to Hawaii? Why did I go back to Hawaii to start a new life in Hawaii? Because what? Me and my. Me and my my girlfriend decided to move to Hawaii. We decided to you know start our life in Hawaii. So we went in in Hawaii. And I can't. I, I can't hear you anymore. As a, as a as a as a, Mr. As a store Hello. director, and that didn't. I missed some of your testimony because yes, it was being staticky or garbled or something. It wasn't coming through clear. I didn't. So your, your question is, is why did I move from Texas to go to Hawaii? It's because me and my girlfriend currently made a decision to move to Hawaii. And you knew it was going to be a lower pay rate or even the, with no, higher cost of living it, probably? It, it, it wasn't a lower pay rate. It was a it was about the same pay rate because I went in as at that time when we moved, I went as as a store director at Foodland, and that did not work out with store director at Foodland. And then I went on and I went to another job at Whole Foods, which I got terminated, and I got a lawsuit against them. But that's where I'm at. And then right now, Mrs. Garcia is asking me for arrears. Just. Just to plead my case, as far as April, the, the ending of April, I had a heart attack. So April the 30th, I had an open heart surgery that was not released from my doctor, from my physician, to August the 5th. I could not go to work. I could not retain work because, like I said, on April the 30th, I had a major open heart surgery. Okay, I've heard enough complications that I don't think I'm going to be able to start and finish. I'm try trying to get to the bottom line with y'all's arguments, but it's real clear to me that one, if she wants more because she thinks you're unemployed, then we need your wage information for all those years, half of 21 after the divorce, all of 22 and 23 and whatever you have through 24. I need to see that. Did you file tax returns for the last three years? No, I have not. Were you employed at a salaried position? Yes, I was. I did not file taxes. So you got W-2s for yes. each of those years? Yes. Why didn't you file for tax returns? I just didn't file. There's no excuses for me. But you can't retrieve 2021 W-2, 2022 W-2, and 2023 W-2s? I think I've I can't get it right. I can't get it right now, but I can do my my homework and get it. Um, and for twenty one, but for twenty twenty four, whatever your comeback date is, you can get your last pay stub before you come back to court the, with the year to date information. I I told the attorney that I took a screenshot that I could send it to his phone with my screenshot, and he would have my my current pay stub. With for some reason, it's not going through with the email, but I took a screenshot. And I just said, if you supply him me with his cell phone, I can I can screenshot him my current pay stub. Uh, is there any other way to do it, Mr. Rossi? For your honor, I, I I would rather not disclose my personal cell cell phone number. No. 
Because what I make is, like I said, I make nine hundred something dollars a month gross. After two hundred dollars taken out of taxes, my my net is only about seven hundred and something dollars a month a week. That's all I bring home. That is it. I mean, I don't bring them anymore. I don't I bring them in. That's what I make every single week. Okay, that's your argument for another day. I'm trying to figure out how we can get the, not the screenshot, but your actual pay stub. You can't right. scan it. I mean, I can, I can try I can try to email it again, Your Honor, but like I said, well, I How are I you going to get the that, W-2s? How are you going to send those? I don't have the W-2s in front of me. I have the pay stub, my current pay stub in front of me. The W-2s, I got to do my homework, and I got to call all my previous employers. And get all those the W-2s and get those documents with me. Okay. I don't have the documents right now. Not okay, well, you, whenever you get, it. Whenever you get, get them. You. But I don't have, have to, a copy of my current pay stub from Pepsi that 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 says. Whenever you get them, you do need to send but what them I'm in. Is why should? So, but how fair is it for me to pay nine hundred fifteen dollars a month, which I'm not making? That's that for me to decide after I hear all the evidence. But I don't have all the evidence. You okay. don't have all the evidence. You don't want to come back, but I don't see how else to do it if you want me to hear it, and I don't kick you up to district court. Uh, but I, again, <laughs> we already spent what 30 minutes on this and uh, I've gotten nowhere closer, 22 minutes to be exact. Uh, they ha the state has a, a uh, yes, an email where you send all the stuff and you, you can't find a different device or a different way of scanning it or going to a I don't know, a somewhere that has better, well, I, like I said. I, I... I can send it again and see if it goes through again, but well, it's, it's too late for today. I don't need it for today. But when you send the W twos, however you send them, you send that pay stub too, the year to date pay stub that's closer to the court. I, I sent, I sent all my documents certified now. I sent all my documents mm -hmm. that you guys received as far as my doctor's note from my physician, saying that when I'm supposed to go back to work when I'm released. Every other document I'm sending to you guys is certified mail, which I mailed it to you guys, and you guys received it. So if I have to do the same thing with my W-2s and my pay stub, I will do that also. But right now, my, my thing is coming from is with Mrs. Garcia, I was making the same amount of money in California and Texas as a meat manager. I'm not a meat manager. There's not that much openings on the island. That okay, has you want to get to the argument the of your case, and that's not where I'm at right now. So, Mr. Asif, have you received a certified mail envelope with all this stuff, and you still have it? I assume you all don't get rid of documents, or at least not right away. So I can confirm we have this W-2 for 2023. I can confirm that we have a pay stub from August of 2023 as well. Um, nothing uh, as of today, uh, I believe... Uh, nothing with respect to uh, what his wages would be from his current employer. What about the medical records that he said he had uh, doctors, something or other? Um, medical records pertaining to his heart condition. Um, I'm not certain, Your Honor. Let me take a look-see. Judge, FYI, screenshots can be emailed. Thank you. Okay, so I can email you the screenshot right now, correct? Uh, yes, sir. Okay, so well, what number is he going right to use, Mr. Asif? Because, uh, well, email, that's right. The CSD legal one? Uh, that would I'm be the right yes. No, don't take your time doing that? it. I'm gonna set and give a different court date. I don't need it today. I need the one closer to another one. Do you have that one? Send it fine, but not right now. That's gonna take too much time. Uh, Mr. Asif, did you find medical records? It's part uh, of the pertaining to his condition, no, Your Honor. I'm, I'm looking through our records as we speak. I send you guys certified mail, and you guys received it because you guys signed for it stating that when I'm released, when was my surgery from Dr. Nakamura? When um, did you do that? What day did you send it? Do you remember? I sent it 
Man, I don't remember. I sent that maybe maybe a month ago. I sent it with the documents that I had to fill out, stating that you know what I mean. Or the what um it was a document from the court that it was two pages that I had to fill out and send it back to you guys, which I did that, and also I I put in a copy of my paper from the physician saying that went and. When I went in for surgery and what is my release date, I sent in a copy of my unemployment, which I applied for and got denied for it. I sent you guys a copy of that two pieces of paper from you guys, and somebody signed for it at the courthouse because was at the child support office because they are sending certified mail. Okay, when you say courthouse, want, and you said my, you send my, it my, to the AG, those no, are two different places. I'm Mr. sorry, I, I, I send it to the child support office, and they have it. Okay, Somebody they're not the, the court. They're not the courthouse. Court. They have a different address. That's where you send it to their mailing address. Okay, you gotta separate yes. us. They're not the same place. Yes. Okay, uh, Mr. Asif, you're looking and looking. You still haven't found it, okay. Matthew. Uh, no, Your Honor, I'm still looking. Uh, well, I can't wait for that either, but it would be important. Ms. Garcia, are you disputing that he even had a heart attack or open heart surgery? Is that going to be? No, he had a heart attack, but just because he had a heart attack doesn't mean that his kids need to stop. You know, no, it's going no it's but going it does mean that he might not have had that. income for a period of time. So do you, okay, then you what's need the, to see what's those medical excuse? records or not, Ms. Garcia? To believe what anything? You need to see those medical records? For the heart attack? Yes, ma'am. I would like to see when he was actually released, to be honest with you. Well, I would assume that would be a part of it. Mr. Ako, is that uh, you would have sent it after your hospitalization and it would have said what day you were released on? And the documents that I sent to the court. To the, the AG's the, office, not the courts. No, I'm sorry. The, the documents that I sent to the child support office specifically states what I got operated on what day, April the 3rd, 30th, they got, I got operated on, and it says specifically on August the 5th, when I'm released to go back to work. That's, That's what a it different says data. on the documents. A but data is released one, from the hospital, is that part of the information that you sent? I assume so, that you didn't send it that, from yeah. a line in a hospital bed, did you? I mean, you waited till you got out, oh. and the records that you got would have had your discharge date. That's what she's asking for. Is that in there? Not that this, the only documents that I sent to the child support office because she did not ask me for the information. The, the piece of paper that I sent to the child support office specifically states it, when did I get operated on April the 30th and what day am I released to go back to work from the position? There's an intervening date of no longer being in a hospital bed or in a hospital, and that would have been a discharge date from the hospital, I, I stayed, not just I a release date to go back to work. That should be part of your medical records. Are you saying it's just not? It skips it, from your your heart uh, surgery up to your release to work? The, the, reason, the reason why I send her the dates that me I'm, I'm still not released from the doctor is because she's asking me for the arrears. That's what I. That's the. That's the document. Look, that I, I get that. But one of the office. issues too is what date were you out of the hospital, and you don't can't tell me I, if you know that date or not. Do you understand? I. I, 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 I was in the hospital. I had surgery on April the thirtieth. I was released five days later. You were only in the hospital, hospital five, five days. Five days. Okay. five days later, I was released to the hospital. Okay, you're under oath hospital. and you're on the record. So write that down, Ms. Garcia or State. Um, okay, Mr. Asif, no, nothing? You didn't find the rec medical records? Uh, no, ma'am. Uh, we may have it, but um, I I'm okay. not certain. Um, okay, well then help me pick a date to come back because uh, it's already 420 and I'm not, it's clear and you need more time than we've got today. Uh, yes, Your Honor. We have availability on, on, on our October 10th court date. At 8.30. Is there any reason y'all can't come back? Uh, and they have to be a priority, not at the end of the day, the It'll first be, thing. Yes, I'm John. Not gonna I'll, do I'll, again. Uh, I'll be sure to include in the reset order. It will be a priority hearing. Then it should be, a, well, it says 8.30 for y'all to come in. And if you <laughs> need to share records at that point or whatever else or talk for a minute, you can do that. But I show up at 9 o'clock to start a hearing. Well, actually, I'm here before then, but I won't start hearings till 9 o'clock when they're done with the...
Does that work in Hawaiian time? Um, no, because it's five. It's five hours be behind you guys. So it will be if it's eight thirty, it would be at <coughs> three o'clock in the morning. We could do uh, ten a.m. as well. Um, our only docket times would be eight thirty and, and ten a.m. Central Time. So ten thirty, our time would be what time? His time, five o'clock. Five thirty. Uh, Your Honor, it would be it would be ten a.m. exactly. Well, that would make if it five o'clock his time. If it's ten thirty on you guys' time, it's five thirty on our time. It's five hours behind. What, when did they show up today, Mr. O.C., Mr. Yako? I, I woke up at 5.30 in the morning. I woke up at 5 o'clock in the morning to go to court. And that's what time I woke up this morning to go to court. So if I say 1 o'clock, that would be what time? 8? Eight, eight, eight? 7. No, 8. 8, eight o'clock your time. There's no reason you can't be up and on the computer by 8 a.m., correct? Yes, correct. Okay, then it'll be October 10th. In a few weeks on a Thursday at one o'clock p.m. as a priority, and that would not, give me enough time to hear it, and hopefully get from, rid of other cases before y'all show up. So, from your my, my knowledge, Your Honor, what kind of documents you need from me when I show up to court on, eight, on, on the next month in October? Well, we've been talking about. Do I have to repeat W twos for 2021, 2022? They said they have 2023, but if I were you, I'd send it again in case something happens to it. Um, but three years worth, that would be the three years subsequent to the, after the divorce and the ones that you would have W-2s for, for. So on that knowledge, Your Honor, I'm in Hawaii and the jobs that I worked at to attain the W-2s is all the way in California. And like I said, I would have to call the, the places that I work at to arrange them to send me a W-2s and arrange a copy of the W-2s. You know who has your W twos? The IRS, and you should have filed tax return. Uh, but they they report they send W twos to the IRS. I don't know if you can get it from them, uh, but it's on you to try to find them. And that's why you're supposed to file taxes. You want me to consider your income? I don't know how you prove it and talk to somebody. But all I can tell you is, if you have W twos, you need to try to get them. They only have one so far. And then for this year, there is no W-2. You have to work till the end of the year and you won't get the W-2 till January next year. So for this year, your year-to-date pay stub, as close to the court date as possible, you you email it. So my, my question to you is, I want to know the, the logical behind it of 2021, 22, 23, when the bottom line is that that's all wages. Because the last Texas. order that was entered that I'm trying to modify is the divorce decree from 2021. And what's relevant is all the time period since then. She's alleging you were making higher wages then and that you're underemployed now. Yes, I would have to see the higher wages. I'm not going to take her word for it and and or your word for it. I want to see what you actually made. And then for the, the pay stub, it helps me go through all the way to the court date so I can see the obviously the lesser income now, but I have to buy into your argument that you had to move to Hawaii. You went under underemployed it and wasn't, or that you weren't underemployed and that you, uh, I don't know what your reason is, but why you're not at the same job you were. And maybe your heart attack has something to do with it. I don't know. I've got to hear everything you present and you need to have backup for everything you present. Cause I'm tired of this. He says, she says that y'all don't know, really know what you're talking about. And I, I don't have any records. I'm just tired of it. And this case has been here long enough to where I think you should, you need to provide documents, Mr. Ako, it's your income. Ms. Garcia, if you have anything else you can find, because if he doesn't show up with it, I'm not I creating it. Income. I can't get it for you. I am not your investigator. I'm your judge, but you have to, you have to provide evidence, not me for you. I don't have access I, I, to anything. Your Honor, no, 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 nobody told me at the last hearing that we was on her that I got to supply W-2s from 2000. Well, I'm telling you now because it's a con big contested issue. And before I, you all appeal me to another court, I want them to know I did my homework, that I required it, that I got to look at it, or whatever reason you may have is not available, that at least I forced you to try to bring it because I'm not doing my job if I just say, okay, I'll take your word for it. No, I'm not. And Ms. Garcia, you're alleging something. I don't know if you can prove it or not if he doesn't, but on the other hand, uh, it's your case to try to prove why he's underemployed too. And so- Understood. 
Understood. Okay. Then I'm not repeating myself. Uh, uh, and if you want me to consider your medical records and they don't have them, then I think you need to send them again, including your discharge date. Or I assume nobody's going to dispute that he was only in the hospital five days anyway, if it doesn't show up on a piece of paper. So, Mr. Asif, I'll ask your office. And I don't know what you do with all those things that are emailed to you where they go, but I assume you don't dispose of them till the cases are over. So I'm hoping it's somewhere that you just can't access right now, but it's some screen somewhere that you can find. Uh, mm -hmm. But talk to the AG. If they don't find it, then yeah, send it again. I'm sorry, but that's the, it's cheaper than trying to fly over here to go to district court. If you want me to hear it, I need some evidence. Um, is there anything as else? Far as far as the temporary you want to order. Yes, ma'am. I'm not as changing as anything. Temporary. I don't have time to hear yeah. it anymore to change it. So it still goes on. However, Ms. Garcia, um, well, was it, I heard, was it a contested hearing on the temporary order or was y'all agreed to it? Uh, it was, it was a contested hearing, Your Honor. It was, I don't even remember it, but okay, fine. I'll look for my records too. Um, I'm just asking else stays the same for right hand, now. You had your hand up, Mr. S.C. Uh, your Honor, yes. May I, um, may I retrieve my charger so I can charge my device? Your what? May I retrieve my charger, Your Honor? Oh, yeah. <laughs> so you don't get dismissed? Yes. Thank you. Judge, I'll update you with results. I got to go. Yeah, either tell me tomorrow or email. Yeah, tomorrow me. morning. Yeah, Before. that would be fine. Thank you, Ms. Gonzalez. I'm sorry. No problem. It's not an issue. Now, Your Honor, if, if I have to consult an attorney, how Please does that work? Please do. That would help me if a lawyer... So I... What's the now, can we extend this court, court did a little further for me to pay for an attorney and retain an attorney? Because I, I I was I consulted <laughs> with an attorney and then he said that if it goes more than what it's supposed to go and, and I'm under you know pressure to get whatever I need to get, that he would he'll be able to consult with him more. Well, it doesn't bother me to set it later, so y'all are better prepared and have a lawyer. Uh, and it shouldn't bother you, Ms. Garcia, if you've got a temporary order in place that's not being changed. Uh so is if he a, has the money to consult with an attorney and hire an attorney, why is he having trouble paying his child support? That's not the issue before me. The issue before me is I've, uh, he can get a lawyer. I'd prefer him to get a lawyer to present ev actual evidence instead of him trying to flounder around and me trying to guess what real, the truth is. So, okay, um, so he's stalling right now. So I, I am asking to keep the October 10th date because I have sense. open enrollments and whatnot coming up. And it's starting in the end of October through December. A court order trumps the open enrollment. If there's a court order and it orders something, then that's a qualifying I'm event to one, start. I'm the only one that's supporting our kids right now. I get that, Ms. Garcia, but I'm telling you a, a court order is a qualifying event. Even if you miss open enrollment, you can still Whenever you oversee change. an entire agency, uh, th that's, that's my role. So that's why I'm October 10th. I have nothing going on that week but preparing, so that's doable. How likely are you to get a lawyer or just, uh, just take more time to get back here, Mr. Rocco, if, without a lawyer? Well, I just need to verify to get, I just want to get as much information that I'm going that, you know what I mean, that and take the, the consideration that I was in open heart surgery, that I could not work, that I could not, I was not released from the doctor. It's not, it's one thing that I was not, re, I, I was released from the doctor, but I was not released from the doctor. And that's why I, I sent the document to the child support office because I want them to know it. Dude, from April the, April the 30th to August the 5th, I was not able to go back to work. From the, from the physician's standpoint, I was not released from the doctor to go back to work. So on that okay. note, is why am I liable to pay my back my child support? Your 45 minutes are up. I'm leaving. And Mr. Asif, do you have another recommended date? I'm going to move it from October 10th. If he can get a lawyer, I want him to. And I'm, I'm not talking about December or November uh, or maybe mid-November at the latest. Uh, yes, Your Honor. Let me just... Uh... Your Honor, uh, may I ask, why do you guys keep on giving him chance after chance? This isn't the first time that he's done this. Ms. Garcia, you didn't. 
This is not the day to hear this, this is, case at 4.30 in the afternoon already. I'm very well, sorry. I understand that. But whenever you've dealt with a child going through cancer, you've dealt with a kid that was attacked by a dog <laughs> upon other health issues and whatnot. And I've been stuck to do Do you think do today right now I would have raised your child support and raised your medical support? Do you really think I would have do that, do that today? Yeah, on, but what on I'm saying case? is that even the lack of support that he's been doing and I haven't been receiving, this isn't the, this isn't the first time. This is not for payments. He's. I'm going to order how much is the right amount if this is the temporary order isn't right so um, this is not about him paying or not paying he's still required to do that under any order this is about getting it right now and you all are both arguing two extremes and i don't have enough except your word right now and that's why i'm requiring more evidence and if i give more time for better evidence it would be in your interest if you can bring uh or he can't produce the records and you can versus the other way around. So I'm sorry. I've got to do what I've got to do, whether you like it or not. And right now I'm done. Mr. Asif, was there another date way before uh, December? Yes, Your Honor. Um I I so I, I got logged out of my or of my organization's VPN. May I retrieve my cellular device so I can log sure. back in and retrieve the list of court dates? Yes, sir, sure. Thank you, Your Honor. Okay, um, we have availability on November 14th. They're all Thursdays. Uh, that's when I hear Hayes cases for the party's information. Uh, and I could do the same thing at one o'clock as a priority, Mister. Uh, we can't do one p.m., Your Honor. Our like the only times we have available are eight thirty a.m. and ten a.m. or ten or ten thirty a.m. No, that's because I set those times for my calendar. But I'm telling you, I want it at one o'clock so he can show up without having to wake up at five in the morning. Nobody else is asked to do that, and so that he's. Uh, I guess hopefully clear headed and that we start because we finished the morning docket. So I don't care what your computer says or what anybody else says. My docket, I'm setting it as a priority at one o'clock. And yes, I have the order to say that. And for y'all to be ready to go, don't negotiate two hours or three hours or five hours. I need to have it ready to go. And y'all prepared, everybody prepared at one o'clock on November 14th. And hopefully I will be done with the all the other settings prior to that. Um, yes, all right, so I would like to confirm that 915 is going to stand as well as the amount for the, the medical expenses. I didn't touch the temporary order. I'm not changing it today. So right now it does continue under the last order, which is if that's the temporary order, then yes, ma'am, it does continue. Okay, can I please make sure that the amount for the medical is included on top of that, please? Mr. Asif, what, I don't know what the order says. I haven't read it. She's told me what she thinks it says. Are you confirming this, what she just said? The um, Your Honor, if, if Mr. Garcia's position is for the, the terms of the temporary order to remain in place, I mean, that is precisely what's going to happen if you reset this. Well, matter. I don't agree with that. What, what happens if I don't agree with I'm resetting it so you can bring in evidence even if you don't agree with it because I'm not hearing it right now. It's too late to hear it. I'll be here till 10 o'clock tonight if I open the door to this so, or even 8 o'clock. I'm not doing it. I've already had a very long so day how, how, and I'm very how, not not, I'm not, not able to, to go forward. Then you know what? Let's just keep the October date because I'm, I'm not going to pay 900 something dollars a month. Which I'm on, not okay, then on you do your homework. You get a lawyer as quick as you can if you're going to do that, and you get your W-2s, and then we'll be ready to go October 10th at okay. 1 o'clock. That's fine. And I'm not going to repeat the order because I don't have the order. So I whatever it says, it's a temporary order, ma'am. It's signed. It's on the record. It continues. I don't know what more you need to hear from me. Well, I'm here's the, here's, exactly the, here's the thing. Here's Man. the deal, because what <clears throat> happened was with the, with the medical is that he was refusing to pay the well the amount well the I'm amount not... that you guys had ordered. Ma'am, I reset it. Nothing well, else here, you can say is going to change the order that's already it, in effect. Oh my god! If you let me finish, please, because what we did is that we took the girls off of my insurance that they had been on that I had been paying for previously because he was not going to pay the amount that was being asked for. And he was able to get it cheaper through his employer, which was fine, but he can't hold down a job to keep the girls on 
insurance. I'll hear it October 10th. I can't change it today. Just like you don't want me to change the child support and he wants to change. I can't change it either way. I didn't finish hearing the evidence. I'm not going to finish hearing the evidence. I need to hear it on October 10th. I'll leave the original. Okay, can you date. put something in there, at least $400 for the medical expenses for right now to be included? Because right now, it's eight hundred. I can't dollars. change the order without having a full blown hearing. What part have you not understood, Miss Garcia? I'm not going forward right now. So you get to keep the higher child support. Then it gets to stay with whatever insurance is said. I haven't modified it yet. I haven't heard the evidence to modify it yet. I'm resetting this. That's all I'm doing is resetting it. So what's in effect is in effect, and I'll hear it October tenth at one o'clock. That's what I can tell you. Anything else, Mr. Rossi? Um. Your Honor, I'm requesting that we we hold the hearing at one of our at either 8:30 or 10:30 a.m. Uh, Mr. Aka was the one who chose to move to Hawaii, knowing that he could possibly be in court for this. So uh, I feel as if um, that would not be proper to have at 1 p.m. Why not? Oh, uh, Mr. Aka was the one who chose to move to Hawaii, knowing that he, he had a court date. I'm talking um, about my docket, Mr. Asif. Yes, Your Honor. Cases um, earlier with might be 20 cases. I got to get those done before I talk to these people. Yes, Your Honor. If I talk to these people at 8.30 or 10.30, then I'm postponing 20 other cases. I can't do that either. This is my setting at 1 o'clock. I don't care that he's in Hawaii. I'm going to let him sleep like everybody else gets to. Uh, yes, Your Honor. It's going to stay at 1 o'clock whether the state objects or not. Anything else? No, Your Honor. I'm done. Bye. Uh, Y'all check out and we'll see you October 10th at one o'clock. You have any questions, you call the AG. You cannot call the court. And, uh, and that was October, both October of you. 10th, Your Honor? What? Just to clarify the date, that was October 10th, Your Honor? Yes, sir. October 10th at one o'clock. Okay. Thank you, Your Honor. The parties have exited the virtual courtroom. That concludes this hearing. I'll stop my recordings.